chick, one, ah, sad the door, chick, sad the door, chick.
lima, cik.
it's okay. Good morning, dear colleagues. May we begin? I gave, we say in, Port in Portugal, academic 15 minutes of delay. And so, I think it's time to, to begin. I'm trying to see if it is possible. Good morning, distinguished members of the Governing Council, and welcome to our meeting, 209 session of the Governing Council. And 15 years after we met here in Nusadua, we came back. So, uh, allow me to express the gratitude of IPU and the gratitude of the, I believe, all delegations to the authorities of uh, Indonesia for the warm welcome and the collaboration to receive us all here in, our, in the best conditions during these challenge times. Thank you so much, dear colleagues from the Indian Parliament. And, uh, dear colleagues, we have uh, more, a few days of hard work. Of course, we will discuss different issues after a pandemic that uh, affects all of us. We, we are, thank God, now talking about recovery and how it's possible to have a, a sustainable recovery from this economic and consequences with the pandemic. Also, we will discuss, I believe, the situation in Ukraine because it's one important issue uh, that affects not just uh, one continent but with effects in all the world because one country invited the other one. But the economic consequences affect all, all of us. We will discuss the climate change, something important uh, to all the humankind, and allow me to say, with direct and special effect in this area of our uh, hometown, the earth. And uh, so I believe that it will be hard days for all of us, but, but we will work and we will achieve the results we, we need. And so we will have uh, one agenda that needs to be adopted. But before that, I think there is technical issues that may be important to be addressed, and so I will give the floor to the Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I also use the opportuni opportunity to welcome delegates to this assembly. We're looking forward to very rewarding deliberations during this uh, assembly. Uh, I think that our Indonesian hosts have been very gracious in putting to place, in place all the arrangements for a smooth assembly. But of course, uh, we, no human endeavor is perfect, and sometimes we do have hitches, technical hitches in this particular case. We have been uh, advised this morning that some of your microphones in this room may not be uh, working uh, for one reason or the other. 
and they have been identified with white tapes that are uh, stuck to them. So if uh, you are sitting before a microphone with a white tape and uh, you want to uh, take the floor, please just raise your country plate and uh, the president will recognize you. A flying microphone will be brought to you so that you can uh, uh, take the floor uh, appropriately. And uh, I believe the technicians are working hard to resolve uh, these technical hitches. But uh, apart from that, Mr. President, uh, we have no particular issues to report at this stage regarding the organization of the deliberations of this uh, assembly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. So, you received on time the agenda of this Governing Council. I will ask if we consider the adopted agenda. May we consider? Then, point two, approval of the summary records of our last session of the Governing Council that happened in Madrid. You received also the summary records of that uh, meeting on time. We didn't receive uh, any re reclamations, may I say, but I, we need to approve it officially. No one is against. <laughs> Approved. We may go to the point three election of the president of the 144 assembly uh, is the United Arab Emirates asking the floor Dr. Ali uh, I am not we are not hearing you please Zimbabwe as well. Just a second. Just a second. Bahrain. Uh, I'm trying to understand. Uh, I see different. Yes, now, now it's working. The UAE proposed the, Her Excellency, the President of the Indonesian Assembly representative, to be the President of this General Assembly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I see Madam Speaker of Bahrain. Asking the floor as well. Um, نعم صباح الخير قبل أن أقول مداخلتي أود أن أهن جميع الأمهات في هذه القاعة وفي العالم أجمع لأن اليوم عيد الأم في الدول العربية وأريد أن أثني على ما تفضل به دولة الإمارات بأن تكون سيدة معالي سيدة بوان مهراني رئيسة البرلمان الأندونيسي على أن تكون هي رئيسة الجمعية العامة ل 144 الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي نتمنى لها كل التوفيق والسداد في إدارة هذه في إدارة هذه الجمعية والنجاح للمؤتمر بإذن الله شكرا جزيلا مدام سبيكر I didn't have the phones but I understood two words this Indonesian and so I, I understand that we are second the proposal of Dr. Ali from the United Arab Emirates. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam. I saw uh, Zimbabwe. No. Just a second. I understand. I understand. Uh, and I received the information. There is some technical uh, problems with our microphones. That's why uh, we have people help us uh, with uh, other micros. Just a second, uh, because I saw Zimbabwe asking to. Follow. Hello. Yes. Uh, Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, please, you have the floor. Mr. President, I raised my hand, the issue sorted out. There is no issue, it has been sorted out. 
Ah, okay, okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Dr. Ghazda from Turkey. Uh, I wanted to thank the Indonesian delegation and the government for hosting us, for being such wonderful hosts. And also, as Turkey, we would like to join in nominating the Speaker of Indonesian Parliament as the uh, head of the, to lead the General Assembly of the uh, IPU. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, we have the proposal. I may ask the Governing Council is if we con may consider and accept this proposal and this way. South Korea. Ah, oh, mamma mia. Uh, where is South Korea? There as well. Yes. Mr. Speaker, please. Yeah, honorable members of the Governing Council, good morning. I'm Park Pyong Sok, speaker of the National, uh, National Assembly of the Republic of Korea. On behalf of the Korean National Assembly, I propose that Her Excellency Kwan Marahani, speaker of the House of Representatives of Indonesia, be elected president of the 144th IPO Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand that we have different delegations proposing uh, that the Speaker Marani from the Indonesia Parliament may assume the presidency of the, our Assembly. Someone is against? No? Is adopted? Madam Speaker, you have the presidency. Thank you. Now we may go to the point four, consideration of requests relating to the IPU membership. And uh, uh, dear colleagues, you have with you the, also the, the information and uh, I will give the floor to the Secretary General, but I will say what uh, is the proposal uh, of the Executive Committee. It was uh, discussed two days ago, maybe, or three, I don't know, it's in so many meetings during these days, uh, two days ago. Uh, uh, we have not two new countries proposing to be member of IPU, we need to work on that, but we have uh, some uh, institutions uh, that wish to join as observer membership. And uh, the executive committee decides not, uh, not to analyze it, these cases because we need to understand how many and what is the situation of the, all the observers of IPU. Because we, have, uh, we are giving the statue of observer one behind the other, and we need to understand if they still doing what they, they said, if this, the collaboration uh, during the, 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 their membership as observer to the IPU is a win-win collaboration <laughs> or not, and also to have a methodology to adopt new members. And after it, we will come back in October to analyze these specific requests. This is the proposal of the Executive Committee, and so it is not something in favor or against each one of these cases. It was a position in general because we are an organization of parliament, parliaments, national parliaments, but it seems that very soon we will, we will have more observers than parliaments in our organization. And so it's better to, to think a little bit uh, than to transform the, our organization in one organization that the others will have 
more space than us, for instance, in participating in our, in our works. That's why we decided just to suspend, analyze the, the, the situation now and then uh, to make the evaluation of the requests that are on the table. May I, uh, Secretary General, to add? It's on. It's on. Okay. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I. I just want to reinforce what you have said, and uh, state that uh, uh, the position of the Executive Committee is consistent with the rules of the organisation regarding observers. Every four years, the governing bodies do carry out a comprehensive evaluation of the status of observers to identify those that are active and those who are not, to draw lessons learned from their involvement in the work of the organization, and also to provide guidelines uh, for uh, the uh, roles and responsibilities of observers within the IPU. So as you say, Mr. President, it was in that uh, context that uh, you decided to uh, defer any consideration of uh, requests for observership in the IPU until such time as you have the findings of that evaluation, which will be submitted to the governing bodies in October uh, 2022. So uh, this is something that is consistent with the rules and statutes of the organization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I don't know if someone wish to take the floor on this point. No? So, we accept the, the proposal of the Executive Committee. We will come back to this issue uh, on October with all the information about the, the observers that are already uh, obtained the membership uh, to, be, to have this statue in our organization and the proposal about the, the requests we have on our table. We go to the point five, uh, a report of the president. Dear colleagues, it's usual the president to, to report, uh, to, uh, to present a report of activities as president and also from this, as president of the executive committee, a very short one, because I believe that you prefer to discuss politics than to hear reports behind the reports. So uh, I will have a video to, that will uh, where I will present my report. Dear colleagues, since uh, we met uh, in Madrid for the last assembly, we just have three months of work. In these three months, it's essential to report to you the normal activity of IPU and what we did when a special and something that we are not expecting event happened. Allow me to talk first about uh, the report of the activities as president of IPU and also as president of the executive committee. First of all, I will refer to three points. The implementation of the strategy that we approved in Madrid, everything we did to reinforce the visibility of the organization and uh, what we are preparing to obtain the universality of IPU. So, about uh, the implementation of the strategy in Madrid. Of course, I did some visits to Bahrain, to Serbia, to Kazakhstan, to talk about democracy, human rights and state of law. This is the essential goals of our organization. And in all my visits, I try to defend them and to, pro to promote them. We had the annual hearing at United Nations headquarters in New York, where 
more than 200 MPs discussed the sustainable recovery for our economy and for our society after the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, we try also to abort new policies. First of all, the political approach with the United Nations and preparing the transparency report that you have in your tables to discuss during this assembly. Second point is to reinforce the visibility of the organization. Of course, the visits are essential for that. Also, I always I had press conference where I talk about the history of IPU, the importance of IPU, and to defend the values of our organization. And, of course, a lot of presence at social media. This is essential. When uh, we need to defend something, when we need to condemn coup d'etat that may happen in many countries of the world, in all issues where IPU should have one opinion. We approved the Executive Committee a communication strategy that we will discuss also during this assembly. And finally, how to get the universality of IPU. We are preparing a mission to the United States. After all the contacts with Madame Pelosi, it's time, now that the Congress is meeting again in person in Washington, to go there with a delegation of IPU to convince our friends and colleagues to join us. But we need also to get other countries that are not members of IPU. And we are preparing also in Panama very soon another meeting where we will join the islands of Caribbean because all countries are important to our organization. Three months of work, a lot of things to explain to you. Of course, it is impossible to discuss the positions and the activity of IPU during the last three months without uh, referring to what happened in Ukraine. This is one extraordinary event. Unfortunately, something that no one wish and everyone condemns. Before the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, as president of IPU, I make a strong statement asking for dialogue and diplomacy as the only way to solve the problems between countries and people. After it, I went to Kiev to show the solidarity of IPU with our colleagues of the Ukrainian Parliament and with the people of Ukraine to express that the international borders recognized by the United Nations should also be to be respected. After the invasion, I made also a more stronger statement condemning the invasion. And uh, the Executive Committee of IPU had one meeting where we discussed the issue and we had approved a very strong declaration condemning the invasion, asking for a ceasefire and defending diplomacy as the way to solve problems and to say, saying also that uh, IPU should be available to be a platform of dialogue between both parliaments. After it, I met the Ukrainian ambassador in Lisbon to show the solidarity of IPU 
with the people of Ukraine. And I had a phone call with the speaker of the Grand National Assembly of Turkey to say thank you to all the efforts of Turkey to have a diplomatic solution to the problem of the invasion of Ukraine. The war needs to stop now. The suffering of innocent people needs to stop. This is the position of IPU. This is the position of the president of IPU. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear colleagues. This is the summary of my, my report. I understood that the report was sent to you all uh, by electronic tools. And so I ask if someone wishes to, to rise the floor. No? Dear colleagues, so uh, I believe that uh, it's possible the Governing Council to endorse the, the, the report and also the declaration that is a part of it about Ukraine. Thank you so much. So we go to the point uh, six and uh, the, the presentation by the Secretary General of the IPU impact report of over the past five years. You have 10 minutes, Mr. Secretary General. Is, we, know, we, we know Master so well, so you have 10 minutes to present the report. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can use mine. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I, I, I will try, especially so, especially so as uh, the uh, report of the Secretary General has been uh, distributed to you in one form or the other. It is uh, uh, a report. Uh, we do have, we do have, can you hear me now? Can, can you hear me now? Can I take your statement? I'm literally eating the microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, the report has been uh, circulated uh, in limited copies, printed copies, in line with our paper smart uh, policy, but we have also made it widely available electronically, so it is something that you can access uh, on the website of the IPU uh, for your consideration and uh, we just want to uh, uh, make a few comments of introduction to this uh, report which as we call it we have been calling it in recent years the impact report and this is because increasingly stakeholders in international organizations uh, lay emphasis on results they lay emphasis on impact of the actions of the organizations and not a description of the activities that have been carried out or the ticking of boxes uh, when it comes to uh, the work of organizations. So this report has endeavored, as in the past, to identify what impact your organization. I see, Madam, Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, I do see that there is a, a delegate who has raised their nameplate. But if it is about the report the of the Secretary General, is, is pleased to, 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 to end the presentation. Are you working? No, no. 
Sorry, Mr. President. Um, it's not about the report, but we can't hear clearly all these, the Secretary General is saying. The voice is just too low. <laughs> I thought I was shouting, and I thought I was literally eating the microphone. Can you hear me now? Okay, very good. I, I, I will do my best. Uh, otherwise, I, I suggest that the Honorable Delegate use their earpiece to uh, listen to the presentation through their uh, interpretation uh, device that they have there, because uh, the sound quality may be better. Okay? So I, I, I was just saying that uh, this is a report that has been circulated to you all in hard copy, but as well as electronically. And we have a late emphasis in that report on results. What have we achieved? When we were in Madrid uh, last November, I did say that at this particular assembly, I would present a report uh, covering the five years of the previous strategy. So you could have an idea of the evolution of the organization and its impact over the period of five years. So this report covers that five-year period that is uh, compliant with the uh, period covered by the uh, previous uh, uh, strategy, the strategy that has now been superseded by the uh, new one. And so in, that, in this report, you will see uh, that there are certain uh, guide, uh, I would say, landmarks that have been achieved by your organization. The president has mentioned the move by the IPU towards universal universality in its membership. Uh, we have also tried to broaden the reach of the organization. In uh, 2017, you just had the office in Geneva and the one in New York. We have now had uh, an outpost created in Vienna for the UN-based organizations in uh, Vienna, uh, where we now have an ambassador. So we are able to capture the issues that are being dealt with in Vienna. We have also seen in the past five years an increase in the visibility of the organization. I uh, have that uh, slide there that you have on your screen, which shows uh, the uh, popularity, the growing popularity of our website, the increasing use of uh, social media platforms such as uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, for the uh, promotion of the message of the IPU. During the past five years also, uh, we have uh, made an endeavor to increase uh, the number of tools that are available to parliamentarians to do their work. You do deliberate like you're doing at this assembly. You do take decisions, make re resolutions. And it is our role also then to give you the tools that you require to perform those uh, mandates that you have assigned to yourself and your uh, fellow parliaments. And that is why you will see in this report that there has been an increase in the number of publications that we're issuing that provide guidance and uh, information or data on the various issues that you're dealing with so that when you deliberate in your own parliaments, when you take action, make policy, this is based on evidence, it's based on uh, expert knowledge of the subject uh, matter. We have also endeavored during this past five years to promote the organization as a platform for interparliamentary dialogue. Uh, we must say that over these past five years, much of it has been during a very exceptional uh, period the, characterized by uh, the COVID pandemic. And so uh, we have been uh, very hard at working towards improving upon the way we do business in a very challenging environment characterized, as I said, by uh, COVID. You will see in this report that we have mentioned that during this period, the IPU continued to be open for business. It continued to provide that platform, a forum for you to deliberate on issues on the global agenda. And this has been done thanks to the accelerated uh, digital transformation that we have operated in the organization. And so many of the events, many of the activities that have been conducted by the organization have been through digital technology, which is something that uh, we are going to uh, continue to uh, promote uh, in the coming years. Uh, 
Let me also then uh, say that the report goes on to provide details to you on the different results that have been, uh, been achieved against the strategic objectives that you had identified in the previous strategy, and there were eight of them. And we, in the report, we have described what we are doing in the area of uh, empowering parliaments and democracy, which is uh, strategic uh, objective number one, where we uh, provide information to you on the impact or the uh, activities that we have carried out in support of parliaments in Egypt, in Djibouti, in uh, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and all those countries around the world which need uh, uh, capacity building for parliamentarians. We have also uh, given you information on what we have done to provide uh, information through, for instance, the, uh, uh, the global parliamentary report, the standards that we are developing for democratic parliaments, for you to uh, uh, look at and uh, be inspired by this. During this assembly, we will be launching the latest edition of the global parliamentary report, which will be focusing on citizen engagement, how parliaments around the world are engaging with their constituents in the discharge of their uh, mandate. So it is something that we are working on, uh, strengthening capacity in Parliament, but also looking at how we can develop those tools, publications and data that uh, we then use uh, to strengthen Parliament. Uh, another key area of your work has been on gender equality. We have been steadfast in promoting access of women to uh, the uh, uh, political sphere and uh, during the period under review, you see that picture there where you had the major summit of uh, women parliamentarians in uh, Vienna uh, last year. Uh, now, we do have in the world, I think the statistics were released a couple of weeks ago, that 26.1% of global parliamentary uh, leadership is made up of women. And the uh, statistics are encouraging, but the space of uh, uh, progress is very slow. We hope that coming out of this assembly, we can have a greater resolve to increase parliamentary uh, uh, representation for women. And Mr. President, you may wish to acknowledge the presence of uh, an example of women's leadership in the presence of uh, Madam Speaker of the Indonesian Parliament, who is one of uh, the handful of uh, women speakers of parliament in the world. There are just 22% of you in the world and we are very happy that we're meeting in your country, Madam uh, Speaker, uh, so that we can use you as a role model for promoting gen uh, gender equality. We have also striven to uh, protect women's rights in the area of uh, violence against women, fighting uh, the scourge of uh, sexual violence, especially in parliaments, and uh, the report is very replete with examples of how this is being uh, taken care of. Uh, let's move on to uh, human rights. I would not say a lot here about human rights because you will have a full-fledged report on uh, the IPU's uh, work in promoting the human rights of parliamentarians later uh, during this assembly. But just to say that here, unfortunately, uh, the specialized committee that you have in the organization to protect the human rights of parliamentarians has witnessed an increasing workload. It should not be the case. We would like them to not have to deal with this number of cases, but they are, have been very steadfast and in cooperation with many of you have uh, uh, recorded uh, very good successes in some countries in having parliamentarians released. Uh, repar remedies are found for those parliamentarians whose rights have been uh, violated. So the message here is that we should all strive to make sure that we don't have as many cases of uh, 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 violations of human rights of parliamentarians as this committee has been uh, uh, witnessing in uh, recent years. Uh, if we can go on to the next strategic objective, which is uh, contributing to peace building and conflict prevention. Again, I think this goes to the very core of what you were saying in your report, Mr. President, that the IPU serves as that forum where we promote dialogue, the virtues of dialogue and mediation as a means of resolving uh, conflict. And this is reflected in much of the work that you do in building bridges between conflicting uh, communities, whether it's in the Middle East or 
on the Korean Peninsula. And I want to mention that in 2018, for the first time, we were able to bring uh, parliamentary representatives of the two Koreas to the same table in the context of the IPU assembly to continue to promote dialogue and build bridges between the two communities. It is something that I, I believe we need to do uh, more of. And um, during the period of the uh, strategy, we also had the development of a new program in the IPU on countering terrorism and violent extremism. The report gives you examples of what have been done, creating awareness, building uh, tools for parliaments uh, to contribute uh, to fighting terrorism. You can see that we have developed an application for, on counterterrorism. We have developed a database and we even developed model legislation on uh, fighting terrorism. And uh, so we can work on that in a more uh, sustained manner. Uh, can we go on to the next slide, please, very quickly? Next. Yes, interparliamentary dialogue. That is what you are here doing, promoting interparliamentary dialogue. And I, I need not repeat what I have said, that during the pandemic, you have remained open for business, thanks to digital transformation. You have been meeting regularly uh, in the assemblies and uh, special uh, meetings. The president mentioned the annual hearing at the United Nations, uh, so that uh, the voice of parliaments continues to be heard at uh, the international level. The slide you see there is a picture of the uh, speakers' conference that was held last year in uh, Vienna. Next, next slide, quickly, please. Youth empowerment, you will agree with me that this organization is looking younger, not only in terms of the faces that you're uh, having in the IPU assemblies, but also in terms of the issues that you are discussing. Uh, you are uh, infusing the youth perspective into your deliberations, and the youth movement is uh, growing stronger. But one of the messages that is coming out of this report is that youth participation in Parliament is still very low. Uh, you have just about 2.6 percent of the global parliamentary community made up of parliamentarians be below the age of 30. And that is why, uh, Mr. President, you and your colleagues have endorsed the campaign that says, I say yes to youth in Parliament. Many of the world leaders have now signed up to the campaign to make sure that they can carry out specific measures to increase the uh, level of uh, youth participation in Parliament. So the message here is that we should do more. Those parliamentarians or uh, leaders who have not signed up to this campaign are uh, encouraged to do so. I think there is a stand out there. Next slide, very quickly. Yes, the development goals. Uh, we have uh, always articulated the need to have strong parliaments, to have strong de uh, democracies in the world. And we think that those strong parliaments and strong democracies should lead to specific concrete impact. And the platform for the organization to contribute to that is the Global Development Agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. And so in 2020, uh, during the period under review, we have had a lot of work going into mobilizing parliaments around the SDGs, uh, doing that at the global, regional, but also at the national level where it counts. And uh, we have in the report uh, examples of countries that have uh, more actively been involved in promoting parliamentary uh, action, including creation of specialized bodies for uh, the implementation of the SDGs at uh, the national level. And we have also seen an increase in an area that you have now identified as a key priority area, climate change, climate emergency, and there tools have been developed with specialized agencies to uh, promote uh, parliamentary uh, contribution to uh, stem the uh, scourge of climate change. The picture you see there is an example of how parliaments of the IPU is uh, promoting uh, parliamentary involvement in global processes. Here it's okay, the uh, okay. COP26 that took place in Glasgow, where there is a strong statement for parliaments to continue to promote uh, action at the parliamentary level for uh, fighting climate change. I think we're moving to the, that one, the president has talked about uh, the uh, annual hearing at the United Nations promoting interparliamentary dialogue, please. 
I think now then, I think I should conclude, Mr. President, just to say that, as I mentioned earlier, we have, over the past five years, been working under very exceptional circumstances. But the message we are getting is that parliaments and parliamentarians are resilient. We have been able to cope with very difficult circumstances. We have been able to be open for business in uh, the, uh, meeting the challenges of climate change, or not climate change, the pandemic. Secondly, we note with regret that there, uh, there is a rollback of progress when it comes to democracy in certain parts of the world. And Mr. President, you and your colleagues in the Executive Committee have expressed deep concern over the increasing number of uh, coup d'etats that are taking place in the world uh, today, especially in Africa, where it's, whether it's in Mali, uh, Guinea, Burkina Faso, most recently Sudan. And you have, I think, expressed the, uh, that concern, but also the resolve to look at this very carefully to see how the IPU more robustly responds to these uh, challenges uh, to uh, democracy. So uh, we can say that over these past five years, the organization, with no false modesty here, has fared well, has been open for business, has seen its support base broaden, not, in terms of, not only in terms of the membership of the organization, but also in terms of the support that you're getting financially from many donors. The donor base of the organization is broadening. You have more uh, partners that are coming in to provide additional resources for you to uh, address an ever-increasing uh, base of activities. And Mr. President, I want to use this opportunity to recognize the contribution of many partners that are here or who are not here. The development cooperation agencies, such as the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, Irish Aid, the Canadian uh, uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the uh, Chinese NPC, uh, Benin, uh, Republic of Korea, the, uh, Angola, uh, Micronesia, Qatar, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, United Arab Emirates, the Arab Parliament, who are providing financial resources to the organization to help us deliver on the mandate of the organization. My appeal is that we should uh, reach out to other uh, donors of goodwill to contribute to uh, the uh, financial resources of the organization. I also want to point to the expanding pa partnership that we have experienced with our uh, partners of the United Nations system, whether it's the United Nations Development Program, the World Health Organization, the UN Office on Div Disarmament Affairs, UN Women when it comes to gender equality, the uh, least developed countries unit of the United Nations, all of these uh, partners are working with the IPU in their areas of expertise to engage with the parliamentary community so that parliamentary outcomes can become better. So in conclusion, yes, there are successes, but we still face challenges. I told you about the increase in the visibility of the IPU, but I think that we are all have identified a major challenge, and that major challenge is how we reach out to all of the 46,000 parliamentarians that we have in the world. That is a major challenge for the organization. We are improving uh, our visibility, but our communication needs to be more robust in reaching out if we want to really make a difference at the level of uh, the international uh, community, parliamentary uh, community. Another major challenge, Mr. President, is digital transformation. The IPU cannot be remain complacent when it comes to transformation in terms of use of technology in how they operate, both at the level of the IPU, but also at the level of national parliaments. We are challenged to support uh, parliaments to use digital technology to improve upon the way they function. We have the mechanism that we have put in place. The Center for Innovation in Parliament in the IPU is helping parliaments uh, harness 
the potential of technology to improve upon the way they do business. We need to pursue and scale up this digital transformation at the global but also at the national level. Mr. President, I, in, conclusion, in conclusion this time, I am saying that we do have a basis for going forward and that is the new strategy that you and your colleagues approved in Madrid last November. It is, we consider this to be our marching orders. The strategy is a very robust one uh, that has the potential to help us achieve the vi uh, vision that you have for your institution. And what we are trying to do in that strategy now is to make sure that we adopt an integrated approach to the way we do business. We uh, consider uh, parliaments not in isolation, but as an ecosystem with a galaxy of partners revolving around parliaments. And lastly, to make sure that we are and we can develop the capacity of the organization to monitor progress in the implementation of this strategy, in the implementation of the vision of the organization. Monitoring this progress in order to identify the results but also the challenges so as to be better able to uh, uh, correct our track and move forward. So, Mr. President, I, don't, I think I'll spend more than 10 minutes, but uh, I'm not known to be very disciplined in these matters. I just want to commend to you and your colleagues this report, which is not meant to be uh, adopted as such, but to be taken note of and, uh, uh, you know, responded to so that we can strive to do better in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Sec Secretary General, the report was distributed to all you, you all. So I ask if someone wish to, to rise the floor on this report. No. So thank you. Uh, and also thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for the results. Uh, you may see that. We, in this report, is evident how the activity was has grown during the last uh, during the last the last years. Uh, just and uh, just the bad number there is the name the number of, of MPs that uh, complain to the Committee of Human Rights of Parliamentarians. But allow me to say that this it shows also the success of IPU because as the IPU is more relevant and more known, more people will apply to the IPU. But of course, we we'll we are happier if it is no no. No one uh, needs to complain to, the, to defend the human rights uh, in our committee. Yeah, As, Yemen, I, 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 because I saw someone uh, rising the floor. Yemen. ورد في التقرير الإشارة إلى بعض الانقلابات التي تمت في أفريقيا. وسميت بعض الدول بالاسم ونود الإحاطة إلى أن هناك انقلاب قام في اليمن ويوجد هنا من زملائكم أعضاء البرلمان اليمني لأنهم رفضوا الانقلاب الذي قام بالقوة المسلحة وأسقط النظام الدستوري الشرعي في الدولة فشردوا هؤلاء الأعضاء وحكم على معظم اللي موجودون هنا معكم على معظم الموجودين هنا معكم في هذه الجلسة بالإعدام ومصادرة أموالهم وممتلكاتهم ولا ندري كيف البرلمان الدولي وهو يمثل العالم أجمعه لم يعلم بما جرى لليمن من انقلاب على الشرعية الدستورية 
وعلى الدستور واصبح من يتمسك بالدستور وتمسك بالقسم الدستوري الذي اقسم عليه الذي يحرم الاستيلاء على السلطه بالقوه اصبح مجرم ويحاكم وتصادر امواله وممتلكاته ويشرد معظم اعضاء البرلمان اليمني حضروا الى هذه الجلسه من اسقاء العالم من القاهره ومن كوالالمبور ومن اسطنبول ومن بلدان اخرى في العالم مشردون بسبب انهم تمسكوا بالدستور وباليمين الدستوريه التي اقسموا عليها شكرا Okay. Thank you. Uh, dear colleague, the situation of the uh, UN, uh, we, uh, we will discuss when on point uh, 11, the situation of, of certain parliaments. Of course, it's uh, one situation that is in our worries, and uh, we pay attention to the situation in, in Yemen. And on point 11, the, we, we will came back to, the, uh, to, to this, to that situation, and to other to, to the situation of other parliaments. But uh, thank you for your intervention. But about the report of the Secretary General, if no one wish we may consider adopted the report of the Secretary General. And uh, this way, dear, dear colleagues, uh, we ca before we go to the other point of our agenda, the communication strategy, allow me uh, to ask you to give you one bad uh, information uh, because our colleague the speaker of Uganda passed away and unfortunately Honorable Jacob Ulanyak and I wish to express to the Uganda delegation and to the people of the delegation our condolences. I believe that is not from the President but from all over, all the IPU and from all of you, and I will ask one minute of silence in his honor, please. Thank you. Of course, when letter will be sent to the, the Uganda Parliament to express to the people of uh, uh, Uganda our the condolences of IPU and not just IPU, the, the Secretary General, the President, but all MPs and speakers that are in our uh, meeting. Now, point seven, communication uh, strategy. Uh, I will give the floor to the Secretary General. Uh, as you know, this is one point for me very important personally. As President of IPU, I said always that in politics, the communication is essential in our society. Uh, I believe that it's something that you understand very well because you are all politicians and need to be elected. And if you don't communicate well, 
it will be more difficult to be re-elected. And so uh, we, we as a whole, as uh, one of the most important organizations of the world, need to improve our, improve a lot, improve a lot. Because it's so easy to understand. Uh, when we talk with uh, people outside politics, just a few knows IPU. And uh, many people just understand what is IPU when became member of parliament. And so it means that we failed during the past to give visibility to the organization. And we need to, uh, to, to do different because if we do the same way, the results will be the same. That's why we decided to approve a new strategy. I will give the floor to the Secretary General to present it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you're right. I think that uh, we are all challenged to do a better job of marketing the organization and what it does in order to attract more visibility. And uh, the adoption of the uh, new strategy for the organization last uh, November, uh, that will cover the period 2022 to 2026, was an opportunity for you too to uh, review uh, the achievement of the uh, past IPU communication strategy and identify the way forward with a new uh, strategy that is more, excuse the tautology, more strategic, more high level, uh, a strategy that more clearly articulates the vision of the organization and how it is uh, positioning itself as a unique forum in the world for promoting parliamentary and global uh, multilateralism. And that is why you and your colleagues, Mr. President, in the Executive Committee have been busy over the past uh, several months reviewing uh, progress in the previous strategy and now adopting or proposing for adoption to the Governing Council a new uh, strategy for, that will be aligned with the overall IPO strategy that is, will cover the period 2022 to 2026 the previous communication strategy was a, a three-year one. Now we are moving to a five-year cycle uh, with the provision that the communication strategy will be reviewed uh, on a regular basis in order to correct course if uh, need be. So you have that text that has been circulated to you, a hard copy, but also electronically, which is, I think, very clear in that you want to your organization to uh, position itself and strengthen its position as the primary global resource for about between parliaments. And so our strategy will now be, our communication strategy will now be targeting, as I mentioned in my uh, report, will be targeting all of the 46,000 parliamentarians that we have in the world uh, today if we uh, want to make a real uh, impact. And so you will see in that document that we are proposing various models for achieving this positioning of the organization. I come back to the need that you have uh, addressed, Mr. President, you and your colleagues, you have identified the need to accelerate digital transformation of the organization, especially in the area of communication. So in the new uh, communication strategy, emphasis is being laid on uh, digital communications. Emphasis is being laid on uh, using the various digital platforms that exist or identifying new ones to articulate and disseminate the message of the organization. Yes, it will be important to look at the infrastructure but it's even more important to look at the content that uh, has to go into that infrastructure. And so you will be working uh, more robustly to identify data 
information and other uh, tools that will go into this uh, digital transformation uh, architecture in order to uh, capture the interest of all of the 46,000 parliamentarians in the world. The second model that is being proposed in this communication strategy lays emphasis on the involvement of the stakeholders that you are. The point has been made by the executive committee that marketing this organization is not the function, so, uh, the responsibility solely of the IPU secretariat and its staff. It is a joint responsibility of uh, the administration of the IPU and the political uh, constituency that you are. So uh, you will see that increasingly you will be asked to articulate the message of the uh, IPU at national level. There will be more stringent engagement with the leadership of Parliament. This was made very clear. We uh, will rely on the leadership uh, of the speakers of Parliament around the world to market the organization and its work in a, more bet in a better way at the uh, national level. This is something that uh, the Executive Committee did mention very clearly when it uh, recommended the adoption of the uh, strategy. And lastly, the IPU will continue to do its best to engage with other stakeholders outside uh, the realm of parliaments, the United Nations system, the private sector, civil society, the media, in order to sell this message. And this is consistent with the approach of your new strategy, which calls for the building of a parliamentary eco ecosystem, which includes parliament as the centerpiece, but other uh, stakeholders. So you have that document that is uh, before you for uh, approval, uh, which also uh, includes, I would say, uh, some sort of uh, uh, identification of uh, key uh, uh, periods in the year where IPU should be more actively engaged. So we have identified those as the uh, uh, International Women's Month, that is March. We have identified the two assemblies of the IPU during the year. We have identified the 30th of June, which is the International Day of Parliamentarism, your day, the day uh, the 30th of June, the day the IPU was created in 1889. We have also identified the 15th of September, which is uh, the International Day of Democracy. And then we have the 25th of November, which is the International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women. Lastly, the uh, event that we have also identified as uh, a period when we need to see a peak in IPU's visibility is uh, Human Rights Day which is a point that the president made earlier uh, to highlight the work that the IPU is doing to alleviate the suffering of uh, your colleagues, parliamentarians around the world. Mr. President, with those introductory remarks, I believe you want to invite the Governing Council now to formally endorse this uh, new communication strategy, which, as we have said, will be monitored on a regular basis and uh, uh, the necessary co corrections implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, I will uh, summarize three of, of our points. The digital transformation of type U communication to encourage more engagement and accountability from IPU and stakeholders, and accountability is essential in our organization. And uh, to increase the uh, influence and visibility of IPU. This strategy will put the MPs in the center of our po political of communication. If we don't communicate with our 46,000, forget to, co to communicate with the others. With all MPs need to be the center and to the focus of the communication and we wish and we wait that each one will, will spread the communication to the society as well. And uh, finally, this strategy will uh, be accountable as well. We will come back 
because uh, we can approve wonderful papers. Everyone knows how to do wonderful papers. It's just to consult, just to, to contract a consultant and we will do the best paper of the world. The, the, uh, what is more difficult it to, is to implement it. And so what we need to change is the implementation now of the strategy. Because if it is just a paper to show you, and if you go on and we are doing the same, the result will be the same. We will not get the relevance that we need. So we need to change completely the way we work in communication and we wait for that with the new strategy. And uh, this way, I will ask the floor, if someone wish to, to take the floor, of course. No one. So, uh, I, I believe that it's possible to approve the new strategy of communication of IPL. Thank you. Going to the point eight, proposed amendments to the rules of, of the committee on the Middle East questions. Uh, it is a very uh, specific amendment uh, and uh, that was a request by the committee. I will give the floor to the Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As you say, it's a, a, a straightforward amendment. The Committee on Middle East Questions is comprised of 14 uh, members, 12 elected members and two ex-official members. Its rules uh, provide for gender equality, which means there should be seven men and seven women on that committee. But in practice, we have realized that uh, to achieve that is problematic in view of the fact that you have two ex-official members whose uh, identity cannot, we, can, we have no control over. It may well be that each time it will be both men or both women. And so the committee has proposed that uh, a slight amendment be made to the rules to provide for gender equality in respect of those 12 members that are elected by you. Uh, so uh, you will have at any given time, at least six members of each of the uh, two sexes uh, sitting on that committee. And in that way, you can uh, comply with the gender equality rules. So the amendment there is therefore to say that no more than six members of the executive committee, who, of the uh, uh, members of the Committee on Middle East Questions, who are not ex-official members, shall be of the same sex. And the rest remains unchanged. Uh, this is a procedural issue that uh, will allow you to continue to comply with your gender equality vision and requirements as per the statutes of the organization. Mr. President, you may now invite your colleagues to approve this amendment so that it can go into uh, force as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's mine. Ah, no, <laughs> it's working. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. No one is against that uh, proposal of amendment. So it's approved. You go to the point eight. Future interparliamentary meetings. You receive the proposals. Uh, to uh, all the meetings, allow me to express the proposal uh, uh, of the, the, especially the assemblies, to go to Kigali, Rwanda, between 9 and 13 of October, to the 145 assembly, and uh, Finally, we are going to Rwanda because it was postponed to, for two times. 
we, uh, we will be very happy uh, to go to Rwanda. The authorities of Rwanda invite us and they are committed to receive the IPU. And we have the proposal uh, of uh, Bahrain to host the assembly next uh, March, between 11 and 15 of March of 23. And after it, we will come back to Geneva between 8 and 12 of October. But I, uh, it, I know that other countries are, uh, will make a proposal to, to that one as well. It will be one reflection that we may have, have on the future. Because until now, we don't have a, 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 a concrete proposal to receive uh, and to host the Assembly of October 23. But, Mr. Secretary-General, do you wish to make a presentation? Okay. okay, thank you very much, Mr. President. It's not a presentation, it's not another report. It's just to uh, confirm that you have this schedule of uh, meetings that has been uh, circulated to you. And yes, we are pleased to be able to go to uh, Rwanda later this year. And uh, you also uh, see now that uh, the uh, Kingdom of Bahrain has graciously offered to host the uh, assembly thereafter in March uh, 2023 in Manama. I can confirm, Mr. President, that uh, we have received all the necessary guarantees uh, for visas to be issued to all uh, participants in that assembly. We have sent a technical mission to uh, Manama to ascertain the availability of the technical uh, facilities to host an assembly, and uh, we are reasonably assured that uh, uh, Manama has uh, those uh, facilities to host the assembly. So you and your colleagues uh, may now wish to formally endorse that uh, offer from uh, the uh, authorities of, from the Kingdom of Bahrain. In addition to the uh, statutory assemblies, you have a list of uh, specialized and other meetings that is before you. And if you look at that list, most of the uh, meetings have already been authorized or approved by the governing council. There are a few that require your approval, but I just want to uh, reassure members here, in case that was a problem, uh, that all the only, only meetings for which we have identified resources, either core or external, are included in this list. And so, whatever is there is uh, something that we can reasonably implement uh, if uh, other conditions are met. You will see that many of the meetings do not have venues for a variety of reasons because we are still negotiating. The dates have not been clarified uh, for others. But uh, we do foresee, uh, as we have said before, uh, many of these meetings taking place digitally, online, in, com in compliance with our new reinforced uh, digital transformation policy. And so we would like to uh, commend uh, this, uh, those uh, meetings for, for your approval so that we can continue uh, to uh, uh, make arrangements for their implementation. I would like to uh, particularly single out the, uh, this year's Conference of Young Parliamentarians, Global Conference of Young Parliamentarians, which uh, the Republic of Egypt has so graciously offered to host in May this year. Mr. Pre Mr. Speaker, I believe that's the case. You can confirm that this is going uh, to take place in May uh, this year with the specific venue to be uh, identified uh, clearly. So uh, all those meetings that are in there are meetings that are consistent with the key areas of priority that you have identified for the organization. So uh, each time we are considering a meeting, we look at our strategy and make sure that what we are doing is consistent with our strategy and so that we don't spread ourselves thin, as you, uh, you have said before. So you have that uh, schedule of meetings that is there for your consideration, and Mr. Uh, President, you may wish to invite your, you and your colleagues to endorse 
that uh, uh, a schedule so there that has been distributed to you. And let me say that details of each of these meetings will be published as we go along on the IPO website so you know the state of preparation uh, and you then have uh, some degree of certainty as to your involvement. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Someone wish to, to take the floor on this issue? Turkey. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm looking for this side of the room. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Mr. General Secretary, for the presentation. Uh, I, it's not on the agenda yet. I just looked. But uh, we have an invitation for, the, for an IPU meeting on migration. And it's a very relevant topic right now uh, as we're dealing with the crisis in Ukraine, which is a humanitarian crisis. I didn't see it online. That's why I'm saying it. So thank you so much. Uh, so I'll take this opportunity to invite everybody <laughs> to Istanbul. We will be honored to host the delegation. Hopefully, we'll be as good hosts as the Indonesian parliament. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Kravza. Uh, when you ask the floor, I thought you, you will invite us, uh, because the, uh, the proposal meeting in Istanbul, 9 and 10 of June, is in our schedule uh, that was distributed to all, you all, and the item mig migration uh, is very important, as we know. Uh, uh, not just for Europeans, for Africans, for people from the Middle East, but also from uh, people on other continents. In Latin America, you have a, a lot of problems of migration as well, uh, for instance, and here in South, Africa, in South Asia. <laughs> That's why. Uh, I apologize, and it's not online yet, so thank you. Hopefully, we'll see you too soon. And we will receive the uh, list as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. Anyone wish to take the floor? No. So we'll consider the approved the agenda of our future interparliamentary meetings, point nine. Uh, dear colleagues, just a second. Yeah. Dear colleagues, uh, we have a key, one extra point. I ask your comprehension uh, for that. As you, uh, as, you, uh, as you know, we uh, have, in all uh, meetings, on, during the second uh, meeting of the Governing Council, we elect or appoint the same uh, internal uh, auditors for the, for the, for the other year. What happened is, is very easy to explain. The internal auditor elected from our uh, from Gabon, Madame Sophie Molegi, Mole, Mol, Moel, was appointed, but she is not already member of Parliament. And so uh, she left the parliament. And we began, we, we began, uh, we came in one situation uh, without internal auditor. Of course, there is no worries 
about our financial situation, especially because nowadays we have a subcommittee on finance composed by MPs from all geopolitical groups that accompany the situation of the organization every day, may I say. They, we, they, they uh, have meetings frequently and they have frequently contacts with the, the financial team of IPU. But in accordance with our statutes, we need to have one internal auditor for, our, uh, for the accounts of 2021. So, the proposal of the Executive Committee was to this uh, Governing Council in one extraordinary situation to accept the nomination of a colleague uh, to do it in three days, the report about the financial situation 2021. Uh, we have two options, not to do the report or to have the report. Our statutes saying that it's important the, the existence of the report of the internal auditor. And we have a person that was member of the executive committee and member also of the subcommittee on finance. And this way, she accompanied during that air term the, uh, as member of the executive committee, the finances of the organization. Madame Lawrence Riel of Switzerland. The, uh, the position of the XCOM is to accept the proposal that uh, in this situation to accept that someone in three days prepare a report. Of course, she knows the situation of the organization as member of the former member of the executive committee and former member of the financial committee. And so this, she will not look for the figures for the first time. But this is the reality. For future, we should always be aware that we need to elect two, two uh, internal auditors. Because it may happen again. Someone left uh, the, the, a position as a member of parliament or someone may pass away. And to not repeat what we have today, we need to, uh, to avoid a situation like what we have. And so I will ask if, you, uh, if the Governing Council may adopt, may accept, may I this way, may accept the nomination of Madame Feldman Riel as internal auditor for the year 2021. Is, is adopted, and a special thanks to our colleague, uh, because uh, just, just one amazing uh, uh, passion to the IPU explains uh, the acceptable position she has uh, in these circumstances uh, as uh, she is uh, doing the job. Thank you. Before uh, we will uh, finish our work with, of Governing Council, we came back on the 24 to the rest of the agenda. But before, I will ask uh, our speaker from Indonesia if uh, is available to accept the nomination as president of the assembly because it is our wish that you madam speaker presides the assembly in a few minutes but of course 
only if you accept this R task. A microphone to the Madam Speaker, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Yang Mulia, Ketua Parlemen Anggota IPU, Presiden IPU, Mr. Duarte Pacheco, Delegasi Negara-Negara Anggota IPU, Sekretaris Jenderal IPU, Mr. Martin Chunggong. Saya ingin menyampaikan apresiasi dan rasa terima kasih atas kepercayaan dan mandat yang telah diberikan kepada DPR RI dan saya untuk memimpin Majelis IPU ke-144. Kepercayaan ini tentu akan saya gunakan untuk memimpin Majelis IPU ke-144 dengan transparan dan inklusif, sehingga kita dapat melaksanakan pertemuan dengan produktif dan menghasilkan kesepakatan untuk kepentingan bersama. Dalam memimpin pertemuan ini, tentunya saya akan memerlukan Dukungan dan kerjasama dari semua negara anggota IPU, Presiden dan Sekretaris Jenderal serta Sekretariat IPU. Bagi kami, DPR RI, kami mengakui pentingnya diplomasi parlemen yang kuat yang dapat berkontribusi menjembatani perbedaan antar negara serta memperkuat kerjasama internasional, multilateralisme dan menolak unilateralisme. Hal ini sejalan dengan tujuan IPU yang mana IPU telah membuktikan efektivitas dialog antar anggota parlemen untuk mengimplementasikan demokrasi, memelihara perdamaian, mempromosikan hak azazi manusia, memajukan kesetaraan gender, dan mencapai tujuan pembangunan berkelanjutan. Melalui majelis IPU ke-144 ini, saya berharap kita bersama dapat berkontribusi meneguhkan semangat solidaritas internasional. Saya berharap dalam pertemuan ini kita semua dapat membahas beberapa hal terkait antara lain. Sesuai dengan tema pertemuan, bagaimana Parlemen dapat memobilisasi aksi penurunan emisi. Upaya Parlemen dapat meningkatkan saling kepercayaan atau trust building dalam mencapai perdamaian, upaya mengakselerasi berakhirnya pandemi, dan juga isu-isu lain terkait hak azazi, hak azazi manusia, kesetaraan gender, kepemudaan, dan tujuan ke pembangunan berkelanjutan. Kita dapat memulai diskusi dengan membahas isu-isu yang mana kita memiliki kesamaan pandangan. Selanjutnya, Kita dapat membahas isu-isu di mana masih terdapat perbedaan, pemban, pema, e, perbedaan pandangan. Tentunya diperlukan fleksibilitas dari semua pihak dan take and give sehingga dokumen akhir dapat disepakati dengan konses, konsensus. Saya berharap meski kita semua memiliki kepentingan nasional, namun kita juga memperhatikan kepentingan bersama dan memperhatikan serta mempertahankan suasana diskusi yang kondusif. Hanya melalui aksi kolektif, kita akan mampu mencari solusi, mengatasi berbagai tantangan bersama yang tengah kita hadapi. Dengan, de dengan dukungan semua delegasi, saya yakin 
kita akan mampu menyelesaikan semua program kerja majelis IPU ke-144. Dengan dukungan semua delegasi, kita akan membuat majelis IPU ke-144 ini sukses. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. We all trust your wisdom to lead our assembly, and we will contribute to the success of the assembly in uh, here in Nusadua, collaborating with you, and accept. Thank God, you accept the uh, nomination. Thank you. And finally, I will ask uh, Mr. Secretary General to make the announcement specific about the quorum. It's important to understand if everything we did, also this elec election happened with, in accordance with the rules. And so, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Just very quickly, this is just a, a procedural announcement uh, to ascertain, as you say, that your deliberations are valid and legal. Uh, the rules uh, stipulate, and that is Rule 34. Thank you very much. I feel like uh, I'm at a press conference. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, rule 34.2 stipulates uh, that, and that is the rule of the Governing Council, that for each session, the quorum shall be established on the basis of the number of council members effectively participating in the first meeting. That is this meeting of the uh, governing council. And the Secretary General will announce uh, that uh, quorum at that particular time. So it has been ascertained by my colleagues that uh, at the beginning of this session, of this first sitting of the governing council, there were 118 council members present in the room. So the quorum, uh, as stipulated in the rules, for any decision to be valid would be uh, 60 uh, members of uh, the governing council. So 60 is the quorum that will be used. Thank you very much, Mr. President. So everything was le legal during this morning. If not, we need to repeat it, <laughs> and I believe no one wished that. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues, for the cooperation during this morning. We will interrupt for five minutes our works, also to, to make the recomposition of the table, because the Governing Council we, will come back next Thursday, 24 of March, at 9 a.m., uh, to finish the agenda of the Governing Council. Very soon, at 11, we'll begin the Assembly with the, now with the Presidency of Madam Speaker of the Indonesia. Thank you so much. It's closing our works now.
the mic. Yeah, yes. Because yeah. then we, we, we already try uh, uh, five o'clock in, in the morning, but everything is okay, but now doesn't work. Oh my God, technical. No, no, thank you. Yeah. Check, check. Yeah. Good morning. How are you? Fine, thank you. Will you rest? Yeah. No, we, because we finish. It seems uh, we left uh, the dinner. It seems maybe two or three hours ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a busy week. Yeah, it is a busy week. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. Dear colleagues, five minutes break passed. So, may I ask you to take your seats, please? May I ask to take your seats? Thank you.
Dear colleagues, we need to begin the works of the, of the first sitting of our 144 assembly. Do we have to announce this? If this and so, no? I ask you... Now, we are on our assembly and uh, we elect a few minutes ago the speaker Marani as the president of this assembly. And this way, I will invite Speaker Marani, our president, to address the assembly. Okay. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Yang mulia, para ketua-ketua parlemen anggota IPU, Presiden IPU Mr. Duarte Pacheco, Delegasi Negara-Negara Anggota IPU, Sekretaris Jenderal IPU Mr. Martin Cunggong, hadirin sekalian. Good morning, selamat pagi. Sekali lagi saya ingin menyampaikan apresiasi dan rasa terima kasih atas kepercayaan dan mandat yang telah diberikan kepada DPR RI dan saya untuk memimpin Majelis IPU ke-144. Di awal pertemuan ini, kita akan mendengarkan serangkaian pidato pembuka sebagai pengantar pembahasan kita hingga tanggal 24 Maret 2022. Pertemuan Majelis IPU ke-144 ini diadakan pada saat dunia menghadapi berbagai krisis. Virus terus bermutasi, Ketegangan geopolitik meningkat, pemanasan global belum dapat dicegah. Ketegangan geopolitik telah berdampak bagi negara berkembang. Harga minyak, bahan makanan, dan barang-barang esensial mengalami kenaikan. Hal ini menambah beratnya tantangan bersama yang kita hadapi. Dari tantangan terhadap perdamaian, keamanan, demokrasi, hingga menyelesaikan pandemi dan perubahan iklim. Dunia harus berkontribusi mencari solusi, memperkuat komitmen, dan aksi untuk penyelesaiannya. Hal ini memerlukan upaya bersama. Kita harus membangun saling kepercayaan, trust building, jika kita ingin menciptakan perdamaian. Kita harus perkuat solidaritas global, jika kita ingin menekan penyebaran virus. Kita harus memperkuat kemitraan jika kita ingin menurunkan emisi di dunia. Pada majelis IPU ke-144 ini, kita diharapkan dapat menengguhkan kembali tujuan IPU untuk memperkuat parlemen, untuk mempromosikan demokrasi, perdamaian, dan pembangunan berkelanjutan. Tujuan pembentukan IPU pada tahun 1889 yang ingin memperjuangkan perdamaian saat ini ternyata masih relevan. Di saat perdamaian dan stabilitas dunia mengalami tantangan dan konflik masih berlangsung di berbagai belahan dunia. Perang yang terjadi di Ukraina, pencapaian kemerdekaan penuh Palestina, krisis demokrasi di Myanmar, dan berbagai konflik lainnya menunjukkan bahwa masih diperlukan upaya keras menuju perdamaian abadi. Kita harus memperjuangkan dan merawat perdamaian. Kita harus melakukan diplomasi preventif untuk menghindari terjadinya perang dan konflik. Karenanya, Majelis IPU ke-144 harus menjadi momentum bersama 
bagi parlemen untuk berkontribusi menyelesaikan berbagai tantangan global. Kita harus selalu membangun kebiasaan berdialog dan selalu mengutamakan diplomasi. Semua negara harus mematuhi hukum internasional, piagam PBB, dan menghormati integritas teritori suatu negara. Terkait demokrasi yang mengalami tantangan saat pandemi, kita harus menunjukkan bahwa parlemen sebagai penjaga atau gardian demokrasi dapat memperkuat resiliensi demokrasi. Demokrasi yang menjamin kebebasan, hak azazi manusia, dan governance. Demokrasi yang deliver, membantu mengakhiri pandemi, menurunkan kemiskinan dan ketimpangan. Demokrasi juga berperan menjaga perdamaian. Akan sulit bagi negara demokrasi untuk memulai perang. Hal ini karena adanya check and balance sehingga tidak ada kekuasaan absolut pada pemerintah. Untuk mengakhiri pandemi juga perlu tetap menjadi perhatian kita semua. Diharapkan parlemen dapat mengakselerasi pemerataan vaksin di dunia dan membantu produksi vaksin di negara berkembang. Kita juga harus memperkuat arsitektur kesehatan global untuk mencegah dan tanggap terhadap ancaman pandemi di masa depan. Pandemi telah meninggalkan dampak sosial yang besar berupa meningkatnya kemiskinan global lebih dari 120 juta orang, ketimpangan, dan malnutrisi. Hal ini akan mempengaruhi pencapaian Sustainable Development Goals sehingga dalam melakukan pemulihan global, kita tidak cukup hanya menekankan kepada agenda pemulihan kesehatan dan ekonomi. Kita harus mendorong agar agenda pemulihan sosial seperti kemiskinan dan ketimpangan juga mendapat dukungan dari masyarakat internasional. Terkait isu perempuan dan kalangan muda, kita harus terus mengupayakan peningkatan partisipasi perempuan dan kalangan muda dalam pengambilan keputusan di berbagai badan publik. Selain itu, perlu juga memperkuat komitmen mengurangi dampak negatif dari perang, pandemi, dan perubahan iklim bagi perempuan. Perempuan mencakup 80 persen dari displaced person yang terdampak dari perubahan iklim. Perempuan dan anak perempuan adalah yang paling rawan dalam situasi konflik. Tema Majelis IPU ke-144 ini, Getting to Zero, Mobilizing Parliament to Act on Climate Change, memberi kesempatan bagi parlemen untuk berada di garda depan dalam mencapai zero emission. Parlemen perlu berperan dalam memobilisasi aksi nyata mengatasi perubahan iklim. Dan parlemen juga dituntut untuk lead by example dalam menjalankan program kerja yang ramah lingkungan. Perubahan iklim merupakan krisis eksistensi planet bumi. Pemanasan bumi telah terjadi lebih cepat dari masa-masa sebelumnya. Saat ini bumi sudah lebih panas, 1,1 derajat Celcius dibandingkan awal abad lalu. Jika emisi dunia tidak berkurang 7,6 persen per tahunnya dari tahun 2020 hingga tahun 2030, maka dunia tidak akan mencapai target pemanasan bumi 1,5 hingga 2 derajat Celcius. Karenanya kita perlu memobilisasi aksi mitigasi dan adaptasi perubahan iklim. Kita harus merealisasikan komitmen pembiayaan perubahan iklim sebesar 100 miliar US dollar per tahun dan kita harus mendukung transisi energi bersih dengan transfer teknologi dan investasi. Untuk mencapai hal tersebut di atas, pertemuan IPU ke-144 ini dapat menekankan kepada pertama 
perlunya memperkuat kemitraan global dan multilateralisme dalam menyelesaikan berbagai permasalahan global. Kedua, perlunya mengubah komitmen pada berbagai kesepakatan internasional menjadi aksi nyata di dalam negeri. Ketiga, perlunya membangun culture of peace berupa penyelesaian masalah dengan dialog dan toleransi dan meninggalkan kekerasan. Keempat, perlunya parlemen berperan aktif menjembatani perbedaan antar negara dan berupaya membangun saling kepercayaan. Sebagai penutup, saya ingin menegaskan komitmen untuk memimpin Majelis IPU ke-144 ini secara transparan dan inklusif. Saya juga mengharapkan dukungan dari rekan-rekan sekalian sehingga pertemuan ini dapat berlangsung lancar dan produktif. Saya percaya bahwa bersama kita dapat berkontribusi dalam mengatasi berbagai tantangan global. Mari kita tunjukkan bahwa parlemen dapat memberi contoh dalam memperkuat solidaritas global. Mari kita tunjukkan bahwa parlemen menempuh jalan dialog dalam menyelesaikan perbedaan. Dan mari kita tunjukkan bahwa parlemen dapat berkontribusi mewujudkan dunia yang lebih aman, adil, dan sejahtera. Thank you. Terima kasih. Mr. Mr. Pacheco, floor now is yours. Madam Speaker Marani, honorable speakers, and members of parliament, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to welcome you all at opening of the general debate of the 144th Assembly here in New Zadua. This is a unique occasion when parliamentarians from around the world join together to discuss shared challenge and explore opportunities for a safer and a more sustainable world. And uh, may I say something about uh, the, what happened yesterday and today is one special moment for Iran. The first day of the year in Iran. And so they need to commemorate away from home, but with all of us. Congratulations and a happy new year for you. It is a pleasure to be joined here in Nuzadua by so many parliamentarians from all regions of the world and to be able to gather together safely in person, finally in person. Dear colleagues, the planet is facing a crisis. Climate change is worse and worse every passing minute. It is only continuing to intensify unless we quickly enact major change to our economies, to our energy use, energy use practices, and to our food systems. Human activity is a major driver of climate change. The burning of fossil fuels and unsustainable, yes, 
livestock. Farming and deforestation are causing irreparable harm to our environment. Hotter temperatures, melting glaciers, sea level rise and increased droughts and storms are becoming the norm. This, this is having enormous impacts, not only on the planet and on biodiversity, but also human populations who are struggling to survive. Climate change does not affect everyone equally. Marginalized and the poor are the people that more suffer in our society with the impacts of this crisis. And a word to women and girls are particularly affected. Climate change ex exacerbates existing vulnerabilities and can increase the risks of poverty, food insecurity, and gender-based violence. Climate change exposes the inequalities that exist and in all societies and severely undermines pro progress or important to express here because sustainable development is essential to put an end on that. The recent findings of the United Nations Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change shows that uh, the global of limiting global warming to 1.35 degrees or even 2 degrees Celsius will be not possible unless there are immediate reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and that irreversible damage from climate change is already occurring. My fellow parliamentarians, we must take action to minimize the most devastating impacts climate change can have. Before it is too late, this is too late. There are costs to address climate change, but the costs of inaction are greater and so we need to act. In 2015, the world came together and joined hands in, fi in fi to fight against climate change and adopted the a landmark Paris Agreement. Yet, we are very far from realizing ambition goals set out in this agreement. At the recent United Nations Climate Change Conference, we saw that in Glasgow, we met parliamentarians from around the world, met together and identified opportunities for scaling up. Our parliamentary action to address uh, climate change is important. We must act on these ideas. Addressing the climate crisis requires strong political leadership. And as a parliamentarians, we have a range of tools at our disposal to bring about real change for a more sustainable planet. We can, uh, we can use our legislative and budgetary, budgetary powers to put strong climate laws in place and make ample funding available to support climate action. We can hold our governments accountable and ensure that they are meeting national and international commitments on climate change, including those made through the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Through our representation function, we must work to protect marginalized and unrepresented groups who are the most impacted by the climate change. Furthermore, parliaments can also work, can also work to reduce our own emissions at the institutional level and become greener to further encourage sustainability. 
climate change is leading to new crises. As the impact of a warming climate worsen, people are forced to uproot their lives and migrate. Climate-related displacement and migration are on the rise in many parts of the world because people simply do not have the option to stay home. And the longer they need to live in 2020, there were one estimation that points at 7 million people were internally displaced by due disasters. And we can only expect that number to rise on climate change is worse and worse. So, actions to address climate change must be informed by science. They must also be developed through uh, gender responses, responsive and social inclusive laws. We truly cannot leave anyone behind as we take the climate crisis. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, the climate crisis is here. We cannot keep waiting. Our youth are waiting for us, are counting on us. The actions we take today as parliamentarians will determine the future of future of the future generations and how they will be able to live on a healthy planet or not. We have a major responsibility that we cannot ignore. Climate change does not recognize borders. Strong interparliamentary cooperation on climate change is essential. The only way to build a more sustainable world is through recognizing our shared challenge and fostering constructive, open dialogues on climate crisis. The IPU is strongly committed to advancing parliamentary action on climate change and fostering solidarity. We must work together. We must unite together in this global fight against climate change. For the well-being of the people and the environment and ensure future generations have the right to have what he had before, a healthy planet, as we did when we were children. I look forward, dear colleagues, to the fruitful dialogues that will take place during the general debate. And I hope that our discussions will guide us to the sustainability of our behaviors. But please, always thinking that uh, discussions are important, reflections are important, but what, what we need now is actions. And so we, I wait that after the work here in Nusadua, we came back and we will work harder to fight climate change in our world. Thank you so much. Terima kasih kami sampaikan kepada Presiden IPU. Selanjutnya kita akan beranjak ke sesi pembicara kunci. Sesi pertama ini dimulai dengan pesan video dari Bapak Ban Ki-moon, mantan Sekretaris Jenderal Persekretan Bangsa-Bangsa dan pendiri Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizen. Selama bertahun-tahun, Bapak Ban Ki-moon senantiasa mendorong tindakan nyata di semua tingkatan untuk menanggulangi perubahan iklim. 
belum lama ini beliau bergabung dengan upaya global untuk mendukung negara-negara yang paling terdampak oleh perubahan iklim. Selanjutnya, video singkat dari Sekretaris Jenderal Perserikatan Bangsa-Bangsa nanti akan ditayangkan. Sekarang tolong video dari... Excellencies, Honorable President and Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, IPU, Honorable Speaker of the Host of Parliament, Honorable heads of delegations and distinguished colleagues, I'm delighted to share this message with the global parliamentary community at the opening of the general debate at the 144th IPU Assembly. Our meeting is being held amidst trying times as the world continues its dual struggles in tackling a planetary emergency while combating COVID-19 pandemic. It is a global crisis which has put us all behind track in terms of achieving SDG targets, especially those focused on addressing climate change. As the apex legislative body of a nation, parliaments play a cardinal role in mobilizing crucial climate actions through its cross-cutting interventions uh, driven by legislative, executive, budgetary, oversight and representation functions, parliaments can not only exhibit collective uh, via international diplomacy, but also drive localized grassroots level implementation. The IPU, as the Global Organization for National Parliaments has identified climate change as a global intergenerational crisis, represents the strongest political commitments to deliver solutions needed to tackle the climate emergency. COP26 cemented the global pledge to keep 1.5 degrees Celsius alive as ratified a few years ago by the Paris Climate Change Agreement. But aggregately, the pledges will not reduce emissions fast enough to keep the world within the crucial limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius, unless we initiate urgent conversation on how to motivate a strengthened legislative response to the climate crisis. This must be done through developing high impact and innovative adaptation and mitigation solutions. Together with the CVF, we have to work collectively with the European Union, LDCs and AOCs uh, who are already working to deliver on the Paris with updated NDCs, nationally determined contributions. The Global Center on Adaptation, which I chair, is a global solutions broker for accelerating global adaptation action. The GCA, under the leadership of Dr. Fairkoyen as its CEO, is currently supporting the Climate Vulnerable Forum and will continue to promote ambitious climate action taken by the forum. With the CVF's duly formed global parliamentary group, there will be opportunities to meet parliament dignitaries from around the world and hold productive discussions or ways to mobilize climate action. I look forward to witnessing ambitious commitments driving unified global action and extend my best wishes to the platform. Thank you. Selanjutnya, 
kita akan lihat bersama video singkat dari Sekretaris Jenderal Persikatan Bangsa-Bangsa, Bapak Antonio Guterres. Video ini direkam pada konferensi pers peluncuran laporan terbaru The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change atau IPCC sebagai badan keilmuan PBB untuk perubahan iklim. Bapak Antonio Guterres merupakan pendukung aksi-aksi iklim. Dalam video ini akan disampaikan berbagai temuan utama laporan IPCC yang menyoroti betapa seriusnya krisis iklim di tingkat global. Dear representatives of the media, I've seen many scientific reports in my time, but nothing like this. Today's IPCC report is an atlas of human suffering and a damning indictment of failed climate leadership. With fact upon fact, this report reveals how people on the planet are getting clobbered by climate change. Nearly half of humanity is living in the danger zone now. Many ecosystems are at the point of no return now, and checked carbon pollution is forcing the world's most vulnerable on a frog march to destruction now. The facts are undeniable. This abdication of leadership is criminal. The world's biggest polluters are guilty of arson on our only home. It is essentially to meet the goal of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And science tells us that will require the world to cut emissions by 45% by 2030 and achieve net zero emissions of greenhouse gases by 2050. But according to current commitments, global emissions are set to increase almost 14% over the current decade. That spells catastrophe. It will destroy any chance of keeping 1.5 alive. Today's report underscores two core truths. First, coal and other fossil fuels are choking humanity. All G20 governments have agreed to stop funding coal abroad. They must now urgently do the same at home and dismantle their coal fleets. Those in the private sector still financing coal must be held to account. Oil and gas giants and their underwriters are also on notice. You cannot claim to be green while your plans and projects undermine the 2050 net zero target and ignore the major emission cuts that must occur this decade. People see through the smoke screen. OECD countries must phase out coal by 2030 and all others by 2040. The present global energy mix is broken. As current events make all too clear, our continued reliance on fossil fuels makes the global economy and energy security vulnerable to geopolitical shocks and crises. Instead of slowing down the decarbonization of the global economy, now is the time to accelerate the energy transition to a renewable energy future. Fossil fuels are a dead end for our planet, for humanity, and yes, for economies. A prompt, well-managed transition to renewables is the only pathway to energy security, universal access, and the green jobs our world needs. I'm calling for developed countries, multilateral development banks, private financiers, and others to form coalitions to help measure emerging economies and the use of coal. These targeted mechanisms of support would be over and above existing sustainable development needs. The second core finding from this report is slightly better news. Investments in adaptation work. Adaptation saves lives. As climate impacts worsen, and they will, Scaling up investments will be essential for survival. Adaptation and mitigation must be pursued with equal force and urgency. That is why I've been pushing to get the 50% of all climate finance for adaptation. The Glasgow commitment on adaptation funding is not enough to meet the challenges faced by nations on the front lines of the climate crisis. I'm also pressing to remove the obstacles that prevent small island states and least developed countries from getting the finance they desperately need to save lives and livelihoods. We need new eligibility systems to deal with this new reality. 
Delay means death. I take inspiration from all those on the front lines of the climate battle fighting back with solutions. All development banks, multilateral, regional, national, know what needs to be done. Work with governments to design pipelines of bankable adaptation projects and help them find the funding, public and private. And every country must honor the Glasgow Pledge to strengthen national climate plans every year until they are aligned with 1.5 degrees Celsius. The G20 must lead the way or humanity will pay an even more tragic price. I know people everywhere are anxious and angry. I am too. Now is the time to turn rage into action. Every fraction of the degree matters. Every voice can make a difference and every second counts. Thank you. Selanjutnya, untuk lebih memahami skala kedaur, kedadu, kedaruratan iklim di tingkat negara, izinkan saya untuk mengajak seluruh delegasi untuk menyimak video singkat dari konferensi perubahan iklim COP26 yang telah berlangsung di Glasgow tahun 2021. Video ini menampilkan Bapak Samuelu Penita Lateo, Ketua Parlemen Tuvalu. Tuvalu merupakan salah satu negara pulau dan berkembang di kawasan Pasifik yang mengalami secara langsung efek yang sangat merugikan dari perubahan iklim. Tuvalu is a very small country. Even on the main capital island where I live, we have about half of the population of Tuvalu, five. 6,000 people living on it. The islands are just like in the Maldives. They are only a couple of feet above sea level. So for sure, with the sea level rise coming into place, we are already affected. Like what my Prime Minister said in the COP, that we need action. Because the sea level rise is happening right at our doorstep. So there is a big change in the weather patterns of Tuvalu. And uh, the sea level rise is affecting our crops. We have uh, a kind of a potato which we call a pulaka, which is a giant uh, taro. This is the stable diet of my people. Now it is very hard to grow this, uh, this uh, giant uh, taro because the salt is entering into the, into the water lenses. So it's very hard to plant. Now people are beginning to plant on top of the soil. You cannot plant in the soil because the water there is full of salt because of the sea level rise. My 10-year-old grandson asked me, hey, when, when you go to that meeting in, in Scotland, are we going to be able to live in Tuvalu after you come back? I said, the answer depends on those big, rich nations who pollute the world with the coal that they burn and all that. And here we are in the Pacific Islands. We haven't contributed anything at all, hardly to the cause of these big changes in the climate change of the world. And we are paying the price of it. And I think one day we will be forced to migrate. There's a lot of issues, you know, that come together with this uh, climate change thing. And we have this uh, issue of the loss in population from Tuvalu. People, they want to migrate because they see no, 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 no future in Tuvalu. The dilemma is that they know that the country is going to be underwater one day. And the only way to save Tuvalu right now is no more talk, but just to build it up. Adapt by building up Tuvalu by another one or two meters up, and we need the funding.
to build Tuvalu up in order to save Tuvalu. And I think if we save Tuvalu, we will save Bangladesh, we will save a lot of countries, we will save the world. Thank you. Selanjutnya, untuk mendengar aspirasi generasi muda, saya ingin memperkenalkan seorang perempuan muda dari Pulau Bali, Melasti Wisan. Melati adalah pemimpin gerakan Utopia yang bertujuan memberdayakan anak-anak muda agar menjadi agen perubahan. Melati juga seorang penggagas dari Bye Bye Plastic Bags, sebuah organisasi yang menghimpun pemuda dari seluruh dunia yang berjuang menghentikan pemakaian kantong plastik. Melati, kami hadirkan untuk mengingatkan tanggung jawab kita terhadap generasi muda dan generasi-generasi mendatang bahwa tugas kita adalah meninggalkan bumi yang lebih hijau, lebih sehat dibandingkan dengan yang kita warisi dari para pendahulu. Melati, kami persilahkan. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask for your full attention for the next five minutes. Talking about time, we have seven years, 123 days, 22 hours and 45 minutes to take action to reverse the climate crisis. As we heard the latest IPCC report, confirms that climate change is real. It is already happening. As Antonio Guterres says, it is happening now. And in fact, not a single place on Earth is not already affected by the climate crisis. But the good news is, we still have seven years, 123 days, 22 hours, and 45 minutes to take action. Young people, know this. We are not waiting until we are older to start taking action. Young people from all corners of the world, from the representatives and the countries that we have here, young people in India, young people in Japan, in Malawi, in Ecuador, in Indonesia, young people know this and we are taking action. Now for a minute, I know it might be difficult dressed up inside a conference room, but take a moment to think back to when you were 12 years old. Do you remember when you were 12 years old? When I was 12, together with my 10-year-old sister, growing up here on the beautiful island of Bali, we decided to take action against plastic pollution. We had a clear vision to make our island of Bali plastic bag free. Almost a decade later, and here we are. Today, I'm 21 years old, and I have learned a lot. From 12 to 21, from a young, inspirational, oh, so cute 12-year-old, to what I hope to be today, a confident young entrepreneur and role model for all of the up-and-coming, rising young people. Indonesia, talking about the, the country that we are in, has a population where nearly 30% is Gen Z. Now, to give you an idea, that's nearly 80 million of us below the age of 30 years old. What are we focusing on? What are we taking action on? What are we passionate about? Well, here are some examples. We heard previously that we need to take action. No more talking. What are some of those tangible actions that young people are doing? Well, we are working towards protecting 30% of the biodiversity by 2030. We are working to bring indigenous communities and indigenous voices into these conference rooms. We're focusing on trying to get more MPAs everywhere around the world, marine protected areas. We want to stop deforestation. 
We demand that no more new fossil fuel plants are being installed, and we are focusing on accelerating the solutions needed to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which mean we leave nobody behind. I mean, really, we know all of this. I believe that I am preaching to the crowd, preaching to the choir at the moment. All of us know this. We do not need more conferences, more speeches, more time, more research. The climate crisis is here and it's happening. I know it may be difficult to think about it while we're seated here inside with the air conditioning on, electricity on, but there is floods, there are forest fires, there is ice falling from the sky in places it should not. Climate change is here and it is happening now. It is already a reality for all of us. It means losing our homes. It means becoming climate refugees. It means more diseases, more pandemics if we do not take action now. Now going back to the youth and to the young people, Today I'm 21, and believe it or not, most of the times and in the conferences I attend, I am now the older one. There are more young people getting involved at the front lines at a younger and younger age. It almost feels like every 10-year-old, 12-year-old that I speak to today has an idea, has a vision for a better world, and are leading by example. Young people are more than an inspiration only. We are here for more than just a photo opportunity or a standing ovation. We are serious about change. So my challenge to all of the countries here, invite young people to the tables of decision making. Ask what the solutions they have in mind. Ask them to get involved from the beginning all the way through to the end. Us kids may only be 25% of the world's population, but we are 100% of the future. Remember, we have seven years, 123 days, 22 hours, and by now, 40 minutes to take action to reverse the climate, action, the climate crisis. We are ready. Are you? Thank you. Sebagaimana diketahui, sidang IPU memiliki tradisi gender inklusif dengan memastikan partisipasi anggota parlemen perempuan dan laki-laki. Namun, saya sangat menyayangkan ketidakhadiran Ibu Lesia Fasilenko, Presiden dari Bureau of Women Parliamentarian yang tidak dapat menghadiri sidang ini karena situasi krisis di Ukraina. Saya ingin menyampaikan solidaritas kita semua kepada rakyat Ukraina dan menyerukan penyelesaian damai terhadap konflik yang sedang terjadi. Semoga pertumpahan darah dan kerusakan yang lebih lanjut dapat diberhentikan. Selanjutnya, untuk mewakili Bureau of Women Parliamentarian, saya mengundang Ibu Ramzi Fayez dari Bahrain ke podium. Ibu Ramzi Fayez dipersilahkan. Honorable Madam Speaker, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Madam Pre uh, President of the Forum of Young, uh, Young Parliamentarians, distinguished guests, dear colleagues. I am honored to address the, the Assembly today as the first Vice President of the B IPU Bureau of Women Parliamentarians. I am proud to join this opening of the gen general debate to replace the president of the forum, Ms. Lesia Vas Vasilinki of Ukraine, as she defends her country and her people. Today's theme of the general debate on mobilizing parliaments to act on climate change is one that is of great value to women and girls everywhere. Climate change is one of the greatest threats to our societies. Due to human em emissions of greenhouse gases, we are on a warming 
the tragedy that is changing how we live. The foundations of our societies, including food, security, health, economy, and infrastructure, will be in jeopardy. Furthermore, the most immediate impact will be on already vulnerable and marginalized populations. With this in mind, let me turn to concrete solutions. First, we must enact pro proactive measures to increase women's political participation in we, if we are to, ad to advance in climate action. Indeed, we know that there is a strong positive cor correlation between the percentage of seats occupied by women in national parliaments and the prioritization of climate change policy associated with lower CO2 emissions. Research indicates that greater representation of women in national parliaments lead countries to adopt more effective climate change policies. However, there is a disproportionate lack of representation of women in national and global policy spaces. IPU data shows that as of January 2022, only 26.1% of parliamentarians around the world were women. While that figure represents a historic high, it is still far from gender parity. At the current rate, it will still take us 40 years to achieve it. Second, we must advance on gender responsive climate legislation and policy reform. Climate related policies and other social policies, including for gender equality, complement one another. The, the two goals work together and no climate agenda can succeed without going hand in hand with the gender equality agenda. Third, we need green and gender responsive institutions. This change must start from our parliaments. New initiatives to make parliaments more environmentally friendly institutions are slowly taking root in different parts of the world. Many parliaments are going green by reducing their environmental footprint, lowering their greenhouse gas emissions, and improving the overall sustainability of their activities. These must go together with our efforts toward gender-sensitive parliaments as well. In moving towards an inclusive green economy, parliaments must take into account gender and other socially differentiated needs. Colleagues, we must increase our actions, not just for our family future, but for future of our children. We know that we are stronger when we work together as members of parliaments across regions. May our, our deliberations today bring us closer to our goals in climate response and gender equality. Thank you for your attention and I wish you, us all few, very fruitful deliberations. Thank you. Kembali lagi pada tradisi, IPU juga memastikan partisipasi anggota parlemen muda. Oleh karena itu, saya mengundang Presiden Forum of Young Parliamentarians, Sahar Al-Bazar dari Mesir, untuk menyampaikan pidato pengantar dari debat umum ini. Kepada Sahar Al-Bazar, dipersilahkan. Honorable Madam Speaker, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Madam Vice President of Bureau of Women, distinguished guests, dear colleagues. I am very pleased to address you as the president of the Forum of Young MPs. I am also speaking on behalf of the youth and future generations. At the IPU assemblies, we always debate important issues. However, in the minds of young people, climate change is one key issue that defines our time. The next 10 years will determine our world for centuries. The degradation of our environment happened before us youth being born. 
Yet it is us who will have to suffer the effects, and it is us who will work on repairing the damage. Therefore, we simply have to have a say in the climate action. Exclusion is not, it's not only unjust, but it's also not wise, because it will be waste of talents and fresh ideas of the most educated generation in the history. Young people all over are watching how politicians are tackling the climate emergency. And very often, they are not satisfied. We can see it in Greta Thurden in, of, of our today. We see it in the movement of Fridays of Future. We see it in millions marching, demanding for actions. Their voices and their solutions need to have a place in our parliaments. This is where young MPs come in. As young people, we are ideally placed in parliaments to bridge the views of youth into parliaments. However, with less than 3% of young MPs under 30, we and the voices we represent are greatly underrepresented. So what can we do? Yes, we must urgently prioritize action to implement Paris Agreement, and to get there, we need more youth participation. We need more young MPs in the parliament. We need to include youth civil society in parliamentary youth processes. And we need MPs from all ages to listen to the youth and speak on their behalf. There is only one way easy enough to do right now is to sign up for the campaign I Say Yes to Youth in Parliament. You can sign up in our booth and you can sign up online. Finally, I am pleased to say that my home country, Egypt, is prioritizing youth inclusion in the lead up process to COP27 conference in Sharm el Sheikh. The first event will be in May, which is the IPU Global Conference of Young MPs, which will be dedicated to climate action. I hope you all send your delegations of young MPs. In September, Egypt will host with UNFCCC Conference of Youth. Both events will feed the youth perspective to the climate change in COP27 in COP conference in November. This is a great example of youth inclusion in important political processes. Ladies and gentlemen, in this defining, in this defining moment, we cannot exclude anyone from solving the climate crisis especially youth. Let's, let's work together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Saya sampaikan terima kasih kepada semua delegasi yang telah menyampaikan eh, pidato pengantar general debat dan sebelum special guest diarahkan untuk meninggalkan podium kami persilahkan kepada seluruh eh, special guest untuk bisa berfoto bersama di atas podium tolong eh, kamera untuk maju ke depan. We will take a picture first before the special guest leave the podium.
kita akan lanjutkan sebagaimana diketahui item 2 agenda assembly ini adalah consideration of request for the inclusion of an emergency item in the assembly agenda saya ingin mengingatkan kepada semua delegasi bahwa batas waktu untuk mengajukan emergency item adalah pukul 17 uh, Wita hari ini izinkan saya untuk selanjutnya menyampaikan beberapa hal terkait tata tertib persidangan atau tata tertib sidang. Pertama-tama, sesuai tradisi, urutan pembicara pada general debate akan dimulai dengan segmen untuk ketua parlemen. Kami merasa sangat terhormat menyaksikan kehadiran dari begitu banyak delegasi dari seluruh dunia pada IPU Assembly ini. Saya ingin menyampaikan bahwa tata tertib telah diikuti dan bahwa urutan pembicara baik untuk pemimpin parlemen maupun pembicara kedua dan selanjutnya telah ditentukan dengan cara diundi. Daftar urutan pembicara telah didistribusikan untuk semua delegasi di ruang sidang ini. Kedua, melihat tingginya kehadiran delegasi pada sidang ini, maka steering komite pagi ini telah memutuskan untuk memberikan waktu berbicara sepanjang total 6 menit untuk setiap delegasi parlemen dan 7 menit untuk delegasi yang dipimpin oleh ketua parlemen. Anggota parlemen muda yang telah mendaftarkan diri untuk mengikuti debat umum akan diberikan tambahan waktu 2 menit. Permanent observer akan diberikan waktu berbicara maksimal tiga menit. Saya meminta kepada semua delegasi untuk memperhatikan alokasi waktu ini saat menyampaikan pidatonya. Terkait dengan protokol kesehatan COVID-19, demi kesehatan kita semua, masker wajib dikenakan setiap saat ketika delegasi sedang berada di tempat duduknya. Saya juga ingin menyampaikan, mengingat masih ada delegasi yang belum mendaftar untuk berbicara, maka pendaftaran pembicara masih dibuka hingga besok selasa 22 Maret tepat pada pukul 12 siang. Saya juga ingin mengingatkan para delegasi bahwa delegasi berhak mengusulkan salah satu anggotanya selaku Vice President of the Assembly. Saya mengundang semua delegasi yang belum memberikan usulan untuk menyampaikan nama kandidat mereka kepada Sekretariat IPU. Merupakan suatu kehormatan bagi saya untuk memimpin sidang ini bersama-sama dengan para Vice Presidents selama berlangsungnya sesi General Debate beberapa hari ke depan. Terakhir, kepada delegasi yang terhormat, saya ingin menyampaikan bahwa dalam rangka mendukung kegiatan sidang, di kedua sisi panggung terhadap terdapat dua petugas yang akan dengan senang hati membantu menyampaikan pesan-pesan Anda kepada saya atau kepada sekretariat. Di hadapan Anda telah tersedia daftar urutan nama-nama yang sejauh ini telah mendaftar untuk menyampaikan pidato di General Debate. Akhir kata, saya ingin meminta sekali lagi kepada semua delegasi untuk memperhatikan waktu berbicara yang dialokasikan. Hal ini agar semua delegasi yang sudah mendaftar mendapatkan kesempatan dan kita bisa menyelesaikan gender, general debate sesuai dengan jadwal yang sudah ditetapkan. This is the first one. Okay. Selaku pembicara pertama adalah PH Kaca Vivi, delegasi from Namibia. Selanjutnya diikuti oleh BS Park Republic of Korea dan selanjutnya adalah Ertal BL Alami 
delegasi from Maroko. Waktu dan tempat kami persilahkan. Wait, wait. The microphone is off. Please, technician. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. You can start. <clears throat> Madam President, President of IPU, Secretary General of IPU, fellow parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, okay, so. allow me on behalf of, of the Namibian Parliament to thank the government and the Parliament of Indonesia for the warm welcome extended to our dedication. Today, the 21st of March, is our Independence Day. We celebrate 32 years since the attainment of our freedom and independence. <clears throat> Madam President, the theme of this assembly is uh, topical and relevant to parliaments across the world. I would like to take this opportunity to share the experience of Namibia on this very important topic, as well as the efforts to address climate change that are being driven by the government and the two houses of the Namibian parliaments both of which are represented at this auspicious occasion. Furthermore, Madam President, we have committed ourselves as Parliament to the inclusivity of the youth and children's voices in these endeavors. Therefore, I have the pleasure to inform you that today, as part of our de delegation, we have two members of the Namibian Children's Parliament. Namibia is a hot and dry land, and the fact that we have a small population spread across the vast area of our land shows the challenges of human settlement in our country. Namibia does not contribute significant amounts of greenhouse gases to global emissions. However, our population is negatively impacted by the omissions of other countries. We have already started the experience of the impact of climate change. With a long period of drought that lasted five to seven years in most regions of our country, and increased flooding in some areas of, the, of our country this year, as the drought ended. At the current rate of climate change, it is estimated that the human annual temperatures in Namibia will increase further by 2.7 degrees Celsius in the next two decades, and that annual rainfall is likely to decrease. The impact of climate change in Namibia is mostly felt in the agricultural sector. Namibia exports beef to Europe, Asia, and later to the United States of America. Livestock production is a major income generator in the agriculture sector. However, it is threatened by climate change, and in the most recent drought, reduced livestock number considerably. The majority of Namibians rely heavily on the rain-fed agriculture and livestock production and are rare, thus extremely vulnerable to climate change. It negatively impacts food security and affects the most vulnerable population of our country, especially women and children. In Namibia, especially in our rural communities, women play a very vital role in securing food and income through food harvesting activities. Madam President, I would like to emphasize the need 
for countries to work in partnership with each other towards developing strategies that reduce vulnerability to climate change and improve adaptive capacities. Our policies need to ensure the participation of women and children and other vulnerable groups and offer training and appropriate local knowledge for adaptation. Namibia has developed a national climate policy which is a legal framework meant to address climate change, vulnerable population, and Namibia's adaptive capacity. This policy is regularly reviewed in terms of its implementation, monitoring, and evaluation of climate change uh, mitigation strategies. Madam President, the Namibian President, His Excellency Dr. Hage Kainkop, recently introduced the Green Hydrogen Initiative, being undertaken in partnership with other countries. This initiative is aimed to transform our economy and tap into abundant resources that have a great potential for producing renewable energy. It is also reiterates our commitment to tackling the impact of climate change. The Namibian Parliament reassures you of its commitment to give this subject the necessary attention to address the negative effects of climate change and its devastating impacts. That said and done, thank you very much for your attention. Tarima Kasi, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mr. B.S. Park from Republic of Korea, you have the floor. Followed by Mr. Ertal B. L. Alami from Morocco. Thank you. 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 함께하는 자리를 마련해 주신 IPU와 인도네시아의 푸안 의장님께 감사의 말씀드립니다. 지상 낙원이라고 불리는 이곳 발리는 지구가 얼마나 아름다운 행성인지를 새삼 일깨워줍니다. 그런 지구가 신음하고 있습니다. 동토이 시베리아의 폭염이 다치고 열사이 사막에 눈보라가 몰아칩니다. 폭우와 폭설 폭소와 혹한이 때와 당소를 가리지 않고 세계를 위협하고 있습니다. 한국은 최근 발생한 산불, 산불로 산림 지역이 큰 피해를 입었습니다. 다행히 세계는 2015년 파리 협정을 맺어 소중한 행성 지구기를 지키기로 다짐했습니다. 2022년 현재 138개 국가가 탄소 중립을 선언하였습니다. 문제는 실천입니다. 오늘 행동하지 않으면 내일의 지구는 없습니다. 존경하는 대표단 여러분, 우리 의회가 지구촌 탄소 배출 제로 운동에 앞장서야 합니다. 각국 의회 대표단에 몇 가지 제안을 드리며 아울러 대한민국 국회의 탄소 배출 감축 노력도 함께 소개하도록 하겠습니다. 첫째, 실행의 선도자가 됩시다. 기후위기는 지구의 내일이 아닌 오늘을 위협하고 있습니다. 정부와 의회가 온실가스 감축 목표를 설정하고 이행하는 일을 의지를 갖고 실천합시다. 2020년 대한민국 국회는 단수 배출 제로 달성을 위한 전 세계적 노력에 동참하기 위해 기후위기 비상대응 촉구 결의안을 의결하였습니다. 지난해 대한민국 회는 탄소중립 비전과 이행체계를 법제화한 기후위기 대응을 위한 탄소중립 녹색성장 기본법을 제정하였습니다. 이를 바탕으로 대한민국 정부는 같은 해 11월 제26차 
유엔기후변화협약 당사국 총회에서 국가 온실 감수 감축 목표를 상향 조정하였습니다. 2030년까지 2018년 대비 40% 감축하는 목표를 세웠는데 이는 종전 목표보다 약 14%포인트가 상향된 수치입니다. 대한민국 국회 스스로도 2030년까지 친환경 국회를 만들 계획입니다. 디지털화를 가속해 종이 없는 국회를 만들 것입니다. 청산의 공용 차량을 친환경 차량으로 바꾸고 있습니다. 친환경 고효율 제품 사용을 확대하고 있는 것입니다. 둘째, 정의로운 전환의 수호자가 됩시다. 기후위기는 약자를 먼저 공격합니다. 의회가 나서서 탄소중립 사회로의 전환 과정에서 취약계층이 희생되지 않도록 수호하는 역할을 하십시다. 대한민국회는 친환경 녹색경제로의 이행 과정에서 발생하는 부담을 사회적으로 함께 나누는 정의로운 전환을 기후위기 대응의 기본 원칙으로 설정하였습니다. 대한민국회는 정부로 하여금 취약계층에 대한 사회적 안전망을 마련하고 취약지역을 특별지구로 지정해 지원하고 있습니다. 탄소중립 사회로의 이행 과정에서 발생하는 경제적, 환경적, 사회적 불평등을 회소하기 위해 노력하고 있는 것입니다. 셋째, 녹색산업의 촉진자가 됩시다. 탈탄소 경제로 이동은 신기술과 신산업을 필수로 합니다. 친환경 녹색산업의 전환한 기업들이 신기술과 신산업을 통해 새로운 도약을 할수 있도록 의회가 촉진자 역할을 해야 합니다. 대한민국회는 정부와의 협력 아래 기업이 친환경 저탄소 시스템을 도입하는 과정에서 첨단 산업으로 진출할 수 있는 그린 뉴딜 정책의 기반을 마련하였습니다. 대한민국회는 에너지 전환과 녹색 산업 육성 등 그린 뉴딜 정책을 지원하기 위한 법과 제도를 정비 중에 있습니다. 기후 위기 대응 기금을 설치하여 탄소 중립 사회로의 이행과 녹색 성장 촉진을 위해 필요한 재원을 확보하고 있습니다. 존경하는 각국 의회 대표단 여러분, 경제가 어렵거나 정치와 안보가 불안정하면 환경은 뒷전으로 밀릴 수 있습니다. 그러나 기후 위기를 해결하지 못하면 경제는 물론 정치와 안보도 안정을 끼울 수 없습니다. 네, 우리가 정의로운 전환 그리고 의회가 정부와 함께 앞장서서 이제 더 이상 뒤로 말, 미루지 말고 당장 실천해야 합니다. 지금 바로 이 자리에서 실천을 다짐하십시다. 감, 감사합니다. 미스터 에르탈비 엘 알라미 from Morocco, you have the floor. Followed by GFN Mudenda from Zimbabwe. سيد سيد الرئيس الزميلات والزملاء السيدات والسادة يشرفني أن أتدخل باسم برلمان المملكة المغربية في هذه الدورة التي أحسن اتحادنا باختيار موضوع تعبئة البرلمانات من أجل مواجهة التغيرات المناخية ليكون محورها الأساس إدراكا منه للمخاطر المحدقة بالبشرية ومستقبل الأرض وللمسؤولية الملقاة على عاتق البرلمانات في درء هذه المخاطر 
وقلب المعادلات السلبية المسجلة في مجال الاختلالات المناخية وأود باسم الشعبة المغربية في الاتحاد أن أتوجه بالشكر وبالتهنئة لبرلمان الشقيقة أندونيسيا وسلطاتها على ما أحاطوا به هذه الدورة من عناية وما وفروه لها من أسباب النجاح ويسرني أن أجدد التأكيد على التزام المملكة المغربية بقيادة صاحب الجلالة الملك محمد السادس أعزه الله من أجل البيئة وتنفيذ التزاماتها في إطار مؤتمر الأطراف في اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة للتغيرات المناخية مما جعل بلادي موضوع ثقة المجتمع الدولي بانتخابها في مطلع مارس الجاري في نيروبي رئيسا للدورة السادسة لجمعية الأمم المتحدة للبيئة لولاية مدتها سنتان بعد أن احتضنت مراكش في نوفمبر 2016 الدورة الثانية والعشرين لقمة مؤتمر الأطراف في اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة التي توجت بتدابير عملية لفائدة كوكبنا وكانت بامتياز قمة إطلاق فكرتك ومبادرات العدالة المناخية لإفريقيا وقد كانت المملكة المغربية سباقة واستباقية في إعمال التدابير الضرورية لحماية البيئة وخفض نسبة الانبعاثات المسببة لارتفاع حرارة الأرض إذ إن البيئة تشكل سياسة عامة يؤطرها الدستور وتنفذ في إطار سياسات عمومية متعددة وتشكل مكونا التقائيا في مختلف السياسات الأخرى وإذ إن الوقت لا يسمح باستعراض مجمل هذه السياسات فإنه لا بد من التذكير ببعض عناوينها وعلاماتها البارزة ومنها أولاً سياسة المملكة الطموحة في مجال إنتاج الطاقة من مصادر متجددة الشمسية والريحية والبحرية والمائية ثانياً السياسة الفلاحية التي تساهم في الحفاظ على البيئة وتوفير الغداء للمغاربة وتمون العديد من الأسواق العالمية ثالثاً التحكم في أنشطة الصيد البحري وإخضاعها لرقابة صارمة والحفاظ على وثيرة تجدد الثروات السمكية رابعاً نهج السياسة المائية طموحة متأصلة في مجال تعبئة المياه العذبة وحسن استعمالها في النشاط الفلاحي والصناعي خامساً حظر صناعة البلاستيك غير قابل للتحلل والضار بالبيئة وتعويضها بصناعات صديقة للبيئة وإيكولوجية سادساً إلزام الجميع إلزام الجميع بأخذ البعد البيئي بعين الاعتبار في كل المشاريع الاستثمارية وعدم الترخيص لأي مشروع ما لم تكن وثائقه مرفقة بدراسة حول أثره على البيئة وتثبت احترامه للمعايير الإيكولوجية سابعاً تسريع إنشاء محطات إنتاج الطاقة من مصادر متجددة وخاصة أن الشمسية حيث تعتبر محطة ورزازات نور من أكبر المحطات العالمية القليلة في العالم لإنتاج الطاقة النظيفة وتعميم هذا النموذج على مختلف جهات المملكة بما في ذلك مدن الأقانيم الجنوبية نور العيون ونور بجدور والدخلة التي ستعرف ميلاد مشروع ضخم لإنتاج الطاقة الريحية كلفته حوالي ثلاثة ملايير دولار والذي سيعتمد آخر التكنولوجيات الحديثة علما بأن 28 مدينة مغربية من طنجة إلى الجويرة بها اليوم مشاريع منتجة للطاقة من مصادر متجددة وبهذه المشاريع وغيرها المبرمجة ومع تحرير قطاع إنتاج الطاقة وفتح المجال أمام الإنتاج الذاتي فإن بلادي اليوم من البلدان الرائدة في العالم في إنتاج الطاقة النظيفة وفي إطار عقيدة سياستها الخارجية المبنية على التضامن تحرص المملكة على تقاسم خبراتها وسياساتها مع باقي البلدان الإفريقية الشقيقة من خلال مشاريع رائدة من قبيل مبادرة ملاءمة الفلاحة الإفريقية المعروفة بإنشيتيف تري ايز التي تم إطلاقها من طرف صاحب الجلالة الملك محمد السادس خلال قمة المناخ بمراكش سنة 2016 برهان خفض هشاشة إفريقيا وفلاحتها إزاء الاختلالات المناخية والنهوض بمشاريع فلاحية في عدد 
من بلدان القارة وبالتالي المساهمة في درء الفقر وعلاقة بمعاناة إفريقيا جراء الاختلالات المناخية وهي التي لا تتسبب سوى في انبعاث أربعة في المئة من الغازات المسببة للاحتباس الحراري نجدد نداءنا لإقامة شراكات منتجة من أجل التصدي لمخاطر الاختلالات المناخية على مواطنات ومواطني إفريقيا شراكات تخرج عن الفهم التقليدي الضيق للدعم أو التعاون من أجل التنمية مدامة القارة تتوفر على إمكانيات هائلة بشرية وطبيعية لإنتاج الطروات من ستين في المئة من الأراضي القابلة للزراعة في العالم توجد في إفريقيا سيدات سيدة الرئيسة الزميلات والزملاء نتساءل كمشرعين عما الذي يعرقل تنفيذ الاتفاقيات المبرمة في مجال الحماية البيئة وتتعدد الأجوبة عن هذا السؤال إلا أن الجوهري من هذه العراقل يكمن في ضعف التزام الحكومات والهيئات المانحة بما يتفق عليه وضعف التمويلات المتعهد بها لتمويل السياسات وتدابير بديلة لتلك المسببة لانبعاثات الغازات الدفيئة وضعف انخراط الدول المانحة من أجل الاقتصاد الأخضر والمستدام وضعف تقاسم التكنولوجيات النظيفة وارتفاع أسعارها وما التخلف عن الوفاء بالالتزامات إزاء الصندوق الأخضر من أجل المناخ المفروض تموينه بمئة مليار دولار سنويا سوى أحد علامات ضعف هذه الالتزامات وما من شك في أن جائحة كوفيد-19 كانت امتحانا عالميا سأل مفهوم التضامن الدولي وإذا كانت فترة الجائحة غنية بالدروس التي ينبغي أن نوظفها لجهة تطوير وتوظيف التكنولوجيا الإعلام والاتصال والمعرفة في الاقتصاد والخدمات المستدامة فإن ذلك يحتاج دائما إلى التخلي عن الأنانيات والتحلي بروح التضامن الفعلي وتقاسم المهارات والمعارف وإذا كنا في مركب واحد نواجه المخاطر البيئية نفسها فإن بلدان الجنوب تعاني أكثر من غيرها من انعكاسات الاختلالات المناخية وتعتبر قارتنا الإفريقية الحلقة الأضعف في هذه المعاناة إذ يتجسد ذلك في ظواهر الجفاف والتصحر وتدهور الغطاء الغابوي والنباتي والنزوح والهجرات جراء العوامل المناخية وتعد النساء والأطفال وذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة والمزارعون الصغار الفئات الأكثر تضررا من التقلبات المناخية إنها أوضاع تسائل الإرادة السياسية الدولية وتمتحن القيم التي من المفترض أن نتقاسمها وتسائل بالأساس حس المسؤولية لدينا جميعا شكرا على حسن الإصغاء Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. GFN Mudenda from Zimbabwe, and then uh, followed uh, Miss Gotani from Malawi. Is this as a family? Madam President of the Assembly and our gracious Speaker of the Parliament of Indonesia, our Secretary General, dear colleagues, it is instructive that the phenomenon of climate change has intensified globally progressing at a much faster rate than initially projected by scientists. Climate-induced calamities are on the increase as witnessed by unprecedented weather patterns and catastrophic droughts as well as devastating cyclones. To that end, Madam President, our responses as parliaments should be intensified by enacting appropriate legislation for mitigatory measures. Heads of state and government are aged 
to assiduously increase their national determined contributions, ambitions, and climate actions towards securing net zero emissions. In so doing, Madam President, they would keep the 1.5 degree Celsius temperature rise threshold within reach. To this end, parliaments should use their constitutional mandates to ensure that governments meet their mitigatory targets unequivocally through robust oversight on the executive. Accordingly, some of the best practices that parliaments can adopt in greenhouse gas emission reduction towards the net zero agenda include legislating towards incentivizing green infrastructure project implementation, better waste management methodologies, and circular economy. In addition, Madam President, mainstreaming of climate change related legislation in order to expedite the transition to clean and renewable energy uh, development is necessary. Madam President, parliaments must ensure that the Paris Agreement is subsequent Kotowisi roadmap and the renewed commitments at the Glasgow 26th Conference of Parties 2021 are entirely implemented by all the parties. Furthermore, it is critical that development countries should honor, sorry, developed countries should honor their 100 billion pledge um, towards mitigatory measures. To this end, oversight on all mit mitigation projects and budget allocations must be effectively implemented by parliaments. Similarly, Zimbabwe launched its uh, National Climate Fund in 2021 primarily to give climate action, direction, and sustainability. For robust oversight, it is an imperative that IPU member parliaments forge strategic partnerships, which will enhance the understanding by parliamentarians of climate change discourse uh, multilaterally. Madam President, Zimbabwe's response measures to climate change are guided by the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities, respective capabilities, and climate justice. In this respect, Zimbabwe has raised its commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from 33% to 40% per capita by 2030 in his 2021 national determined contributions as guided by the implementation of the low emission development strategy. This has been bolstered by Zimbabwe's mainstreaming of the climate change phenomenon into its national development strategy 2021 to 2025. Additionally, Zimbabwe is crafting a comprehensive climate change bill whose focus is climate financing, measurement of greenhouse gas emissions, compliance and reporting, as well as verification matrix. May I conclude, Madam President, by saluting the Indi Indonesian Parliament for the hospitable hosting of the 144th Assembly of the IPU 
and uh, related meetings on this majestic uh, Bali Island. Congratulations, I so submit, Madam President. Thank you. Next is uh, Ms. Gotani from Malawi, followed by Mr. Nadir from Guyana. And uh, Guyana is the last person before we take a break for the lunch. Please uh, be prepared, uh, Mr. Nadir from Guyana. Your Honor, the President of the 144th General Assembly of the Interparliamentary Union, who is also the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the Republic of Indonesia, Dr. Maharan, the President of the IPU, the Secretary General, my fellow speakers, members of parliament, leaders of delegation, um, international observers, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start my speech, my condolences to the parliament of Uganda for losing Speaker Jacob Olunyana. Our condolences to the people of Uganda. Ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly honored to stand before this honorable assembly which is meeting in this beautiful city, Indo Indonesia, to contribute from a Malawi's perspective to the topic, getting to zero, mobilizing parliament to act on climate change. Madam President, it is now abundantly clear for everyone to see and appreciate the fact that almost all countries on earth are facing and are having to deal with significant consequences of climate change. The challenges of climate change are felt even more in the world's poorest countries, partly because of their low adaptive capacities. Countries in sub-Saharan Africa, where Malawi belongs, are cases in point. Madam President, as a member of parliament, I stand here with total conviction that we parliamentarians hold the key when it comes to climate change issues, because we are well positioned through our legislative, representative, as well as oversight mandate to influence greatly the fight against climate change. Madam President, due to climate change, Malawi has experienced and is experiencing right now, it is reeling under the devastating effects of the various cyclones such as Cyclone Idai, Cyclone Anna, last month and a few days ago, Cyclone Gombe, have added a lot of suffering to the poor and vulnerable in Malawi. Madam President, a lot of lives have been lost, infrastructure completely destroyed, sources of income for the poor have been grossly affected. In short, the social and economic fabric which we use to enjoy as a developing country has been grossly affected as a result of climate change. Madam President, as we speak, there are fears once again that yet another cyclone is developing which may affect Malawi and pour more miseries in addition to the current challenges. Madam President, Malawi is currently at the mercy of ongoing dangerous tropical cyclones which I have mentioned. As a country, we have never experienced these terrible events before, but unfortunately, there's no end in sight to these natural disasters in the near future. And Malawi continues to suffer the consequences of some of these world's worst natural disasters occasioned by climate change. Madam President, as I said, the sad part of it is that these disasters are still continuing rendering much of our population destitute. As we debate this very important topic, I wish to put on record that much of our infrastructure has been destroyed in most parts of the country. This, Madam President, has brought more misery to our venerable citizens. Madam President, I am sure you appreciate the magnitude of the challenges which Malawi is suffering coming as it were hard on the heels of devastating COVID-19 pandemic, which has also had and continues to have a major impact on our economy. 
Madam President, the climate challenge, challenges have had a knock-on effect on our country. When we take into account the fact that Malawi is a very poor country, ranked 163 on the development index. What this means, Madam President, is that much as our government is trying all it can to deal with this and assist the suffering people, particularly women and children, Malawi does not have the enormous resource to cope up with these challenges. Madam President, as Parliament of Malawi, we have tried our best and continue to do, to, to do so to provide leadership and allocate resources within our constitutional mandate towards mitigating the suffering that has been caused by natural disasters. Through our role in considering and approving the national budget, Parliament of Malawi has been in the forefront in ensuring govern that government allocates enough resources in various ministries and government departments that deal with natural disasters to continue to lead in coming up with workable policies and actions to mitigate climate challenges, issues, and the suffering of our citizens. Madam President, one of the functions of legislatures in legislation, I believe, is to effectively deal with climate change. Each country needs effective legislation, which takes a cue from the global approach to global policies, treaties, or protocols on climate change, which parliamentarians, as parliamentarians, we need to harness and come up with legislation where need be. Even at national level, Madam President, it is imperative that a legislators, as legislatures, we ensure that existing laws are in tandem with a new dispensation that is being influenced heavily by climate change. I am glad to report here that Parliament of Malawi is currently considering various pieces of legislation aiming at improving land use, forest, and water conservations with the hope that cumulatively Malawi will significantly contribute to the global action on climate change. Madam President, on the international level, Madam, I believe that as representative of the people, we can inform the development of national negotiation positions in protocols and other international agreements on climate change. In addition, as parliamentarians, we should be able, uh, we should aim at building political and public support for effective and meaningful implementation of the international agreements and protocols that we accede to. One very crucial role for parliamentarians is on oversight for policies, budgets, and implementation of numerous programs on climate change to bear fruit. Parliaments are supposed to and should oversee what and how governments are implementing various action plans within approved legislative and budgetary framework. It is high time, Madam President, for our parliamentarians to consider allocating substantial amount of money in each budget specifically for climate change. Such a deliberate strategy would ensure that resources are available for research and policy review as well as implementation on climate change. As I come to the conclusion, Madam President, allow me, Madam, to join fellow speakers of Parliament who have taken the floor before me to thank the Executive Committee for coming up with this topic, which is not only timely, but quite relevant at the time, at this time of the year, when countries like Malawi, Mozambique, Madagascar, and many others are reeling under and grappling with the serious devastation that have been caused by climate change. Malawi therefore calls upon the delegation, delegates of the 144th General Assembly to embrace this opportunity and come up with resolutions that would assist our Parliament to mobilize resources, commitment, and zeal in dealing with climate change. Madam President and distinguished delegates, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now, please take a floor, Mr. Nadir from Guyana. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, first, the Guyana delegation thanks you and the 
organizers of the IPU for the excellent facilities you have provided for us here in Bali. Madam President, climate change is like the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. We all know it's happening. However, we fail to take serious action to mitigate and stop it. Like all countries here, we are at the front line of the negative impacts of climate change. In several areas, we've had to raise our defenses, two, sea defenses two feet. Water wells in our interior areas have to be dug to 100 feet, and we suffer the ravages of weather swings, the El Nino and La Nina patterns. Madam President, Guyana is making a commitment. And for us to get to zero, all of us will have to unite and be a hero. Guyana will have to pass at its parliament a resolution that will bind its government and future governments. Why? We have a democracy where governments change. And when governments change, policy changes. The one glue would be to have a resolution of parliament. And in this regard, this today, I have been heartened to hear of the resolutions from Korea and from Zimbabwe with respect to binding governments. And this is a recommendation we want to make to other countries whose parliament have not done so. Madam President, my Attorney General will be speaking later, and I now cede my remaining time to him. As the saying goes, politicians have to learn to stand up, speak up, and shut up. Thank you. Terima kasih. Sesi pertama general, general debate sudah terlaksana dengan baik. Kita akan lanjutkan general debate pukul 14.30 WITA. Kami harapkan kepada para peserta untuk bisa uh, hadir sebelum pukul 14.30 sehingga kita bisa secara tepat waktu melanjutkan general debate. Dan pada pukul 17 WITA, General Debate untuk hari ini akan kita selesaikan dan beranjak ke item 2 agenda sidang, consideration of request for the inclusion of an emergency item in the assembly agenda. Dengan demikian, saya tutup pleno pada sesi pertama. Terima kasih.
So 
cek go snack 12 go snack 1 oke okay. go snack 2 go snack 2 go snack 3 go snack 4 ini kayaknya tadi agak kecil ini mbak oke okay. Go snack satu dua cik cik enam go snack enam cik go snack tujuh
Objection. Interupsi cek cek. Ini ini satu deret hidup semua ya. Ini satu deret begini. Cik, cik. Cik, cik. Cik, cik. Cik, cik. Cek cek. Tes tes. Cek cek cek.
Cek, cek. Lucky number. Check. Hello, Angga. Ya, Pak Nusro. Okay. Dengan jelas Pak, suara saya di sana. Oke, sebentar. Halo, selamat siang. Ya, selamat siang, Bapak. Coba buka maskernya, Gang. Biar ngelihat okay. sing-nya. Backlight. Bentar. 
backlight. Selamat siang, Pak. Suaranya Selamat apakah siang. terdengar jelas? Jelas, jelas. Boleh sedikit, Pak, di mic. Baga Kenapa? Suaranya bagaimana? Cukup, Pak. Cukup. Suara cukup jelas. Oke, sekarang Suara mau coba mikrofon delegate ya. Yep. Oke, okay. oh, okay. bagaimana? Apa terdengar di Zoom?
man and woman dedicates their life to defend the freedoms, democracy, the state of law. Recording in progress. The international community, I do recognize the role that each one deserves. IPU involves more than 46,000 parliamentarians all over the world. Men and women dedicate their lives to defend the freedoms, democracy, the state of law. مساء الخير للجميع وارجو الجلوس الساده رؤساء المجالس والبرلمانات رؤساء واعضاء الوفود الحضور الكريم اود بدايه ان اقدم نفسي انا المهندس هيثم الزيادين من المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية نائب رئيس مجلس النواب الأردني بداية اسمحوا لي أن أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل والإمتنان لجمهورية إندونيسيا ممثلة بفخامة الرئيس ومعالي السيدة بوان مهراني رئيس مجلس النواب الإندونيسي كذلك الشكر الموصول لكل من معالي السيد دوارتي باتشيكو رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي ومعالي الأمين العام للاتحاد السيد مارتن وجميع كوادر الأمان العامة للاتحاد على هذه الاستضافة وحسن الاستقبال والتنظيم الرائع لهذا الحدث البرلماني الهام والآن نستكمل جدول أعمالنا ونعود إلى بند, بند النقاش العام واسمحوا لي أن أدعو جمهورية بتسوانيا لأخذ الحديث ومن المتحدث الذي يليه جمهورية مصر العربية أرجو أن يأخذ المكان المحدد لذلك شكراً Mr. President, our speakers, our delegates, distinguished guests, good afternoon. It's an honor and a privilege for Busara to join you on this occasion of the 144th Interparliamentary Union Assembly in the beautiful island of Bali, 
in Nusa Dua, Indonesia. May I extend a sincere regard and commiserations as Busana to those we have lost owing to the COVID-19 pandemic and the global strife that continues and we experience it. Climate change is one of those subjects we should talk about because of its existential threat it poses to life on Earth as we know it. For the general debate of, to focus on climate change clearly demonstrates the seriousness with which we seek to treat this issue as Parliament. For the general debate, Bruxana is not exempt from the impacts of climate change as our economic sectors such as agriculture, water, energy and tourism have been adversely affected, resulting in declined livelihoods of our citizens. The greatly affected are those in the rural areas, as most of our people continue to derive their livelihoods from natural resources, beneficiation, and small-scale rain-fed agriculture. Climate change, therefore, represents one of the greatest environmental, social, economic threats facing Botswana today, as it is projected to increase the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as heat waves, droughts, floods, all over the world. For countries like Botswana, this could have dire consequences on livelihoods, especially to the poor and the vulnerable, thereby further amplifying existing inequalities among our people, more especially gender inequalities. Parliament urgently need to ensure that our countries put in place policies and action plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to significantly induce, reduce climate change risks and impacts. Parliament of Botswana adopted the Climate Change Policy and Institutional Framework in 2021 in an effort to respond to existing and potential climate change effects. The policy presents an opportunity for the country to reinstate its commitment in the stabilization of greenhouse emissions in the atmosphere to the required levels as demonstrated by science. A national action plan and strategy to operationalize the policy has been developed, involving a long-term low-carbon strategy, a national adaptation plan, nationally appropriate mitigation actions, identification of technologies, plan for knowledge management, capacity development, education and public awareness, and a financial mechanism. These commitments are further anchored on our development policies through Vision 2016, 2036. We strive to, we strive for society that is sustainable, carbon resilient, and whose development follows a low carbon development path in pursuit of prosperity for all. As part of our commitment to the Paris Agreement, Botswana has also communicated its nationally determined contributions through which it intends to achieve overall emissions reduction of 15%, through which it extended to achieve an overall emissions reduction by 2030. Our role as Botswana Parliament, therefore, is to strengthen governance and policy and enhance implementation towards transformative climate resilient development. And Botswana Parliament provides an oversight role for realization of policy response measures. 
In that regard, we have established a portfolio committee on wildlife, natural resources, climate change, and special select committee on SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, I must also, however, indicate that transitional capacities are needed within Parliament to include dedicated resource and capacity portfolio committees, as well as their increased involvement in the climate change negotiation platform. One of our key developments in that regard has been the climate establishment of parliamentary committee of women, which continues to provide a gender lens into our development agenda, including climate change mitigation. Distinguished guests, similarly, the newly established International Subsidiary Standards Board, which aims to provide a worldwide baseline for climate and environmental, social, and governance discourse standards, will be a critical step in pro pro improving climate smart investing decision making. Targeted not to be ensure reduction in emissions, but also ensure that our governments remain their aim to meet the Paris Agreement's temperature objective at a faster rate in order to combat climate change. We need to intensify our actions and investments needed for a substantial low carbon future and equitable de developments globally. We need parliaments to increase participation in negotiations at regional and international fora. The Pusana economy is primarily anchored on mining and agriculture. The diamonds and beef sectors in particular mean a lot to Botswana and are most energy and water intensive. We therefore require better production technologies, funding, water, energy efficient and climate friendly production order in order to achieve development agendas. It is therefore to mobilize our stakeholders to change rules, attitudes, and behavior for achievement of suitable developments. Mr. President, in conclusion, I take this opportunity to call on parliaments to ensure they maintain valuable partners, they remain valuable partners at the forefront at the, to achieve sustainable development for all because of the constitutional advantage they have and they enjoy through lawmaking overseeing government policies and programs, enacting and scrutinizing government budgets, and responding to views of their constituents. As Parliament, we have the responsibility to shape national climate policies, drive equitable and sustainable development, and fill the important gaps at global, national, and local levels it remains crucial that parliamentarians are capacitated to, on issues of climate change to catalyze the process. I thank you, Abimbal, for your attention. Thank you. And then, I ask the President of Mصر, the President of the Mصri Council, to present the President والمتحدث الذي يليه غينيا غينيا بيساو معالي السيد دوارتي باتشيكو رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي معالي السيد مارتن شونغونغ الأمين العام للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي أصحاب المعالي رؤساء البرلمانات ورؤساء الوفود البرلمانية المشاركين السيدات والسادة الحضور أود في مستهل حديثي إليكم أن أعرب عن خالص تقديري وعظيم الامتنان إلى الأصدقاء في البرلمان الأندونيسي على جهودهم المقدرة وما لمسناه من حفاوة بالغة وحسن تنظيم 
الحضور الكريم ليس من المبالغة القول بأن ظاهرة تغير المناخ تعد التهديد الأكبر الذي يترتب عليه آثار كارثية على المجتمعات البشرية والنظم البيئية والأيكولوجية وهو ما يحتم على المجتمع الدولي بذل جهود حثيثة والتحلي بإرادة جادة وصادقة لمجابهة تلك الظاهرة عبر الحد من الانبعاثات باعتباره هدفا عالميا من أجل إنقاذ العالم من أخطار تغير المناخ الزميلات العزيزات والزملاء الأعزاء لقد أولت الدولة المصرية اهتماما خاصا بقضية تغير المناخ وضعت خلاله التكيف مع التغيرات المناخية كأولوية رئيسية وهو ما جعل الخطاب الخطاب المصري تجاه تلك الظاهرة في مختلف المحافل العالمية يرتكز بالأساس على المسؤولية المشتركة لدول العالم في إنقاذ كوكب الأرض وفي هذا الإطار انتهجت الدولة المصرية خطاً شاملاً تمضي فيه مجهوداتها الوطنية في مواجهة تلك الظاهرة إلى جانب الانخراط الإيجابي والمكثف في كافة الأنشطة العالمية لمواجهة تلك الظاهرة فعلى الصعيد الوطني عمدت الدولة المصرية إلى مراجعة التشريعات والقوانين الخاصة بالبيئة ووضع السياسات الكفيلة بمجابهة التغيرات المناخية عبر رؤية وطنية شاملة استهدفت وضع قضية التحول إلى الاقتصاد الأخضر في مقدمة الأولويات المصرية في إطار الاستراتيجية التنموية المصرية 2030 كما أطلقت مصر على هامش مشاركتها في أعمال الدورة السادسة والعشرين لمؤتمر الدول الأطراف في اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة لتغير المناخ بجلاسكو الاستراتيجية الوطنية لتغير المناخ عشرين خمسين والتي تسعى لتحقيق أهداف رئيسية تتمثل في تحقيق نمو اقتصادي مستدام وخفض الانبعاثات في مختلف القطاعات وزيادة حصة مصادر الطاقة المتجددة والبديلة في مزيج الطاقة وتعظيم كفاءتها بالإضافة إلى العمل على تعزيز البحث العلمي ونقل التكنولوجيا وإدارة المعرفة والوعي لمكافحة تغير المناخ وتحسين حوكمة وإدارة العمل في مجال تغير المناخ وعلى الصعيد الدولي حرصت مصر على الانخراط الإيجابي والبناء في كافة المشاورات والاتفاقيات الدولية لمواجهة ظاهرة تغير المناخ وترتكز الرؤية المصرية في هذا الإطار على المسؤولية المشتركة لكافة الدول عن مواجهة أثار التغيرات المناخية مع تفاوت الأعباء المترتبة على ذلك بين الدول المتقدمة والنامية فمع الأهمية القصوى لتضافر الجهود الرامية للحد من انبعاث الغازات المتسببة في ارتفاع درجة حرارة الأرض والتسبب في تغير المناخ إلا أنه ينبغي أيضاً إلى اهتمام كافي بالشق الخاص بالتكيف مع التغيرات المناخية والتي ألحقت أضراراً جسيمة بالدول النامية على مدار العقود الماضية بشكل أكبر من الدول المتقدمة نظراً لضعف القدرات المالية والفنية والتكنولوجية للدول النامية كما يأتي استضافة مصر للدورة السابعة والعشرين لمؤتمر الدول الأطراف في اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة لتغير المناخ كوب 27 هذا العام ليمثل برهانا على الاراده المصريه الصادقه والجاده في بلوره جهد قانوني دولي منظم وعادل في مواجهه ظاهره التغيرات المناخيه. السيدات والساده الحضور اننا كبرلمانيين مدعوين اكثر من اي وقت مضى لحشد جهودنا البرلمانيه باتجاه دعم مكافحه التغيرات المناخيه. سواء على أصعدتنا الوطنية أو في إطار محافلنا البرلمانية العالمية وذلك عبر عدة آليات أبرزها إلزام الحكومات بتقديم تقارير دولية للبرلمانات بشأن ما تحرزه من تقدم بشأن مواجهة تغير المناخ فضلاً عن العمل على تحقيق توافق أكبر بين التشريعات والسياسات ذات الصلة بمكافحة تلك الظاهرة الخطيرة بما يضمن تناسق الجهود الوطنية البرلمانية والحكومية في هذا الشأن إذ أننا لا نتحمل مسؤولية أجيالنا فقط 
وإنما نرفع عن كاهل الأجيال القادمة هذا الخطر المخيف وفي الختام أتمنى لأعمال اجتماعاتنا كل التوفيق والسداد وأشكر حضراتكم شكرا جزيلا على حسن الاستماع شكرا والآن أدعو تايلاند بسبب عدم وجود غينيا بيساو والمتحدث الذي يليه الكويت وأرجو من الإخوة المتحدثين أن نلتزم بالوقت حتى يتمكن الجميع من أخذ فرصة اليوم Mr. President Honorable Delegates Distinguished Participants Right now as we speak here in Bali the adverse impacts of climate change are becoming more evident and affecting the lives and livelihoods of people around the world which demands urgent global actions. Thailand thus wishes to commend Indonesia, our host parliament, for reminding us not to let the COVID pandemic overshadow this pressing challenge of humanity. And our mission to curb the rising global temperature, which remains at the top of the IPU's priority list. As one of the world's top 10 countries most affected by the long-term impacts of climate change, and one of the first group of parties to join the Paris Agreement in 2015, Thailand is making a good progress in fulfilling our commitments to achieve the goals and objectives of the UNFCCC and its Paris Agreement. Aside from our success in reducing 17% of our emissions in the energy and transport sectors in 2020, meeting our nationally appropriate mitigation action, or NAMA, target, Thailand will take further steps to address climate change at the 26th session of the Conference of Paris to the UNFCCC, or COP26. In Glasgow last November, the Prime Minister of Thailand announced our new ambitions to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 and net zero greenhouse gas emission by 2065. Guided by BioCircular Green, or BCG, economy model, Thailand will continue to prioritize circular economic system at a faster pace and pursue a greener, digitally driven, and low carbon path to development by rolling out measures and policies that help the world attain global net zero by 2050. We will push ahead with restructuring the energy industry and focusing on climate smart infrastructure to accommodate the clean and renewable energy transition trend and greening the financial system through the ASEAN Low Carbon Energy Program, as well as optimizing energy consumption through innovation and using next generation technologies for electric vehicle production as part of Thailand 4.0 National Development Strategy. Mr. President, in keeping with Thailand's pledge made at COP26 summit. The Parliament of Thailand stands ready to help strengthen the country's climate action. Therefore, I am personally pleased to inform you that Thailand is now in the process of preparing the country's first ever dedicated Climate Change Act, which includes obligations 
for the private sector to report their GHG emissions to the National Greenhouse Gas Inventory while stipulating administrative fines for failure to report such emissions. This legislation would prompt our private sector to start aligning their way of doing business with the, climate, with the country's climate targets. The draft act is expected to go through nationwide public hearings and tables to the parliament later this year. To keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius target with the leash, Thailand would like to emphasize the need for capacity building, technology transfer, and financial support to assist developing countries in accelerating their mitigation efforts. We are confident that with enhanced support on and access to climate finance and necessary low carbon technology, Thailand can increase our national our nationally determined contributions or NDCs to 40% and achieve our net zero even before 2065. Mr. President, I wish to close by reiterating that we must turn this COVID-19 crisis into an opportunity. Let us make every effort to recover better and greener by creating more balanced, low carbon and climate resilient societies and economies that benefit everyone. As the stake have never been higher and we have little time left to enhance our climate actions. Parliamentarians across the globe need to work together to intensify our actions to tackle the climate emergency and achieve the goals and objectives of the UNFCCC and its Paris Agreement at the earliest opportunities. This is an ultimate war that humanity can join hands to fight against global warming, our common enemy, and protect the blue tenant, our only home and the future of our next generations. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. أدعو الآن دولة الكويت والمتحدث الذي يليه دولة أفغانستان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد النبي الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين معالي الأخت بوان ماهراني رئيسة مجلس النواب في جمهورية اندونيسيا الصديقة معالي الأخ دوارتي فاتشيكو رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي معالي الأخ مارتن تشونغ كونغ الأمين العام للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي أصحاب المعالي والسعادة رؤساء البرلمانات ورؤساء الوفود البرلمانية الحضور الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بداية شكرا على اختيار ملف التغير المناخي والاحتباس الحراري موضوعا للمناقشة العامة لهذه الدورة إن أهمية هذا الاختيار لا تكمن في حيثيات الملف ذاته بقدر ما تمثله من نموذج للقضايا والأولويات التي يجب أن يتعاطى معها العالم بأسره وعندما أقول نموذج فأنا أعني تلك المواصفات التي تنطوي عليها تلك القضية وأهم تلك المواصفات هي عالمية القضية 
أي كونها قضية جامعة عابرة للقارات وغير محصورة في إقليم أو منطقة ما من العالم نحن هنا لا نتحدث عن ملف الفقه أو المجاعات أو التصحر أو حقوق المرأة السياسية مثلا كقضايا حصرية بمناطق وأقاليم ما بل نتحدث عن قضية تلقي بظلالها وتهديداتها ومآلاتها على كل العالم العالم بأسره ولن أحتاج عندما أقول عالمية أن أذكر بجائحة كوفيد-19 الذي, كف... الذي كشف هشاشة العالم وتشضيه وكشف فيما كشف خاصة في الأيام الأولى كل أنواع الأنانيات القطرية والمخاوف المتبادلة وسياسات العزل والإغلاق لدرجة شهدنا فيها كل الممارسات التي تنطوي على الاستئثار وقرصنة اللقاحات وصفقات تحت الطاولة لتأمين الحماية والوقاية وبشكل هستيري ينطوي على كل النزاعات التي اتسمت بالتشكك والأنانية وانعدام كل التضامنات الإنسانية لأخوة الحضور نحن أمام معضلة دائمة خاصة عندما نتعاطى مع قضايا كالتغير المناخي وهي إن الإنسان لا يتحرك إلا إذا وقعت الكارثة وكان العالم يظن أن الترتيبات العالمية التي تمت بعد الحرب الكونية الثانية وصدرت من الأمم المتحدة ومنظمات عالمية ملحقة واتفاقيات ومعاهدات حقوقية ذات صبغة إلزامية قانونيا وأخلاقيا كان يظن أنها ساهمت في إشعار العالم بأن حربا عالمية ثالثة لن تقع وأن هذا الأمر هو خط أحمر لن يسمح به العالم لكننا كنا نفشل دائما لقد كانت الحرب الباردة وحروب الوكالة في كل مناطق العالم شاهدا على أن الخطر ماثلا دائما من الحرب الكورية وفيتنام وخليج الخنازير وربيع براغ وأفغانستان وأنغولا وغيرها والعالم يشهد تلك الحروب التي جميعها كان يمكن تفاديها وها نحن الآن وبعد 77 عاما من انتهاء الحرب الكونية الثانية نشهد مواجهة عسكرية مؤسفة بين روسيا وأوكرانيا ونسمع مرة أخرى كلمات مثل نووية وكيميائية وحرب عالمية ثالثة كلمات يفترض أنها أصبحت جزءا من التاريخ لا تستخدم إلا على سبيل الردع والتهديد إنما يحدث دليل آخر على هشاشة الترتيبات العالمية ودافع قوي على ضرورة أن ينتبه العالم إلى خطورة ممارسات الإنسان الإنسان الذي يدعي التحضر والتمدن وحصانته من التهور واللعب بالنار إن أهمية ملف التغير المناخي تكمن في هذا البعد عالميته وخطورته وما ينطوي عليه من تهديد وهو تهديد شامل لكل البشر باختلاف أقاليمهم وأديانهم وأعراقهم والأهمية الأخرى تكمن في إن الإنسان لا يريد أن يتحرك إلا بعد أن تقع المصيبة والكارثة وحينها يكون الوقت قد تأخر ولأن العالم صغير جدا فليس هناك قضية إقليمية أو حصرية إن مجاعة في قلب أفريقيا هي تهديد لشمال أوروبا وأمريكا وشرق آسيا ولو بعد حين وأزمة اقتصادية في أقصى الشرق هي أزمة لكل أسواق العالم ووباء في أمريكا اللاتينية هو تهديد للصحة العامة في العالم القديم تماما مثل احتلال غاصب وممارسات غير إنسانية كتلك التي يقوم بها نظام كالنظام الصهيوني في فلسطين هي جرح مفتوح وتقويض للسلم والأمن الدوليين في كل قارات العالم الأخوات والأخوة لا أحد محصن في هذا العالم ولا أحد بمنأى عن أي كارثة وإن بدت إقليمية أو مناطقية كنا في السنوات السابقة نتحدث عن الإرهاب وكنت أقول في مثل هذه المؤتمرات لا أحد بمنأى عن الإرهاب وإن انفجارا في بغداد أو القاهرة أو كابل سيسمع دويه في بروكسل وباريس ولندن لم يكن ذلك تهديدا بل تحذيرا وتذكيرا بصغر هذا العالم وترابطه في عصر التواصل والتكنولوجيا وأمام كل القضايا التي نناقشها هناك قاسم مشترك وهو أن علينا العمل الآن اليوم وليس غدا 
عاجلا لا آجلا شكرا على حسن الاستماع والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا أدعو الآن دولة أفغانستان الإسلامية والمتحدث الذي يليه مملكة البحرين به نام خداوند بزرگ جناب رئیس و شنرکنندگان محترم نخواست اجازه بدهید که سمانترین سلام ها و تمانیات نیک خیش و ملت رنجیده افغانستان را حضور شما تقدیم بدارم متاسفانه بعد از هفت ما تسلد طالبان در افغانستان تهدات آنها با جامعه جهانی از قبیل ایجاد حکومت هم شمول آزادی بیان آزادی مطبوعات حقوق خانم ها نه تنها کملی نشده بلکه در این مدت محدودت های بیشتر نیز وضع گردیده است شما خود در جریان هستید که میزان فقر بیکاری باوج خود رسیده مردم حاضر به فروش فرزندانشان گردیدن گراف جرایم جنایی و اختطاف همه روزه روند سعودی خود را طی می کند عفو مومی آنچنان که گفته می شود عملی نگردیده است و شما خود شاهد محاکم سرایی جوانان و نیروهای دفاعی و امنیتی از بق هستید آزادی بیان که یکی از دستاوردهای 20 سال اخیر مردم افغانستان در تشریک مسای جامعه جانی بود دیگر وجود ندارد اکثریت رسانه های محلی و ملی یا مسدود گردیده و یا سانسور می شوند و صدها جورنال است طبقه زکور و اوناس شغل خود را دست دادند خانم ها از ابتدایی ترین حقوق خود مانند کار تحصیل محروم شده و اکثریت کارمندان حکومت پیشین یا برکنار گردیده و یا هم حقوق امتیازات خیش را در این مدت دریافت نکردند عرمی خصوصی مردم احترام گذاشته نمی شود و در مناطق خاص تلاشی خانه به خانه که انگیزه سیاسی دارد جریان دارد زمن قدردانی از کمک های بشر دوستانه جامعه جهانی در این مدت قابل یادآوری می دانم که تا جایی که من و همکارانم در جریان هستیم این کمک ها در اکثر موارد به مستقیم توزیع نمی گردد بحران مهاجرت هنوز کماکان ادامه دارد طبق امار غیر رسمی حدود 600 تا 700 هزار نفر تنها در کشورهای همسایه افغانستان در این مدت مهاجرت نمودند و صدها هزار نفر دیگر در انتظار بیرون شدن بیرون شدن از افغانستان هستند من و همکارانم همه در داخل کشور با مردم در تماس بوده و وضعیت را از نزدیک نظارت میکنیم من یک بار دیگر از همین طریق میخواهم خاطر نشان سازم که تنها رای حل بیرون رفت از وضعیت موجوده تشکیل حکومت هم شمول و نظام مردم سالار اشراک هم اقوام در بدن قدرت از بین بردن تبعیض قومی لسانی سمتی و احترام به حقوق زنان و آزادی بیان می باشد به نان شما و جامعه جهانی تقاضا مندم تا جد تحقق این اهداف م... طبق تحقق این اهداف مردم افغانستان را مانند همیشه قاطعانه در این راستا حمایت نمایید تشکر از توجه شما شكرا ادعو الان مملكه البحرين للحديث وجيبوتي غير موجود سيكون المتحدث الذي يليه جنوب افريقيا
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أصحاب المعالي والسعادة رؤساء البرلمانات والوفود الحضور الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته لقد كان جديرا بهذا الاجتماع أن يقام في جزيرة بالي الجميلة بطبيعتها لتكون مثالا حيا للفعاليات المنشودة في هذا الاجتماع الذي يضعنا أمام مسؤولية الخروج برؤية فعالة أزاءت متغيرات المناخية المتسارعة وحتى نتمكن من الحفاظ على هذا الكوكب من الانفلات البيئي الذي ينذر بكوارثة يصعب التنبؤ بمداها أصحاب المعالي والسعادة لقد أضحى تغيير المناخ واحداً من أخطر التحديات التي تهدد مستقبل البشرية وأصبحت معالجة وتصدي للمشاكل التي يولدها مطلباً دولياً ملحاً وعاجلاً خاصة في ظل تزايد الظواهر المناخية المتطرفة والتي تنقدح بشكل يومي في مناطق مختلفة من الأرض وبنحو غير مسبوق حيث خلفت أكثر من عشرين مليون لاجئا مناخي في العالم وإن عداد المتضررين من أفراد ومناطق سيظل يلقي بمؤثراته نحو التزايد المضطرد إذا لم تتداعى البرلمانات والحكومات والهيئات المتخصصة والشركات والأفراد لوضع تدابير وآليات تكبح التسارع في التغيير المناخي وفي هذه اللحظة التي أتحدث معكم فيها قد تكون أكثر من بقعة في الأرض تواجه صعوبات بيئية من سيول أو جفاف أو عواصف أو ارتفاع حاد في درجة الحرارة أو اختلال لموازين البيئة كما يحصل في القطب الشمالي والنتائج التي تلوح في الأفق تنذر باتساع الكوارث الطبيعية والظواهر المناخية العنيفة التي تسبب المزيد من النازحين ولم نتمكن من الوقوف أمام ذلك كله إلا بوجود إرادة دولية جامعة وتدابير حازمة وفورية وتحول جذري في الآليات والسلوك البشري لكبح المعدلات الهائلة من انبعاث الغازات والاحتباس الحراري الذي يضع الأمن الاقتصادي والغذائي والمائي والصحي العالمي على المحك ولا شك أن برلمانات العالم بحاجة اليوم أكثر من أي وقت مضى لأن تتحد وتتحرك في سياق موحد لتجاوز التحديات البيئية التي نلامس حساسيتها بمقاربتها مع ما نشهده من آثار وأضرار واسعة تركتها جائحة كورونا وما خلفته من تبعات جسيمة قد تشكل في مجملها جزءا بسيطا مقارنة, مع مقارنة بما قد تحدثه المتغيرات المناخية من ظواهر كارثية في الكوكب والمجتمعات الإنسانية أصحاب المعالي والسعادة إذا لم نستطع اليوم كبرلمانات وحكومات ومنظمات أن نعمل على صياغة توجه عالمي جاد وإيجاد تدابير طارئة فقد نضطر مستقبلا للبحث عن إقامة مدن صديقة للنازحين بفعل الظواهر المناخية خاصة بعد الصرخة التي أطلقتها الأمم المتحدة والتي أنذرت من تغيرات مدمرة في كوكب الأرض خلال العقود القليلة القادمة حيث يبقى الرهان على تجاوز تلك التهديدات في تغيير السلوك البشري ومن الحتمي إننا كبرلمانات يقع على عاتقنا إدماج التكيف مع تغيير المناخ في صلب برامجنا المستقبلية وأن ندفع لتوفر المزيد من موارد التمويل لتحسين قدرة الحكومات في التعاطي الفعال مع أزمة المناخ كما يستدعي الواقع أن نستحث الجهود للقيام بالدور الحاسم لكبح آثار الأزمة عبر دعم التوسع في أنماط الأنشطة الاقتصادية الأقل إضراراً بالبيئة وتشجيع الاقتصاد الأخضر وتحفيز أنماط الإنتاج والاستهلاك المستدامة التي تضع المعايير البيئية في مقدمة أولوياتها 
وذلك عن طريق تحفيز مؤسسات القطاع الخاص للتحرك في إطار الاستهلاك والإنتاج المستدام والتوسع في استخدام مصادر الطاقة المتجددة وتقديم الحوافز المختلفة لذلك التحول أصحاب المعالي والسعادة لقد كان الحضور العالمي الحاشد في مؤتمر الدول الأطراف السادسة والعشرين في غلاسكو أواخر العام الماضي والوثيقة التي تمخضت عن مؤشرا للأهمية الفائقة التي ينبغي أن يوليها المجتمع الدولي لهذه القضية ولقد كانت مملكة البحرين حاضرة في هذا الحدث بوفد رفيع المستوى برئاسة صاحب السمو الملكي الأمير سلمان بن حمد آل خليفة ولي العهد رئيس مجلس الوزراء حفظه الله حيث أعلنت دعمها للمبادرة الدولية في مجال تغيير المناخ وتشارك مملكة البحرين وتنفيذا للتوجيهات السامية لحضرة صاحب الجلالة الملك حمد بن عيسى آل خليفة عاهل البلاد المفدى حفظه الله ورعاه المجتمع الدولي اهتمامه بتوفير بيئة آمنة للبشرية فقد قامت بإدماج أهداف تغيير المناخ والرؤية الاقتصادية للمملكة عشرين ثلاثين وبرنامج عمل الحكومة القائم كما أنشأت العديد من المؤسسات والهيئات الحكومية واللجان لوضع البرامج والسياسات والاستراتيجيات كالمجلس الأعلى للبيئة وإنشاء هيئة للطاقة المستدامة وعمدت لتعيين مبعوثا خاصا لشؤون المناخ وقامت بسن عدد من القوانين واللوائح إنفاذا للاتفاقيات متعددة الأطراف التي أصبحت المملكة طرف فيها وصبت تركيزها على رفع مستوى الوعي العام وبناء القدرات الوطنية في المجالات المتعلقة بالبيئة فيما صادقت المملكة على اتفاقية باريس في ديسمبر من عام 2016 والتي دمجت تهديدات التغيير المناخي في السياسات الوطنية لجميع القطاعات وحققت مملكة البحرين إنجازات عديدة من خلال تنفيذ الخطط والمشاريع الخاصة بالتغيير المناخي ومنها مشروع الطاقة المتجددة واعتماد أفضل المبادرات لتحقيق أهداف التنمية المستدامة خاصة في مجال خفض الانبعاثات الكربونية كما يعد تدشين الحملة الوطنية للتشجير تحت شعار دمتي خضراء برعاية صاحبة السمو الملكي الأميرة سبيكة بنت إبراهيم آل خليفة قرينة عاهل البلاد المفدى رئيسة المجلس الأعلى للمرأة أبرز المبادرات في هذا الصدد أتمنى أن نخرج من هذا, المش... من هذا المؤتمر برؤية لمواجهة الأخطار المحدقة بكوكبنا وتهديد سبل العيش فيه وأن نصل إلى الصفر الآمن عبر ما ننشد من تعبئة للبرلمانات من أجل تغيير المناخ أشكر لكم حسن إصغاءكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا أدعو الآن جمهورية جنوب أفريقيا والمتحدث الذي يليها جمهورية مالطا Honorable President of the IPU, Mr. Duarte Poshaku, the Speaker of Parliament of the Republic of Indonesia, our host, Chairperson, Honorable Presiding Officers, Honorable Members, and Distinguished Guests, Your Excellency, Madam President of Indonesia in absentia, it is an honor and privilege for me and the people of the Republic of South Africa to be afforded this prestigious opportunity to contribute to the debate of such important theme of the 144th IPU Assembly, Getting to Zero, Mobilizing Parliaments to Act on Climate Change. On behalf of the delegation of South Africa, I wish to express our sincere appreciation for the kind and warm welcome we have received in this beautiful country since our arrival. It will be amiss of me 
chairperson, not to mention that in 1961, on this day in South Africa, 69 people were mowed down by the racist regime, and that day has since become the Human Rights Day in South Africa. So today, South Africa is commemorating its Human Rights Day. The 144th plenary session takes place against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic and conflicts across the world that continue to claim the lives of innocent people. Tackling climate change has far-reaching implications for socioeconomic development, for production and consumption patterns. Your Excellency, the Chair, the theme of our debate enjoins us to reflect on the question of climate change and the need to mobilize parliaments to act swiftly in reducing its negative effects. We wish to confirm that the Republic of South Africa welcomes the outcome of the concluded Glasgow Climate Change Conference, which calls upon the international community to rally behind a shared objective to inject a greater sense of agency on the basis of international equity and the latest available science. In our country, we support the government's view articulated by our president on the green recovery for our country. It is our view, Chairperson, that the Rome COP26 legislative prescript can and must safeguard the planet's ecosystems, reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, and limit global temperature increases. In this instance, we call on high-income countries to step up and take responsibility given the fact that they continue to benefit from the use of fossil fuels. There is still a lack of clear commitment to phasing out fossil fuels by 2050 by some of the key development countries. And there is a lack of clarity on outstanding financial commitments by developed countries on previous gatherings where we feel that they simply don't walk the talk. It may be politically correct for wealth leaders to make certain statements, but ultimately it is about establishing trust. Trust is important because as developing countries, we come from a situation where all are still caught up in the devastation that was caused by, in our national budget, by the COVID-19 pandemic. As it has been with climate change, developed countries were saying a lot of things about assistance coming to the developing countries, yet there are mounting concerns about vaccine hoarding, which has a negative impact on relationships of trust. We expect developed countries, which build their economies on coal, to assist us now to put fossil fuels aside, justly so. South Africa has revised its NDCs by committing ourselves to more emission, ambitious greenhouse gas emissions targets by 2030. This includes the phasing out of between eight to 10 coal-fired power stations. It is in this regard that we appreciate the partnership on just transition, where international partners have committed funds for South Africa's just energy transition. We as parliamentarians have keen interest in this and we will play an active oversight role to see what the elements of this agreement are. However, our position as a country is not to wait on the international community and developed countries to make commitments before we start with the implementation of what is in our national development plan and also in our green recovery plan. We have now started processing the National Climate Change Bill in Parliament and parliamentarians will have to ensure sufficient and effective public participation process so that all voices of South Africans can be heard. The just transition is crucial in ensuring that nobody is left behind. As I conclude, Chair, South Africa's main priorities remain focused on securing an ambitious progressive finance and adaptation package to support the African agenda and other developing countries to alleviate the negative impact of climate change. It is worth mentioning that the manner in which climate change affects us depends on where we are located on the global map. As it could be expected, the hardest hit population groups are poor. 
poor people. These are in the main inhabitants of developing countries who are predominantly farmers who depend on rain-fed and basic mechanisms for tilling the land and earning a livelihood. The only way their conditions can change is through policy shifts. Critical to this is dedicated action on the part of policymakers and the people who represent them like legislators and members of parliament. Great changes throughout history have been born out of crises. We should therefore not waste this moment. I thank you, Ndiabulela Asandesan. Shukran. Ado al an Jumhuriyat Malta wa al Mutahadith al Ladi Yali Jumhuriyat Zambia. Thank you, Chair. Distinguished uh, colleagues, parliamentarians, the world changed dramatically since we met in Madrid last November. No one can even think about it, that we didn't even thought about it, that the war will return to Europe in a few months' time, just a few months after the Madrid conference. We are living now in challenging times, and once again, the victims of war are the people dying in the streets of Ukraine. Women and children fleeing their homes and crossing their borders towards safer and more peaceful countries. It is indeed a humanitarian tragedy. War, as you know, does not stop at the borders of those countries directly involved. It is sending shockwaves across Europe and, I must confess, across the whole world. It is also hitting our efforts to address the climate crisis. For example, the invasion of Ukraine is hampering scientific efforts to undertake vital research on climate change when it comes to permafrost in Russia, which covers 60 percent of its territory. We are talking about a vast area of frozen ground, which is estimated to hold twice as much greenhouse gas as there is in the whole atmosphere. One major shockwave that we have seen in recent weeks is the sudden spike in the price of fuel, fossil fuels on which we are still very much dependent. We all know that energy prices based on fossil fuels are very volatile, but we can also learn from this experience that such volati volatility is not sustainable. We also know that such volatility is non-existent when using renewable sources to generate our economies, for, for example. I come from a very small island republic in the Mediterranean, and apart from the obvious threat of rising sea levels, we are also very much dependent on sea and air transportation. The increase in cost of transportation in recent months and weeks, which is mainly attributed to the increase in price of fossil fuels, has been phenomenal. Therefore, the transition to a green economy is not only required to save our planet, but it is also necessary for our economies. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a matter of a choice, but a matter of action. Let's be honest with ourselves. It is not an easy way forward, but we must take the same direction together. Of course, it is easier said than done. The global economy, since the last World War in particular, 
has based its economic generation on fossil fuels. The large majority of our investment during the last century have been centered around the provision of fossil fuels, be it cars, aeroplanes, ships, be it power to generate electricity. Therefore, we need strong political will. We need a change in the mentality. However hard it is, the world has to adapt swiftly to the changes that were brought by the pandemic. We need the same approach when it comes to climate change. The transition towards a green economy should be also fair. Its success can only be achieved if no one, and I repeat, no one is left behind. Decisions will not, only, not always be popular, but they can affect some areas and some sectors more than others. And therefore, we need collectively to be sensitive when deciding and implementing reforms. Malta took the initiative to, requ to request the inclusion of climate change on the agenda of the 43rd session of the United Nations General Assembly, proposing that an appropriate high-level mechanism be established to address the cause and effects of this phenomenon on, in, on mankind. This mechanism would be tasked to propose legal and political measures to address global warming and its environmental and social economic implications. I must remind you that it was my country, Malta, way back in 1988, 6 December, when there was the Malta Resolution on the Protection of Global Climate for present and future generations of mankind that was at that time unanimously adopted in the plenary of the General Assembly. Ladies and gentlemen, the role of politicians, but the role definitely of parliamentarians, is crucial. In 2015, Malta enacted the Climate Action Act. This act established a Climate Action Board, a body in which all sectors of our society are represented, aiming to mainstream climate action, monitor implementation of international and EU commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and facilitate preparedness and adaptation to climate impacts. This Climate Action Act also required the executive to prepare a low carbon development strategy and a national adaptation strategy that will be reviewed and updated at least every four years. So Parliament is also responsible as an institution to hold the government into account. It is important to pass laws. However, laws need to be implemented on the ground in an effective way. It is the role of our parliaments that must make sure that the implementation of laws as it is done should be and targets are met in time. Climate change is a horizontal issue and cannot be tackled through a single sector alone. Let me conclude with a concrete proposal. I urge you to go back to your parliaments and work toward the setting up of a parliamentary committee with a specific aim of scrutinizing the implementation of measures relating to climate change. A specific committee solely dedicated to climate change matters in which all sectors can coordinate all the perspectives within one mechanism that can prove to be more effective. Thank you very much. Shukran. Adul An, Jumhuriyat Zambia, wa al Mutahadith al Ladi Yali, Jumhuriyat Mirishos. Dear colleagues, Mr. President, allow me to place on record my gratitude for this opportunity to share my thoughts on the topic, Getting to Zero, Mobilizing Parliaments to Act on Climate Change. Mr. P President, allow me also to take this opportunity to wish all the women in the gathering a happy Women's Month aimed at breaking the bias, including matters of climate change. 
Mr. President, climate change has emerged as one of the world's greatest developmental challenges in the 21st century. Communities around the world, particularly the poorest and most vulnerable, are experiencing the devastating and pernicious effects of climate change. As a woman from a developing country, climate change is close to my heart. This is because I have witnessed its devastating impacts on, the, on my country, which sadly has disproportionately affected women and girls and worsened their social economic status. This, Mr. President, needs to be addressed urgently by all stakeholders. While recognizing several interventions at global, regional, and national levels, climate change challenges and its effects remain complex. With the advent of COVID-19 pandemic, countries are urged to ensure that plans to recover from pandemic are ongoing. It is important to embrace and adopt health and green recovery strategies and interventions. It is therefore imperative that parliaments are mobilized to spearhead ambitious climate actions owing to their centrality by virtue of being representative institutions. Through their entrenched legislative oversight, budget and representative functions, parliaments with their strategic mandate can be mobilized to do the following. One, provide legislative framework on climate change. This can be achieved by reviewing existing laws and proposing new ones where possible to mainstream climate change. Two, influence and monitor the implementation of climate change legislation and budgets. Parliaments can be mobilized to provide effective oversight and national and international commitments, including government implementation of national legislation and budgets. Further, parliaments can provide effective oversight by ensuring that the legislation it enacts is sufficient, funded, and implemented, and guarantee that the citizens it represents are consulted and included in climate change decision-making processes. While, uh, pr pa uh, while parliaments endeavor to carry out the aforementioned roles, the Zambian parliament inclusive, a number of challenges were faced. Structural and policy issues, such as limited financial support, inadequate technical capacity, overlapping sectoral objectives of synergy, between, these, between the diverse sectors and insufficient relevant information and data to support members of parliament in addressing climate change issues are the most prominent challenges. To ensure that members of parliament are effective in discharging their responsibilities, the highlighted challenges need to be addressed and capacities built in order for parliaments to achieve the desired outcomes of getting to zero on climate change. Mr. President, as people's representatives and beyond the confines of legislation and oversight in parliament, parliament parliamentarians should be mobilized to act on clim climate change. For example, in Zambia, parliamentarians felt the need to address the effects of climate change at local level in their constituencies where the impacts of climate change are experienced directly by the people. Further, parliamentarians have sought to combat certain vices such as charcoal burning and deforestation, which are fast changing rainfall patterns and worsening the impact of climate change at local level. In this regard, Mr. President, our parliamentarians established a Zambia Parliamentary Caucus which is a cross-party voluntary grouping for parliamentarians with a mandate to work towards prioritizing and building consensus on issues that affect conservation, natural resource management, and climate change. As part of its milestone, in 2015, the caucus, in partnership with various stakeholders that work towards climate-resilient communities, such as the World Wide Fund for Nature, and the International Conservation Caucus Foundation advocated for legislation on the forest protection and management. The caucus made a submission to the Parliamentary Committee on Lands, 
environment and tourism, which led to the enactment of the current Forest Act. Further, the Zambian Parliamentary Conservation Caucus participated in the revision of the Wildlife Act by partnering with the ministry responsible for tourism in organizing the National Parks and Wildlife Police Workshop, where the caucus made submissions that led into the enactment of the current Wildlife Act, number 14 of 2015. The Act provides for Italia the, susta the sustainable management and protection of wildlife, in including forest ecosystems in the wake of climate change. Mr. President, in addition, the parliamentarians have partnered with the government of the Republic of Zambia's Forest Department to plant 1,000 trees in their constituencies as one of the measures to mitigate against the impact of climate change at community level. Mr. President, allow me to share with this August gathering that we as a parliament are doing to reduce our carbon footprint in institu at institutional level. Our parliament works in partnership with the local recycling, recycling company to collect waste paper for recycling. Further, in 2014, our institution collaborated with the country's main power utility to install a mini solar plant as an alternative source of power. Mr. President, let me conclude by stating that parliaments are at the center of the climate change response. I, therefore, wish to call upon all parliamentarians to mobilize themselves with the intention of working closely with their citizens by consulting them and including them in the climate change decision-making process and efforts. By so doing, parliaments will inspire strong leadership and political will towards the fight against climate change. Let's think globally, but act local in getting the zero on, change, on climate change. I thank you for your attention. Shukran. Al-an, ad'u Jamhuriyat Mauritius wa al-mutahadith al-lazhi yalih Jamhuriyat Nibal al-Demokratiya al-Ittihadiya. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the members of the National Assembly and in my own name, I convey to you the warm greetings of the people of Mauritius. Mr. President, climate change remains one of the most critical global challenges of our times. The outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic has altered the global socioeconomic outlook of small island developing states, confronting them with yet more complex development challenges. We should also not be oblivious to the fact that the greenhouse gas emissions from human activities that drive climate change continue and abated in spite of numerous commitments taken by individual states in line with the objectives of the Paris Agreement 2015 and the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development. Although progress towards sustainable development is particularly challenging for small islands, yet I am glad to place on record that Mauritius remains committed to protect the planet from degradation through sustainable consumption and production and by sustainably managing its natural resources and taking urgent actions on climate change to enable it to support the needs of the present and the future generations. Concrete efforts have been made by Mauritius
to mitigate greenhouse gas emission and by integrating climate change issues into new development strategies. There has been strong policies, political will to further enhance the existing policies so as to develop their resilience to the adverse impacts of climate change and to ensure the achievement of sustainable development goals while integrating climate change in new development strategies. Climate change remains a high priority issue on the government's agenda and Mauritius is determined to fulfill its obligation under climate related multilateral agreements. Mauritius has spent some 150 million USD in support of its climate agenda in the past few years. Mr. President, Mauritius aims to create a green energy industry as an important economic pillar and promote an eco-friendly human development. Mr. President, the theme of the debate, getting to zero, mobilizing parliaments to act on climate change, calls for prompt and compelling actions from all the stakeholders in both mitigation and adaptation to climate change. Mr. President, I can assure you and this assembly that the Mauritian parliamentarians play an active role in holding the government to account on its commitments taken at international and regional levels, including those made through the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for the adoption of legislation and the mitigation and adaptation measures envisaged and being taken by the government to tackle the climate change issues as a matter of priority. The frequency of climate change being the subject matter of parliamentary questions, interpretations, at adjournment, interpretation at adjournment time and queries during the Committee of Supply over the budgetary allocations and the tenor of the debates on climate-related issues bears ample testimony to the vigorous role exercised by members of Parliament in Mauritius on environment and climate change matters. Moreover, pursuant to the Mauritius Renewable Agency, sorry, Mauritius Renewable Energy Agency Act, enacted in 2015, to create an agency to promote renewable energy, I appointed two members of the assembly to sit on the board, therefore to ensure that parliamentarians have their say in the promotion of renewable energy. Furthermore, in 2015, the Environment Protection Banning of Plastic Bags regulations were prescribed, and since then, these regulations have been consolidated with the objective of reaching a complete loan, so a complete ban on the utilization of all types of non-biodegradable bags in the future including the banning of simple-use plastic products. In November 2020, the Mauritian Parliament has enacted the Climate Change Act to consolidate the legal framework and mechanism towards making Mauritius climate change resilient and achieving a low emission economy in line with sustainable development goals and their overarching government objective of developing a green economy. This piece of legislation also serves to enhance the resilience of Mauritius against adverse impact of climate change and also complement other legislation related to climate change, thereby bringing our contribution 
for the sustainability of the planet. Mr. President, Mauritian parliamentarians are very active in ensuring government accountability and effectiveness while at the same time providing a vital knowledge link with constituents, both aspects being important in ensuring a country's response and resilience to climate change. You may wish to take note that in December last, the Parliament of Mauritius has been called upon to debate on a private member's motion inviting the Assembly to resolve that government should continue its efforts to encourage the use of electric vehicles in Mauritius. Since 2013, the National Assembly of Mauritius embarked on a challenging and ambitious project towards achieving a paperless parliament. To that effect, members of parliament are provided with a digital tablet through which they have access to a secure digital platform for their parliamentary documents. Moreover, a parliamentary electronic document management system is being worked out with a view to creating an automated parliamentary workflow, enabling stakeholders to share their documents on a common platform, thereby reducing the use of papers and to do away with the traditional mode of communication. Mr. President, over the last two centuries or so, we have comprehensively demonstrated that we can change the climate, and we have changed it for the worse by doing the wrong things, a message so forcefully conveyed to us with the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now it is time to show we can change it for the better by doing the right things, and this challenge is going to require the efforts of all of us. There is need for coherence across nationally determined contributions at national, regional, and global levels. To conclude, allow me to quote the UN Secretary General, who in September 2019 stated, and I quote, the world is losing the race against climate emergency, but it is a race we can win, end of quote. So, Mr. President, let us pledge today that we will leave no stone unturned in mobilizing parliaments to effectively discharge their parliamentary missions as part of their contribution in tackling this planetary emergency. I thank you for your attention. Shukran. Well, an Adu Jumhuriyat Nibal Ad Democratia Etihadia, Wa Al Mutahadith, Aledi Yeli Jumhuriyat Taimur Asharkia Democratia. Yes, under the first topic, I want to thank you for your support. My name is Adakshaju. 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 My name is Indonesia is some sort of party than about the other two. Covid Unis Mahamariko Samema Pony, yes, Sabako Safal Bevastapan Kalagi, my Indonesia is Sarkar, some sort of am Nagri party Abhar Parkat Gordatu. Yes, Sundar Sarma Ipuke de Hini, Mora Merunetu Tamarheko, Nepali Patin Manale, Paiko Nyano Atitaka Lagi, Maride de Kitagapan Gordatu. 
जलवायु परिवर्तन का कारण सीर्जित चुनौती का सन्दर्भ में यह सम्मेलन को विषय शून्य उत्सर्जन प्राप्त करना जलवायु परिवर्तन संबंधी कार्य में संसद को सच परिचालन अत्यंत सान्दर्भिक जलवायु परिवर्तन विरुद्ध लड़न बलिओ राजनीतिक इच्छा शक्ति रुप्रे विधायकी कार्य आवश्यक पर्च यह सन्दर्भ में विभिन्न देश का संसद बीच को आपसी संवाद रनुभव आदान प्रदान को निके ठूल महत्व हो हरित अर्थतंत्र तर्फ को रूपांतरण मूर्त रफ दिन सांसद महत्वपूर्ण भूमिका खेल सकसन उत्थानशील अर्थतंत्र निर्माण का लगी हरित आर्थिक नीति रून महत्वपूर्ण हो जलवायु परिवर्तन विरुद्ध को लड़ाई में संसद सरकार निजी क्षेत्र विकास साझेदार रागरिक सज बीच बलिओ संबंध होना जरूरी है जलवायु परिवर्तन का कारण हिमाली पर्यावरण में पड़े नकारात्मक असरबारे विश्व समुदाय को ध्यान आकर्षित हो जरूरी बढ़्द तापक्रम र प्रदूषण का कारण उच्च हिम श्रृंखला पग्लने रिमाली काख में रहे हिमताल फुटने जोखिम भी बढ़्द तेसबाट निम्ति न सकने प्रकोप तल्लो तटीय क्षेत्र में उत्तिक खतरनाक होस्त प्रकोप को असर जुनसुक देश रूभाग में भे तापनी अति विपन्न रीमांतकृत समुदाय नई बड़ी होने में दुई मत छेन तसर्थ हिमाली पर्यावरण को संरक्षण में पर्वतीय पर्वतीय मूलुक नई समग्र विश्व समुदाय ने हातेमालो आवश्यक नेपाल कार्बन उत्सर्जन शून्य करने कार्य में उल्लेखनीय योगदान करने मूलुक मध्य में पर्द दिगो विकास र वातावरण संरक्षण का लगी नेपाली कार्यलाई कार्बन खरीद नीति को व्यावहारिक व्यवस्थापन सहयोग पुर्वन आवश्यक जलवायु अनुकूलन जैविक विविधता संरक्षण र प्रभावकारी आर्थिक वृद्धि दर रबन उत्सर्जन शून्यता का लगी विकसित देश क्षतिवृत्ति का लगी तत्पर रहने पर्द यो तो जोखिम न्यूनीकरण र जलवायु अनुकूलन का लगी नेपाली प्रयास में तैयार सब खासगरी विकसित देश थप सहयोग रहने आवश्यक महामहिमजी यो अवसर को उपयोग करते म जलवायु परिवर्तन का समस्या समाधान करना खेले भूमिका बारे संक्षेप में उल्लेख करना चाहूँ जलवायु परिवर्तन उत् जल उत्पन्न प्रकोप खडेरी आंधी बाढ़ी डुबान पहरो गेग्रान रेदो सहित को बहाव बुछ्या हिम पहरो जस्ता जलिय तथा मौसम संबंधी चरम घटना को दृष्टि नेपाल एकदम जोखिमयुक्त देश हो हमारा प्रयास कार्बन उत्सर्जन घटना और हरियाली बढ़ा केन्द्रित सन्दर्भ में सामुदायिक वन कार्यक्रम ने वन क्षेत्र पुनर्स्थापन में योगदान स्वरूप अंतरराष्ट्रीय प्रशंसा प्राप्त करथ्य यहाँ स्मरण करना चाहूँ हाल स्कटलैंड को ग्लासगो में संपन्न छत्तीसों कोप में नेपाल शून्य उत्सर्जन को सन्दर्भ में तीनवटा महत्वपूर्ण प्रतिबद्धता व्यक्त कर पेलो ने सन् दुई हजार तीसम में आपको वन क्षेत्र कुल जमीन को पैंतालीस प्रतिशत पुर्यावने वन फड़ानी पूर्ण रूप में रोक्ने प्रतिबद्धता जनाये दोसों हमी दुई हजार पैंतालीसम में हरित गृह गैस को उत्सर्जन शून्य करने लक्ष्य भी घोषणा कर तेसरो जलवायु उत्पन्न प्रकोप रति आम मानस को जीवन र जीवन जीविकोपार्जन को रक्षा कर हमी प्रतिबद्ध छो सब जोखिमपूर्ण अवस्था में रहकर नागरिक प्रति राज्य को नीति र योजना को जवाबदेहता सुनिश्चित करी जलवायु परिवर्तन को असर जोखिम संबोधन करना को संसद ने वातावरणीय रलवायु उत्थानशील संहिता को पालना होने सुनिश्चित का लगी आवश्यक नीतिगत सुधार में जोड़ दिया तेगरी जलवायु उत्थानशील मार्ग अपना स्थानीय सरकार का योजना र बजेट लगायत अन्य क्षेत्रगत विकास का निति रोजना में जलवायु परिवर्तन को एकीकरण में नेपाल को संसद ने जोड़ दिया ये सब कार्य का बलिओ राजनीतिक इच्छा शक्ति र प्रतिबद्धता आवश्यक हो संसद ने शून्य कार्बन उत्सर्जन र जलवायु उत्थानशीलता को संबंध में नेपाले कर अंतरराष्ट्रीय राष्ट्रीय प्रतिबद्धता पूरा करा निरंतर प्रयास कर पेरिस समझौता ने तोक लक्ष्य पूरा करना निर्धारित राष्ट्रीय योगदान र राष्ट्रीय अनुकूलन योजना में उल्लिखित लैंगिक सामानता रामजिक सवेशीकरण का लक्ष्य का साथ ही अन्य नीतिगत लक्ष्य अनुसार जलवायु परिवर्तन अनुकूलन नीति र लक्ष्य अवलंबन करने जलवायु का क्षेत्र में विनियोजन करकम महिला आदिवासी जनजाति न्यून आय भैया समुदाय र परिवारसम पुग्ने गरी शासन प्रणाली में सुधार कर लक्षित बजेट र कार्यक्रम में ध्यान केन्द्रित कर हम उच्च प्राथमिकता रहने महामहिमजी अंतर्यवस्थापि संघ को यह सभा एवं उत्कृष्ट मंच हो 
यसले विश्वव्यापी महत्वका समसामयिक मुद्दाहरूमा छलफल गर्न विश्वभरका संसद सदस्य र नीति निर्माताहरूलाई एकै स्थानमा ल्याउँछ अन्तर्व्यवस्थापिका संघको सभा मार्फत हाम्रा संयुक्त प्रयासहरूले शून्य उत्सर्जनको लक्ष्यप्रति राजनीतिक नेतृत्वले थालेका कार्यमा थप योगदान दिनेछ यसले दिगो विकासका लक्ष्यहरू पुरा गर्न जलवायु परिवर्तनका जोखिम समाधानतर्फ ठोस कदमहरू चाल्नेछ भन्नेमा म पूर्ण विश्वस्त छु यस सभाको पूर्ण सफलताका लागि म र मेरो प्रतिनिधिमण्डलको पूर्ण सहयोग र ऐक्यबद्धता रहने विश्वास दिलाउन चाहन्छु धन्यवाद नमस्कार शुक्रान अलान أدعو جمهورية أرمينيا والمتحدث الذي يليها برلمان المجموعة الاقتصادية لدول غرب أفريقيا إيكواس Excelentissima Signor Presidente Assemblea, Jan Mulia che tu repereri Ibu Puar Maharani, Excelentissimo Signor Presidente da Unione Interparlamentare, Dottor Duarte Pacheco, Signor Presidente da Mesa, Excelenzia, Signoras e Signores, Nas ultimas décadas, o mundo passou por grandes transformações, politica e economicamente, Embora muitos desafios globais permaneçam e tenham crescido em complexidade, em particular a degradação do meio ambiente, as mudanças climáticas cada vez maiores e o impacto inevitável da pandemia da Covid-19 sobre o desenvolvimento do, os objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável. Tal como em outros países, os confinamentos por causa da pandemia afetam enormemente o nosso setor social e econômico, causando contrações. Para enfrentar os desafios, Timor-Leste montou uma resposta robusta, implementou vários pacotes de estímulo econômico para reforçar as medidas de saúde pública e proteger as famílias vulneráveis e o setor empresarial através de subsídios e incentivos. Além disso, para recuperar da pandemia, o governo de Timor-Leste está a levar a cabo a campanha de vacinação tendo até ao momento sido totalmente vacinados cerca de 72,2% da população. 85,0% receberam a primeira dose e 1,9% receberam uma dose de reforço. Excelências, Timor-Leste tem passado por grandes inundações, secas, deslizamentos de terra, riscos de incêndio e outros eventos climáticos extremos. Estes impactos da mudança climática levam à diminuição da produção agrícola, insegurança alimentar, escassez de água e destruição de infraestruturas. No ano passado, Timor-Leste foi atingido pelo ciclone tropical Seroja no dia 4 de abril, causando perda de vidas humanas e perdas de danos de propriedades. As mudanças climáticas são causadas por todos nós. No entanto, a maioria das emissões de gases com efeito de estufa no passado e atualmente vem principalmente dos países desenvolvidos e das principais potências econômicas. Timor-Leste é responsável apenas por 0,003% das emissões de gases com efeito de estufa em comparação com a emissão global. Ainda assim, estamos agora mais vulneráveis aos impactos das mudanças climáticas, Neste sentido, instamos as partes dos países desenvolvidos a assumirem a liderança na redução de suas emissões de gases com efeito de estufa e outros grandes países emissores a fazê-lo, a fim de alcançar emissões globais líquidas zero até 2050, conforme foi acordado na UNFCCC em Glasgow, Reino Unido, no ano passado. Senhor Presidente, Excelências, o Parlamento Nacional de Timor-Leste tem estado totalmente empenhado em fazer a nossa legislação nacional incorporar os documentos relevantes, tais como a ratificação da UNFCCC, do Protocolo de Kyoto e do Acordo de Paris 
como exemplo da nossa contribuição para enfrentar as questões das mudanças climáticas, a fim de garantir o desenvolvimento sustentável. Para concluir, gostaria de reafirmar a defesa de longa data de Timor-Leste da necessidade de criar resiliência a estas adversidades climáticas e de continuar a lutar pelo desenvolvimento sustentável como uma via para promover e proteger os direitos de todos. A este respeito, Timor-Leste apela à ação coletiva, à cooperação e aos esforços conjuntos, o que requer vontade política renovada e solidariedade, para que possamos ser eficazes e possamos garantir que todos os nossos cidadãos, incluindo mulheres, crianças e idosos, possam beneficiar da promessa da Agenda 2030 e viver uma vida com dignidade e paz para o bem-estar da humanidade. Tenho dito, muito obrigado. Shukran li Jumhuriyat Taymur Ashariya. Ad'u al-an Jumhuriyat Armenia li al-Hadith wa al-Mutahadith al-Ladhi yalih kama aslaft Ikuwas, Barlaman al-Majmu'a al-Iqtisadiyya li duwa al-Gharb Afriqiya. Mr. President, Excellencies, fellow parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank our Indonesian host for the excellent organization of the assembly and warm hospitality extended to all participants. The topic we are discussing is the utmost importance for the world since climate change entails dangerous consequences. Global warming and our long-term climate change trends are expected to continue as a result of record levels of head-tripping greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As, in the, uh, as stated in the out outcome document of a parliamentary meeting on the occasion of COP26, the global temperature is expected to reach or exceed 1.5 Celsius of warming by 2040 and may trigger irreversible damage to our planet and and engaged uh, biodiversity. Climate change, with its negative impact on human life, the environment and economic development, is among the main challenges facing humankind. This is especially true for Armenia as landlocked, mountainous country. Although as a country Armenia is making only a small contribution to greenhouse gas emission, the country is taking active measures, such as the ratification of Paris Agreement in February 2017 to reduce carbon emissions, uh, thereby contributing to the in international community's effort to address, address climate changes. On April 22, 2021, the government approved Armenia's national determined uh, contribution for a 10-year implementation period, setting a new unconditional mitigation target of 40% reduction, reduction below 1990s emissions level to be achieved in 2030. For the first time, Armenia adopted its national adaptation plan of action on climate changes aimed at supporting and improving synergies and co coordination between and across sectoral initiatives. Armenia approved its NDC for a 10-year implementation period 2021-2030 to the Paris Agreement, setting a new unconditional mitigation target of 40% reduction below 1919 emissions levels to be achieved in 2040 and increasing its territories covered by forest by 12.9%. My country is promoting policies to increase the share of renewable energy in the power generation sector, expanding, expanding solar generation on the demand side, promoting energy savings in all sectors of economy, including 
expanding the supply of high efficiency equipment in the industrial and building sectors, promoting eco-friendly vehicles and improving road infrastructure in the transportation sector. As we rebuild from the pandemic, additional significant efforts will be needed to promote green recovery and ensure further carbon emission reduction. This will require a con uh, concrete effort across all sectors of economy and society and primarily in the energy sector as the largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Relevant le uh, legislative and regulatory reforms are underway. The most recently adopted energy sector development strategic program aimed at increasing the share of solar energy generation in total to at least 50% by 2030. Armenia aims to double the country's share of renewable in energy generation by 2030 on the path to achieve climate neutrality in the second half of this century. According to the Republic of Armenia Energy Sector Development Strategic Program, the Armenian government plans to increase the share of solar energy generation in total to at least 50%. To, the, uh, to this end, several le legislative and regulatory reforms have been implemented in the recent years. Colleagues, as a part of climate commitments, Armenia has initiated a number of solar energy projects as a way to introduce uh, cost-effective effect renewable energy sources in the country in line with its vision to foster low-carbon generation and develop renewables. Given the worldwide environmental challenges and their impact of climate and the pivotal role of nature conservation as a means to ensure social, economic and environmentally substantive development, I once again wish to reiterate our readiness to cooperate with the parliaments of all member states, agencies, international organizations and the private sector in advancing the global environmental agenda. Parliaments are responsible for ensuring the implementation of co conventions and agreements, as well as national legislation, including and especially on environmental issues. And I would like to state that our National Assembly is duly overseeing these processes. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we are responsible for a safe and secure planet for our children and future generation. Thank you for your attention. شكرا الان ادعو برلمان المجموعه الاقتصاديه لدول غرب افريقيا ايكواس والمتحدث الذي يليه جمهوريه سريلانكا الديمقراطيه الاشتراكيه Mr. President Secretary General, colleagues, honorable members of Parliament, let me begin by thanking the Parliament of Indonesia for the kind reception and hospitality in this beautiful city of Bali. Today, the world is experiencing rapidly rising temperatures in the summer, harshness of winters, and the droughts shriveling up vegetation. I could go on listing these changes we have all experienced in the past few decades. Climate change is an unavoidable change that is devastating our planet and threat to the existence of life on Earth. The call for action was resonant all over the world, and to some degree, successes were recorded in slowing down the degradation of our planet. However, it is now time to mobilize communities, nations, and regions. Members of parliament should place more emphasis on the environment through the various interventions they carry on in their countries and constituencies. They should not only focus on areas like agriculture, education, health, and other infrastructural projects Rather, there should be mainstreaming of climate change in all our national budgets. 
Each sector of the economy should incorporate this phenomenon in its budget planning process. Furthermore, there should be national policies on climate change and members of parliament should be provided with adequate knowledge on adaptation and mitigation measures. In the ECOWAS region, many countries are experiencing severe droughts, deforestation, desertification, flooding, coastal erosion, disease outbreaks, farming, and food shortages because of climate change. To redress these challenges, the ECOWAS Commission, with the full participation of the ECOWAS Parliament and other stakeholders, has drawn up a strategic program for reducing vulnerability to climate change in West Africa. The ECOWAS Commission expects members of Parliament to be proactive and support the climate change program through sensitization campaigns on the use of renewable energy, alternative sources of charcoal and wood consumption across the region, and the formulation of laws to mitigate the negative effects of climate change. It is worth mentioning that because treaty negotiations are an exclusive action, executive action, members of parliament are generally not involved. Upon conclusion of such negotiations, it is imperative that members should be given adequate briefing on the objectives, background, content, and expected outcome of such agreements. This would foster their understanding and possible buy-in into the agreement. It will also ease ratification by the various parliaments. One of the standing committees at the ECOWAS Parliament is the Committee on Agriculture, Environment, and Natural Resources. To promote synergy, the committee works closely with the Department of Agriculture and Environment of the ECOWAS Commission on the policy and program implementation issues on the environment and climate change. I wish to recall some of some major accomplishments through the organization of delocalized committee meetings on climate change. Some of the recommendations of these meetings, such as ensuring that substantial budgetary allocations are made and climate change issues mainstream in national budgets of member states were adopted. To conclude, I call on all members of parliament across the world to come together to mobilize the necessary action to combat this climate menace. We need to unite. Together, we are stronger. And it is only when we are stronger and we are together that we shall succeed. Thank you very much. Shukran. جمهورية سريلانكا الديمقراطية الاشتراكية للحديث والذي يليه رئيس البرلمان العربي Honorable Chair, distinguished parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, today I am glad to address you in Nausea, Dua Bali, Indonesia. Climate change is one of the greatest threats to global prosperity and development. It is alarming that the increasing emissions of greenhouse gases will leave the world irrevocably changed. Climate change reflects on rise of sea level and vastly different climate during devastating heat waves. Persi uh, persistent drought and unprecedented floods, it would impact the lives of people, mainly in poor and vulnerable, including food and health security, infrastructure and ecosystem integrity. As the policymakers, we unitedly stand for, for the global priority to cut global greenhouse gas emissions, increase forest coverage, and resist environmentally harmful human activities 
In order to limit global average temperature rise, we strongly believe that legislatures, as the representatives of the people, have a pivotal role in identifying, uh, highlighting good practice at the local level in order to formulate national policies and legislation while educating the general public about the global challenge of climate change. Now let's briefly discuss the situation in my country, Sri Lanka. The Sri Lanka, the tropical nation, is highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. As a small, small island in the Indian Ocean, the coastal region of Sri Lanka is susceptible to changes in sea level. One third of the total population of the country lives in the coastal belt, which was severely affected in the tsunami in 2004. It was indicated vulnerability to sea level in vulnerability of sea level in the future. Global climate changes also would affect the national economy and livelihood of the people who are engaged in tourism, agriculture, plantation, and fisheries sectors. In order to address the environment, environmental challenges caused by climate change, Climate Change Secretariat was established under the Ministry of Environment. The Cabinet Memorandum adopted in 2021 on national determination contributions related to Paris Climate Agreement to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is highlighted that Sri Lanka has been acting as a stakeholder of the United Nations Framework Convention uh, Climate Change from 1993 and signed the Paris Climate Agree Agreement and ratified the agreement in 2016. The fundamental objectives of the, of the Paris Agreement is to maintain global warming under 2 Celsius compared to the pre-industrialization era level and to take all applicable precautions to maintain it as 1.5 Celsius. In relation to that, the Cabinet has approved the proposal by the Environment Minister to submit the national, nationally determined contribution that ever been re-updated with the participation of stakeholder institutions of relevant sectors by adjusting the, to, to the government policies and appoint a national monitoring committee to supervise whether these contributions are implemented effective, in effect, efficiency and productive. The action plan covers the following strategic areas. One, number one, the clean, clean air in everywhere. Number two, the saving the fauna and flora and ecosystems. Number three, meeting, meeting the challenge of, of climate change. Number four, wise use of the coastal belt and the sea around. Res number five, responsible use of land resources. Number six, doing away with dumps. Number seven, water for all at all times. Number eight, green cities for health and prosperity. Number nine, greening the industries. Number 10, knowledge of rights choices. Next, what is the role of the parliamentarian? Parliament. The Parliament has special commitments to focus on lawmaking and oversight with regard, with regard to mitigating climate change and minimizing carbon emissions and transforming the renewable energy policy as proposed in the budget proposals in 2021. In addition, parliamentary committees such as, ministry, such as the ministerial consultative committees and special committees can study alternative approaches to scrutinize the existing systems with experience and knowledge of the academia and the experts. The parliamentary committees provide ideal forums for fruitful discussions on, on key areas. The executive legislature and bureaucracy are in the position to initiate relevant, uh, relevant programs. Finally, 
It is, it is the responsibility of the parliament to allocate more financial resources for climate action, which is, which is goal of goal number 13 of the Sustainable Development Goals. Thank you very much for being uh, listened to me. Thank you. شكرا ادعو الان رئيس البرلمان العربي للحديث والمتحدث الذي يليه اليونان معالي السيد رئيس الاتحاد البرلماني الدولي معالي رئيس الجلسة معالي الأمين العام للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي أصحاب المعالي رأساء البرلمانات ورأساء الوفود البرلمانية السيدات والسادة الحضور الكريم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يطيب لي بداية أن أعبر عن سعادتي البالقة للمشاركة في اجتماعات الجمعية المئة وأربعة وأربعين للاتحاد البرلماني الدولي معربا عن خالص الشكر وعظيم التقدير لبرلمان جمهورية أندونيسيا على حسن تنظيم أعمال هذه الاجتماعات وما بذلوه من جهود مقدرة في هذا الشأن يظل تغير المناخ هو التحدي الأصعب الذي يواجه عالمنا اليوم لما له من تداعيات خطيرة تمتد إلى شتى مناحي الحياة وتؤثر على مستقبل الأجيال الحالية والقادمة ولا شك في أن معالجة هذه الأزمة لا تقتصر على الجهود التي تقوم بها الحكومات فقط وإنما للبرلمانيين دور محوري في هذا الشأن وذلك من خلال صلاحياتهم التشريعية والرقابية التي تجعلهم ضمانة رئيسية لتنفيذ أهداف اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة بشأن تغير المناخ وترجمة الالتزامات الواردة في هذه الاتفاقية إلى تشريعات وطنية داعمة للاقتصاد الأخضر أصحاب المعالي والسعادة السيدات والسادة الحضور الكريم نتفق جميعا على حتمية العمل الدولي الجماعي لمواجهة أزمة تغير المناخ وفي هذا السياق اسمحوا لي أن أؤكد باسم البرلمان العربي أن أي تعاون بناء ومثمر في هذا المجال يجب أن يقوم على ركيزتين أساسيتين الأولى ضرورة وفاء جميع الدول بالتزاماتها استنادا إلى مبادئ الإنصاف والمسؤوليات المشتركة ولا بد أن نكون صريحين في هذا السياق ونأكد على ضرورة الالتزام بمبدأ العدالة المناخية الدولية في تنفيذ الالتزامات الواردة في الاتفاقية للأمم المتحدة المعنية بتغير المناخ وتحقيق التناسب بين المسؤوليات التي يجب أن تتحملها الدول مع حجم ما تسبب فيه من أضرار للبيئة ففي الوقت الذي تتسبب فيه الدول أكثر تقدما في إنتاج النسبة الأكبر من بعاثات الضارة والمسؤولة عن الارتفاع العالمي في درجات الحرارة نجد أن الدول محدودة الموارد هي الأكثر تأثرا بتغير المناخ والأكثر تحملا لتبعياته لذلك لا بد أن تكون هناك عدالة في توزيع الأعباء وتحمل التزامات ذات الصلة أما الركيزة الثانية فهي ضرورة مساعدة الدول النامية على تنفيذ التزاماتها في مواجهة تغير المناخ وفقا لاتفاق باريس والذي تعهدت الدول المتقدمة بموجبة بتقديم مائة مليار دولار سنويا لصالح تموين المناخ في الدول النامية وهو ما لم يتحقق حتى الآن لذلك لا بد من القضاء على هذه الفجوة القائمة بين التموين المتاح وحجم الاحتياجات الفعلية للدول النامية وتطلع إلى أن يصدر عن جمعيتنا نداء برلمانيا عالميا يطالب الدول المتقدمة بالعمل على تنفيذ تعهداتها بتوفير التموين اللازم للدول النامية في هذا المجال أصحاب المعالي والسعادة السيدات والسادة الحضور الكريم 
لقد بذلت الدول العربية جهود مضنية وأطلقت مبادرات رائدة من أجل مواجهة أزمة تغير المناخ وأشير في هذا السياق إلى مبادرة الشرق الأوسط الأخضر التي أطلقتها المملكة العربية السعودية والتي تضع خارطة طريق طموحة وواضحة المعالم لحشد الجهود الإقليمية للتصدي لأزمة تغير المناخ وأدعو جمعيتنا إلى دعم وتبني هذه المبادرة التي تمثل نموذجا يحتذى به في جهود التصدي لأزمة تغير المناخ على المستوى الإقليمي وفي الإطار ذاته نتشرف بأن دولتين عربيتين سوف تستضيفان قمتي مؤتمر الدول الأطراف في اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة لتغير المناخ وهما جمهورية مصر العربية العام الجاري 2022 ودولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة العام القادم 2023 وهو أمر يجسد الجهود الرائدة التي تبذلها الدول العربية في مواجهة هذه الأزمة وأدعو إلى استغلال فرصة الاجتماعات البرلمانية التحضيرية لهاتين القمتين في إعداد وصياغة خطة برلمانية دولية تدعم تنفيذ الالتزامات الواردة في اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة بشأن تغير المناخ أصحاب المعالي والسعادة السيدات والسادة الحضور الكريم على الرغم من اجتماعاتنا في هذه الدورة مخصصة لمناقشة موضوع تغير المناخ إلا أن لا يمكننا أغفال التطورات الجارية وتأثيرها على منظومة الأمن والعدالة الدولية لقد انتفض العالم خلال الفترة القليلة الماضية بسبب التطورات المعاصرة على صعيد الأزمة الروسية الأكرانية ونحن بالطبع لسنا مع انتهاك سيادة أي دولة أو الاعتداء عليها بأي شكل من الأشكال أو تهديد الأمن والاستقرار لأي دولة ولكننا نؤكد على أن هناك شعب يتعرض لأبغض أشكال الاحتلال على مدار سبعة عقود مضت وهو الشعب الفلسطيني ولم يحرك العالم ساكنا من أجنها معاناة هذا الشعب وقام دولته المستغلة أن التعامل الدولي مع قضية الشعب الفلسطيني مع تطورات الأزمة الروسية الأوكرانية يمثل نموذجا صارخا لازدواجية المعايير في حين أن التعامل الإنساني يجب أن يكون واحدا في جميع في جميع الأزمة والأمكنة ومن جميع الشعوب أما ما نطالب به أن ما نطالب به هو أن تكون هناك معايير عالمية موحدة لتحقيق العدالة الدولية التي ننشدها جميعا وفي الختام أشكركم على حسن الاستماع والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته شكرا أدعو الآن اليونان للحديث والمتحدث الذي يليه يوكي يونايتد كينغدم المملكة المتحدة Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Excellencies, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, for decades, scientists have been warning us about the devastating consequences of global warming. Although international organizations, governments, and politicians keep setting goals to avoid the worst, most of these goals never achieved. Today, climate change and its consequences have overtaken us. Every continent, every region, and every country facing significant challenges due to climate change. Extreme heat and cold conditions, storms in higher frequency and intensity, floods and wildfires are some of the dramatic effects of this phenomenon. The growing number of climate-related disasters has shifted awareness and today, many governments accept climate change as an issue of national security. None of us has the right to stay still, leaving the so-called big polluters to act. Every single country's action has an impact of the world's global green transition. Thus, cooperation and collaboration are essential. International commitments as the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda cannot be materialized 
without national actions. All countries need new climate laws as a legal framework for the next 20 or 30 years. We should ask ourselves which targets or goals we need to achieve on a national level and describe and define the roadmap for the years to come. As parliamentarians, it is our duty to ensure that these laws not only created, but also applied because climate change causes disasters, which in turn increase inequality and poverty. Furthermore, we have to make sure that a number of other policies are also adjusted. For example, warning systems and defenses have to be set up, as well as resilient infrastructures. This is essential in order to prevent loss of lives, destructions of homes, life, livelihoods, loss of jobs, etc. There is also need of social assistance for people facing such dramatic situations. In this context, interparliamentary cooperation can contribute to the exchange of expertise and best practices. In Greece, for example, we had a major catastrophe by mega fires last summer, and social assistance was a critical issue. Strong political will and determination is required for comprehensive approach and response to climate change. And this, of course, means extra financing, which is rather a problem for many countries. Ladies and gentlemen, in the European Union, we recently took the decision to create a European Recovery Fund in order to cope up with the economic crisis after the pandemic. And among others, with this fund, we are financing actions and policies to prevent climate change investing in renewables, investing in green energy, accelerating the phase out of coal energy, and speeding up the switch to electrical uh, vehicles are some of the measures to achieve the ambitious 2030 uh, emissions reductions. At the same time, these actions boost the economy and contribute to creations of new jobs so actually is a win-win situation. As many countries face difficulties to afford the green transition, the European Union supports developing countries in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and adapting to the impacts of climate change. In 2020, 23.4 billion euros were committed by the European Union for this purpose. The EU also remains committed, contributing towards the developed countries' goal of jointly mobilizing 100 billion euros per year to support developing countries uh, until 2025. As parliamentarians, we need and have to press our governments to act effectively against climate change and to implement the relative international agreements. We are running out of time. There is no space for excuses. It is our generation obligation to hand over to our children and grandchildren a better and safer planet. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to uh, share a thought. It's so pity to see these days the billions of dollars and euros um, caused by the war right now in Russia. Imagine if all this money and then the money to reconstruct Ukraine were devoted to the climate change, to prevent climate change. Just think about that. It's so pity. Thank you very much. Shukran. Adro, Al An. Adro Al An, United Kingdom, wa 
للحديث والمتحدث الذي يليه الجمهورية الفرنسية Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, fellow parliamentarians, and thank you to our Indonesian hosts for your warm welcome to your beautiful country. The theme of this debate is getting to zero and mobilizing Parliament to act on climate change. However, this assembly is taking place during three simultaneous crises. Yes, there is a climate emergency. There is also a pandemic. But there is also an illegal and brutal invasion by one UN member state of another UN member state. Parliamentarians, let us commit ourselves at this assembly to ending these three crises. First of all, there can be no more shocking environmental damage than that created by bombs, that created by tanks invading a neighboring country. The world is rightly horrified by the humanitarian crisis, the refugees, the civilians trapped in Ukrainian cities, the maternity clinics bombed. But we should not overlook the harm done to the environment as well the habitats destroyed, the beaches defiled, the fields of crops ruined that feed the world, the risk of food insecurity. We cannot look away from the sheer environmental crime of thermobaric weapons, reports of white phosphorus and untargeted air raids. We know how to end this crisis. Russia must withdraw its arms. According to a recent study, 18 million people have died from COVID-19, a population the size or larger than many countries. We know how to end this crisis too. Thanks to the work of brilliant scientists around the world, there's a range of effective vaccines and the will to donate them. As we agreed unanimously at our last assembly, we must make every effort to help distribute these vaccines equitably and to the remotest parts of our world. So parliamentarians, I give you good news. These two terrible crises can end soon. Tomorrow, Putin could choose to end his illegal invasion. And this year, if we focus resources on a comprehensive vaccine rollout with the right doses, getting to the right places at the right time, we can do what we have seen in my country and move from pandemic to endemic status for this disease. The climate emergency can be solved too, but only if we as parliamentarians take action. The UK was honoured to host COP26 with Italy this year, and we published a strong outcome document from parliamentarians, which was agreed unanimously by all of those who joined us in Glasgow. And already the UK Parliament has put into law the need to get to net zero by 2050. We've installed offshore wind generating capacity, which in our very windy islands means that we often get half of our electricity from wind. We've installed solar, which even in our cloudy islands means we can often generate a lot of domestic power during the day. We've installed onshore wind, hydropower, and we have great capacity to do more. We have nuclear, we're building new nuclear, and we have developed small modular nuclear reactors. Only 3% of our energy comes from Russia, and with the price now for fossil fuels, we have the added attraction that renewables are often now cheaper than fossil fuels. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has given new impetus to us and to our allies to wean ourselves off Russian oil and gas 
and invest in cleaner energy sources. And we're doing other things. One in four cars that were bought in the UK last year was an electric car. We're investing in new solutions like hydrogen buses, electrified railways, hydrogen trucks. We're finding timeless solutions like reforestation, reducing unsustainable wood burning, and preserving peatlands and wetlands. So parliamentarians, what gets measured gets done. And we have put into law milestones on our journey to net zero, and Parliament pays a key role in measuring that progress, holding the government to account. So there are three crises in this world at the moment, and three solutions. The UK Parliament sends a strong message that show that the political will is there for those three crises, COVID, climate and conflict. Let's work together to show a way forward based on peace, based on vaccine sharing and based on sharing prosperity but with you using low carbon technology. Parliamentarians, let us do this together. Thank you very much. Shukran. أدعو آخر المتحدثين في هذه الجلسة المسائية أدعو الجمهورية الفرنسية Merci Monsieur le Président, mes chers collègues, Monsieur le Secrétaire Général Tout d'abord c'est un grand honneur pour moi de prendre la parole au sein de cette Assemblée une des assemblées que j'aime le plus au monde, puisqu'elle représente nos différents parlements et donc nous donne notre vraie place de parlementaire. Nous sommes réunis ici à Bali pour l'une de nos deux sessions annuelles, alors que le dernier rapport du GIEC, le groupe d'experts intergouvernemental sur l'évolution du climat créé en 1988, a fait part de l'extrême urgence d'une action ferme et coordonnée de l'ensemble des États du monde et en premier lieu des plus gros émetteurs, pour réduire drastiquement leurs émissions de gaz à effet de serre. L'accord de Paris en 2015 a fixé des objectifs. Ils auraient pu être plus ambitieux, mais enfin, essayons déjà d'y parvenir. Ne nous cachons pas, nous avons et nous aurons toujours besoin demain d'énergie. La guerre en Ukraine et la flambée des prix des carburants nous le rappellent chaque jour. Nous ne pouvons pas nous permettre d'avoir une énergie trop chère, Sinon, nous le payerons en troubles sociaux et politiques. Pendant ce temps, la lutte contre le réchauffement climatique ne serait pas engagée. Alors, comment faire pour avoir une énergie plus propre, mais tout de même abordable Mon pays, la France, a fait le choix d'engager un certain nombre d'investissements dans le nucléaire civil, qui, malgré les risques en termes de sûreté et de sécurité, reste une énergie décarbonée. Nous avons aussi résolument investi dans les énergies renouvelables, éolien, photovoltaïque, barrages hydroélectriques. Évidemment, ce sont des investissements lourds qui ne sont pas à la portée de l'ensemble des pays, surtout ceux qui ont des ressources limitées. J'appelle ici nos parlements à demander, chaque fois que l'occasion se présentera, un renforcement du Fonds vert pour le climat. En effet, ce mécanisme financier de l'Organisation des Nations Unies vise à transférer des fonds des pays les plus avancés à destination des pays les plus vulnérables pour mettre en place des projets combattant les effets des changements climatiques ou d'adaptation aux changements climatiques. Ce fonds vert est essentiel pour ne pas transférer la dette écologique que nous, pays du Nord, avons créée et pour qu'elle ne soit pas supportée d'abord par les pays du Sud. Je vous remercie de votre écoute. Shukran. Awaddu al-tanwih bi annahu sayabda ghadan al-jalsa al-sabahiyya lil-jam'iyya al-aamma 144 inda al-tasi'a sabahan wa satakun mukhassasa hawla البند الطارئ المقترح ومن ثم سيتم استكمال 
النقاش العام عند الساعة العاشرة والنصف صباحا شكرا لكم جميعا Hi, this is the bike you know, and this is the option. said that they will vote for this one and uh, they are the support of the war. But you will not be, no? Yes, I saw Cecilia, Hortense, it's here. Yes, yes, but I, that I will say. You don't need to be fit. Okay. Ah, because they they take credits. Yes, to explain the proposal. This is not you. This is a mistake. Working now, so okay. Yeah.
Dear, col Dear colleagues, may we go to our points of our agenda about uh, consideration of requests for the inclusion of an emergency item in the agenda of the 144 assembly of IPU. As you know, this is one of the most important moments of uh, our assembly. And so I ask you all attention uh, and special items. participation. Okay. Here are the items for you. One, we two, received three. three proposals, mm -hmm. and uh, it is uh, important to, to say that all of them the about the situation That's in Michael, Ukraine. And I said that, as I said in my intervention, as Madam well, Speaker well, said well, in well, her well, intervention. Because okay. no one okay. will understand outside our rooms, in our but countries, if near 1,000 parliamentarians meet uh, in Bali to discuss other issues, he forget the most important issue of, of the moment. That, when it, that occupied the front page of all newspapers, the situation of Ukraine. And so we have three proposals. The first one presented by Ukraine proposed the item is Russia and Belarus aggression against Ukraine. Then we receive a proposal of Indonesia the title is The Role of Parliament in Supporting a Peaceful Resolution to the Russian-Ukraine Conflict, and New Zealand Proposal, A Peaceful Resolution of the War in Ukraine, Respecting International Law, the Charter of the United Nations, and Territorial Integrity. But just one may be approved. And so I will give the floor to the Secretary General to explain to the new members, because the other ones know it quite well, how is the methodology <coughs> of votes in our organization during this time of uh, emergency item. Mr. Secretary General. It's on. Hello. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I, the uh, procedure is that uh, you will invite those who have uh, proposed those proposals, one after the other, uh, in the order in which the proposals were submitted to the Secretariat. You will uh, listen to one person speaking in favor of that, those proposals, and if there are people who want to object to any of those proposals, they will be given the floor to, to uh, uh, speak against the uh, proposal, one after the other. And when the three proposals have been uh, presented, uh, and uh, at the end, if the three proposals are maintained, you will then call for a vote. And that vote, according to the rules, will be by roll call. The rules stipulate that for an emergency item to be adopted and put on the agenda of the uh, uh, assembly, it has to have obtained two thirds of the majorities, or the two thirds majority of the votes cast by the assembly uh, members. And in the case of several proposals, the one that will be accepted is the one that has obtained the two-thirds majority and also the most uh, votes. 
Mr. President, as you have said, only one item may be placed on the agenda of the Assembly as an emergency item. Regarding the voting entitlements, each delegation present here is entitled to a number of votes, though there is a table uh, indicating how many votes each delegation may cast, uh, depending on a number of criteria that are defined in the rules. And I do take it that you all have that table in front of you and that you know how many votes you will be able to cast in each of uh, in the voting on each of the proposals that will be put to the vote. So uh, once that uh, initial phase of explanation of the uh, proposals has been concluded, Mr. President, and in the event of uh, several pro proposals still being on the table, then you will call uh, for a vote. Otherwise, if there is just one item that remains on the table, then you don't need to do a roll call vote. The assembly will be called upon to adopt that proposal by acclamation. So that is how, uh, Mr. President, you, this assembly will be called upon to proceed at this particular stage uh, to adopt an emergency item. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sec Secretary General. It's always important to, uh, to present the methodology of vote. We, I know that for many of us that attending the meetings of IPU for a long time, it's a repetition, but there, in all our assemblies, we have new, uh, new colleagues attending, and we need to uh, uh, explain, because it is not easy to explain our system of vote. Uh, dear colleagues, so it's, very, it's clear that one person may present the item and another one, just one, is our statutes what to say, may speak against. So we have three proposals and we need to begin for the first one, of course. That was presented on 16th of March by Ukraine. And uh, I will uh, call the representative of Ukraine to present a proposal. It will be in a virtual way, by video, and uh, I, we will give the floor to our colleague. You have the floor, Lesia. Thank you. And hello, colleagues, albeit from, uh, from such very un uh, uh, unconditional uh, surroundings, unusual surroundings. Uh, unfortunately, I am unable to be present with you as I travel now along the Ukraine-Polish border to cross into Ukraine with humanitarian aid for my country. And I cannot cross at the normal border uh, crossing because we have information that the Belarusian forces and army will be actually invading Ukraine along, along the Ukraine-Belarusian border. So with that, I would like to make the appeal to you as a member of the Assembly, as a, uh, as a president of the IPU Bureau of Women Parliamentarians, and also as a member of Parliament of Ukraine, to tell you a little bit of what is going on in Ukraine. At the moment, we are in war. This is not a conflict. This is not a situation. This is an all-out war of aggression waged by Russia on Ukraine. Other than that, Ukrainians, we don't have a problem with Russia. Our only problem is that the Russian Federation and their troops and their army are killing Ukrainians, are killing Ukrainian women and children, are putting Ukrainian members of parliament like myself on special red and black lists. The red list is for those to be killed straight away as soon as the Russian troops get to us. The black list is for those to be taken hostage to Moscow or elsewhere to be tortured. This is the truth, this is the sad truth, the sad reality in which I and 426 of my colleagues have been living in for the last 26 days. This is the 26th day of war and of living in the war zone. For this, I ask all of you to support a resolution unanimously in the same way as the United Nations General Assembly has done on the 1st of March when 141 uh, countries have voted 
for the condemnation of the war of aggression waged by the Russian Federation against Ukraine. For this, I ask you that the resolution that you will be considering and voting on today shall include those very terms as seen in, and as envisaged in the UN General Assembly and other international documents that have been voted on so many assemblies of which you or your colleagues or your governments are part of. With this, I understand that we must stand united against this plague of aggression, against this crime, which is affecting not just Ukraine, but the whole framework of security and defense in the world as we know it today. It's not just about Ukraine or Russia. It's about a country attempting to go back to the practice of empires, a practice that has been long forgotten and that should stay in history books, not have their way back into the 21st century. We must stop this as a community of parliamentarians as a commun as, and as the international community. With that, I would like to inform that the Ukrainian delegation is withdrawing our proposal for the resolution uh, on the emergency item in favor of the New Zealand resolution that has been drafted by a number of you in the uh, assembly in Bali with participation from with the participation from our part. And with that, we would ask you on behalf of the Ukrainian delegation and of the 44 million people of Ukraine who are now uh, risking their lives for freedom of the world, we ask you to support this New Zealand resolution and to vote on it and condemn once and for all the aggression of the Russian Federation against Ukraine and against the whole of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against? There, there is no proposal to speak against. Ah, okay. <laughs> the Secretary General, we are right. As the proposal, uh, as you can retraw the proposal, there is no possibility that someone speaks against something uh, that was a retraw. You are, uh, you are right. Uh, and so we go to the second proposal by Indonesia on 20 of March. Uh, Mr. Zon will propose, yes. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon us all. The Inter-Parliamentary Union, IPU, was established to be the bridge builder. And we base our organization on the foundation of parliamentary democracy. So therefore, we would like to submit the role of parliament the, the role of parliaments in supporting a peaceful resolution to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Because we are the parliamentarians and we represent the people. This proposed emergency item aims to highlight the urgent need to enhance parliament solidarity through effective parliamentary diplomacy to and human rights to address the overarching conflicts that have threatened peace, democracy, and human rights all over the world. In crisis and conflict situations, parliaments have a fundamental role to play in resolving the conflict or building lasting peace through dialogue and reconciliation processes. The Interparliamentary Union is the global organization of national parliaments working for peace, democracy, and human rights through political dialogue, cooperation, and parliamentary action, and is responsible for ensuring that our work is at the service of the people for peace and development. In line with the IPU strategy 
for 2022-2026, collective parliamentary action on strengthening peace and security is imperative. Today, the world is witnessing protracted conflict and violence which have pushed millions into dependence on humanitarian assistance. This has been exacerbated by the infringement of international laws and the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. As the world struggles to recover from the pandemic, we are deeply concerned by the recent Russian-Ukrainian conflict, which has caused disruption to millions of civilian lives and thousands of military casualties. This situation has also forced millions of people to flee the country, which has led to worsening humanitarian crisis. The conflict has also had multiple effects leading to economic downturn and social chaos, which creates further complexities. Its impact has transcended administrative borders and become pervasive across the region. So in response to this situation, Parliament's collective action in promoting respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty is critical to ensure a conducive environment for peaceful dialogue to take place and the safe passage of all civilians regardless of their national, ethnic, and racial backgrounds. More importantly, parliamentary diplomacy is playing an increasingly important role in peace initiatives and conflict prevention efforts. In this regard, it is important for the global parliamentary community to support efforts in stopping the war, de-escalating the situation, ensuring a peaceful resolution to the conflict and facilitating humanitarian assistance for people in need, especially women, children, and elderly, and other vulnerable groups, and establishing a secure humanitarian corridor to allow safe passage. Therefore, IPU members must encourage the respective governments to refrain from the use of military force and promote feasible solution to end the conflict. To follow up on this matter, it is recommended that the IPU establish a task force on the situation in, in Ukraine, led by the IPU and comprising members from concerned but impartial IPU member parliaments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I ask if someone wish to present uh, Poland. Poland. You can from your seat to express your reservation to this proposal. It's, it's possible. Allow me, uh, just a second, please. Is it possible to have the image of the speaker on the screen? Because if there is no, you can to the podium. Everyone needs to, to see who is... Okay. Yes. Dear colleagues, uh, in behalf of the group 12 plus, I, I am against this proposal of, in, of Indonesia. Why? It's very easy. This is not ordinary conflict. This is war. This is war. This is unprovoked, unjustified military aggression against Ukraine. It's a full-scale war, unlike anything Europe has seen since World War II. And this aggression is danger, not only for Europe, not only for Ukraine, for all Europe and for all the world. And all the all the countries, all the continents will have the consequences of this war in economic level, 
migration level, climate change level, everything. That's why we are against. We support this New Zealand proposal. Thank you. Now to the proposal three from New Zealand presented on the 21st of March. I will give the floor to our colleague, Louisa Wall. Thank you. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, tēnā koutou katoa, Mr. President, dear friends and colleagues. As a representative of the New Zealand Parliament, we could not be more distant from the conflict in Ukraine. Unlike our colleague Lesia Vasilinko and her colleagues, and like all of us, we can only do what we can do to support our Ukrainian citizens who need our help to meet their immediate and basic humanitarian needs and to stop the destruction of homes, of communities, of the Ukrainian way of life. And therefore, in the spirit of the IPU commitment to democracy for everyone, New Zealand has proposed this emergency item peaceful resolution of the war in Ukraine, respecting international law, the Charter of the UN, and territorial integrity. This title was so eloquently articulated on this stage last night by Her Excellency Dr. H.C. Puan Maharani that underpins our international rules-based system. So with drafting support from colleagues representing Ukraine and Indonesia, we propose this emergency item. This will ensure the intent of both of these proposals are respected here at this 144th IPU. We ask that we come together in the spirit of unity to ensure a dialogue about the situation in Ukraine in a manner that helps to seek a diplomatic solution, helps to bring about the cessation of hostilities, helps to advocate for peace. We are part of the solution. As parliamentarians, as part of the IPU, an organisation that is 133 years old, please support our proposal that enables all of us to support the Ukraine and Indonesian emergency item proposals. Finally, a thank you to our wonderful Indonesian hosts. May peace be with us all. Kia ora. Dear colleagues, now I ask if, uh, on the same criteria if someone wish to speak against that uh, proposal. S South Africa. Now there is just one, uh, maybe you, you can understand yourselves, because in accordance with our status, it's just one in favor and one against. And so if I saw two if you talk each other to understand who will speak against. South Africa? Okay. If so, South Africa. No, thank you very much, uh, President. The, we stand to speak against the emergency item as proposed by New Zealand. And, and state from the beginning that uh, 
a much more measured and sensible motion is the one that was introduced by Indonesia because it specifies just exactly what has to be done by the Interparliamentary Union, a task force that should make practical interventions and encourage dialogue in resolving the conflict in Ukraine. The, the motion that is proposed by New Zealand already comes with some conclusive uh, remarks in terms of their characterization of what is happening in that part of the world without due regard and consideration of the geopolitics that uh, are said to be the reasons for the conflict to happen in the manner that it is. So as a, a representative body, a multilateral institution that reflects different perspectives from different parts of the world, the most sensible thing to could do is to work on the basis of a balanced, sensible, and properly measured intervention and guidance of the motion that is presented by Indonesia instead of one that comes with conclusive remarks and observations which ignores the dynamics that have led to the conflict. There are so many issues that are, of course, contentious in relation to the the, 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 the motion itself. So let's look into it differently. I think that let's, let's, let's take the Indonesia approach so that there is a balanced discussion, not a one-sided conclusive uh, remarks that ignore, uh, of course, the geopolitical issues that have been raised on several occasions. So we stand opposed to the New Zealand motion and support the one that is proposed by, uh, by Indonesia. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, we have two proposals, and in accordance with our statutes, as uh, the Secretary General explained, if you have just one, it's, it's done. We have two, we need to go to the vote process. And so, to, to go to the process vote, uh, Ambassador Under Philip. We'll begin with the process. Everyone uh, may be seated. As you, can, as you know, you vote one and the votes for the, other, for the first one. First one is the proposal of Indonesia. The proposed B is the proposal of New Zealand. Mr. President, with your permission, we will therefore start the vote for the emergency item. We would kindly ask all the delegates, so as to make this as smooth and as timely as possible, to please uh, keep quiet in the room. I do not intend to repeat your vote, so please speak into the microphone, if possible, in English, French, or Spanish so that my colleagues can very clearly note your vote. And we will start with the first country in alphabetical order seated in the, this room, the Czech Republic. You have 13 votes. So for the proposal by Indonesia, please. Proposal by New Zealand, please. Thank you. Democratic Republic of the Congo, you have 17 votes. Honor the proposal by Indonesia, please. La proposition de la Nouvelle Zélande. So you have 17 votes. With regard to the proposal by Indonesia, do you vote? For or against? For, against, abstain. Contre. 17 votes against. On the proposal by New Zealand, 17 votes in favor. Seventeen votes in favor. Thank you. Denmark, 12 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. Well, 12 votes against. 
against Indonesia. On the proposal by New Zealand. Thank you very much. Djibouti absent, Dominican Republic absent. Ecuador, you have 13 votes. Honor the proposal by Indonesia, please. el voto de Ecuador es en contra. 13 against. On the proposal by New Zealand. A favor de la propuesta de Nueva Zelanda. 13 in favor. Thank you. Egypt. Egypt, you have 20 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia. 20 votes for. Proposal by New Zealand. 20 votes abstention. Thank you. Equatorial Guinea absent. Estonia, 11 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia. 11 votes against. Proposal by New Zealand. 11 votes in favor of peace. I mean New Zealand. Thank you. Eswatini, absent. Ethiopia, absent. Finland, 12 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. Gracias. 12 votos. En contra. Proposal by New Zealand. 12 votos a favor de paz y Nueva Zelanda. Thank you. France, vous avez 18 votes. Proposition par Indonésie. 18 contre. Proposition par la Nouvelle-Zélande. 18 pour. Et merci de parler en français. C'est gentil. Merci. Germany, 19 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. 19 votes against. Proposal by New Zealand. 19 votes in favor. Thank you. Ghana, 14 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. Nineteen votes against Ghana, you have fourteen votes. Fourteen against Indonesia, fourteen in favor of New Zealand and in favor of peace. Thank you. Thank you, Ghana. <laughs> Greece, thirteen votes. Proposal by Indonesia, please. Thirteen votes against. Proposal by New Zealand. 13 votes in favor. Thank you. We have Guinea next. 13 votes, please. Proposal by Indonesia. 13 votes contre. Proposal by New Zealand. 13 votes pour. Thank you. Guyana. Iceland, you have 8 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. Eight votes against. Proposal by New Zealand. Eight votes for New Zealand. Eight votes in favor, thank you. India, you have 23 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. We abstain. 13 abstention, 23 abstention. Proposal by New Zealand. We abstain. Abstention. Indonesia, 22 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. Indonesia, 20 votes in favor. 22 votes in favor. And proposal by New Zealand. 22 against. Thank you. Iran, 19 votes. Proposal by Indonesia, please. 19 votes in favor. Proposal by New Zealand. The microphone, please. 10 votes against. Thank you. Italy, 10 votes. 10 votes in favor of New Zealand against uh, Indonesia. Thank you. So Israel, Indonesia, yes. 
Japan, 20 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. Indonesia no teyan wa kiken desu. 20票 kiken desu. Indonesia kiken. Japan. Japan. 20 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Abstention. Proposal by New Zealand. In favor. 20 votes in favor. Israel, 12 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. But Indonesia, 10 against, 2 abstain. New Zealand, 12 in favor. The Ukraine, seven in favor, five against. Thank you, thank you very much. The Ukrainian proposal has been withdrawn. So Israel, 12 votes in favor of the proposal by New Zealand. And we have the vote on the proposal by Indonesia. Indonesia, it was 10 in favor, two abstention. Yeah. Thank you. Jordan, absent. Kazakhstan, 13 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. Uh, 13 voix pour la proposition indonésienne. Et 13 abstentions uh, pour la New Zealand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kenya, 15 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. Absent. Kuwait, 11 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. In favor. 11 in favor. Proposal by New Zealand. Abstention. 11 abstention. Lao, you have 12 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. 12 votes uh, for abstention. 12 votes abstention and proposal by New Zealand, please. 12 vote abstention. Thank you. Latvia, nine votes. Proposal by Indonesia. Nine votes against. Proposal by New Zealand. Nine votes in favor. Thank you. Madagascar, Malawi, Absent, Malaysia, Maldives, you have 10 votes. Proposal by Indonesia. We would like to abstain, use our 10 votes in abstention of the Indo Indonesian proposal. Abstention and for and Indonesia. And we would like to vote in favor of the New Zealand proposal on the emergency item. 10 votes in favor. Thank you. Malta, eight votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Eight votes, eight votes abstention, Indonesia, eight votes in favor, New Zealand. Thank you. Mauritius, 11 votes on 11. the proposal by Indonesia, please. Abstention, 11 votes. Abstention, proposal by New Zealand. 11 votes in favor. In favor, thank you. Mexico, 18 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Para Indonesia, 8 a favor. 8? Yes, 8 a favor. Y 10 para Nueva Zelanda a favor. You have 18 votes. Yes. So all of them are in favor of Indonesia? No. Eight, Indonesia a favor, ocho a favor. Indonesia, eight and ten, diez, para Nueva Zelanda. Um, the distinguished delegate of Mexico, we will vote on each individual proposal for which you cast all your votes.
no pueden ser los, los todos a favor. Entonces, no, entonces, ¿qué hacemos? Ok, entonces a favor los 18 para Nueva Zelanda o para... Ok, 18 a favor para Nueva Zelanda. So, 18 votes in favor of New Zealand. Yes. And in regards to the Indonesia proposal. Yes. Abstención. Yes. Eighteen abstention in regard to the proposal by Indonesia. Thank you. We move on to Monaco. Is Monaco in the room? Yes, you have ten votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Dix votes contre. On the proposal by New Zealand. Dix, deux fois cinq, dix voix contre. I'm sorry, we have trouble hearing you. If we can get a microphone. So again, on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Dix voix contre. Ten against, and on the proposal by New Zealand. Dix voix pour. Ten in favor, thank you. Morocco, 15 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, absent. Mozambique. Mozambique. Yes, this microphone. Sir. Thirteen. You have thirteen votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Abstention. Thirteen abstention. Proposal by New Zealand. Abstention. Abstention. Namibia. You have eleven votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Ah, uh, in support. 11 in favor and on the proposal by New Zealand. Abstention. 11 abstention. Nepal, 14 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Absent. Netherlands, 13 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. And on the proposal by New Zealand. New Zealand, 12 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 12 votes against. Proposal by New Zealand. 12 votes in favor. Thank you. Niger, 13 votes. Pour la proposition d'Indonésie. Indonésie, 13. 13 en faveur. En faveur, oui. Et pour la proposition de la Nouvelle-Zélande. Zero. We cannot hear you. Zero. So that means against, yes? 13 against Contra. or abstention? Contra. Contra. Okay. Nigeria, 20 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. Nigeria, 20 votes in favor. On the proposal by New Zealand. 20 votes totally against. Norway, 12 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. 12 votes against the proposal of Indonesia. And on the proposal by New Zealand. 12 votes in favor of the proposal of uh, New Zealand. Thank you. Oman, 11 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia. نحن مع 11 صوت مع اقتراح اندونيسيا و11 صوت ضد اقتراح نيوزيلندا Thank you Pakistan 21 votes Paraguay You have 8 votes on the proposal by Indonesia En contra de Indonesia. And on the votes by on the proposal by New Zealand. 
Los ocho votos de Paraguay a favor de Nueva Zelanda. Thank you. Philippines, eight votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Poland, 15 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 15, 10 votes against. Against. 10 votes against and five. Uh, 15, 15 votes against and for New Zealand, 15 votes in favor. Thank you very much. Poland, 13 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Portugal. Portugal. You have 13 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 13 votes against. And on the proposal by New Zealand. 13 votes in favor. Thank you. Qatar. On the, uh, you have 11 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Uh, with this, we are with Indonesia. 11 uh, points. I'm sorry, this is not coming through. Can you repeat your votes on the proposal <laughs> by Indonesia? Indonesia. 11 in favor. 11 in favor. 11 in favor on the proposal by New Zealand. Indonesia. And New Zealand abstention. 11 abstentions. Thank you. Republic of Korea, 17 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, no. Rwanda, 10 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia? 10 votes against. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 10 votes in favor. Thank you. San Marino, you have 10 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. 10 votes against. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 10 votes in favor. Thank you. Sao Tome Principe, no. Saudi Arabia, no. Senegal, Seychelles. Seychelles, you have 10 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. Okay, 10 votes uh, abstention. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 10 votes for respecting inter international law, the Charter of the United Nations, and the territorial integrity. 10 in favor. <laughs> Sierra Leone, you have 11 votes. South Africa, we move on. South Africa, 17 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Seventeen in favor on the proposal by New Zealand. Seventeen against. South Sudan. Spain. Spain, you have sixteen votes. Sri Lanka. Suriname. Sweden, Suriname. Sweden, you have 13 You have Suriname votes. here, okay. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. Yeah, have Suriname. Oh, I'm sorry. Suriname is in the room. Yes, yeah, Suriname is in the room. from here. One MP. Yeah. Um, on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Five, four, five abstention. Five, four, five abstention. And on the proposal by New Zealand. Seven, four, three abstention. Seven, four, three abstentions. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Sweden, 13 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 13 against. Proposal by New Zealand. 13 in favor. Thank you. Switzerland, 12 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Uh, 12 votes against. Proposal by New Zealand. Uh, 12 votes in favor. Thank you. Syria. Uh, 
13 votes. 13 صوت مع اقتراع اندونيسيا 13 صوت ضد مقترح نيوزيلندا noted thank you thailand 18 votes on the proposal by indonesia uh, 18 votes in favor for indonesian proposal and for new zealand proposal abstention abstention on the proposal by new zealand timor leste togo Turkey, 19 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Thank you. Uh, for Indonesian proposal, nine in favor, 10 abstention. And for the New Zealand proposal, 19 in favor. Are there 20 in the room? Okay. Noted, thank you. We go back to Timor Leste. Yeah. <clears throat> Timor Leste, you have 11 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. For vote in favor of Indonesia, seven against. Four. Seven vote in favor of New Zealand proposal, and four against. Okay, and on the proposal by New Zealand, Seven votes in favor of New Zealand proposal and four votes against. The same thing, seven and four. Yes. Just so that my colleagues are 100% clear, for the first proposal on Indonesia, can you please repeat your vote? Four votes in favor of Indonesian proposal, seven against. Noted, thank you. Uganda. We move on to the last page. <laughs> United Arab Emirates, you have 11 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. 11 in favor. And proposal by New Zealand? Against, 11. Thank you. United Kingdom, 18 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. 18 votes against Indonesia. And proposal by New Zealand? 18 votes in favor of New Zealand. Thank you. Tanzania, 17 votes on the uh, proposal by Indonesia. Proposal by Indonesia, 17 votes in favor. And proposal, proposal by New Zealand, 17 votes abstention. Thank you. Uruguay, 10 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Uruguay, 10 votos contra Indonesia. And proposal by New Zealand. 10 votos a favor de, de New Zealand. Thank you. Uzbekistan, Vietnam, you have 19 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Uh, 19 votes in favor of uh, Indonesia and 19 votes abstentions for New Zealand proposal. Thank you. Yemen, 11 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Yemen, 11 votes supporting the Indonesian uh, uh, proposal with and Yemen, uh, 11 votes against the New Zealand uh, proposal. Noted, thank you. Zambia, 13 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Only Indonesia, three votes in, in favor, three votes in favor. And uh, the other 10 New Zealand for New Zealand. My colleague will explain. For each proposal, please, we will need to cast the full allocation of votes.
So 13 votes to be cast on the proposal by Indonesia. On Indonesia, three votes in favor, 10 abstention. Three in favor, 10 abstention. And on the proposal by New Zealand, Can in favor, three abstentions. Thank Never you. again go together. Zimbabwe, on, you have 13 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. Thank you. 13 in favor of in Indonesia. And on the proposal by New Zealand. 13 against. Thank you. Afghanistan. Algeria. Algeria, vous avez 16 votes. Pour la proposition d'Indonésie, s'il vous plaît. 16 votes pour Indonésie. Ok, ok, peut-être que je vais faire un masque. Je vais faire un masque. 16 in favor and on the proposal by New Zealand. بالنسبة لاقتراح نيوزيلندا ستة عشر صوت امتناع سيز فوا ابستونسيون سكستين ابستونسيون ثانك يو اندورا يو هاف تن فوتس اون دي بروبوزل باي اندونيشيا بليز دي فوت بور لا بروبوزيسيون دي الاندونيزي اي دي فوت بور لا نون باردون دي فوت كونتر لا بروبوزيسيون de l'Indonésie et des votes pour la proposition de Nouvelle-Zélande. Merci. Noted. Thank you. Angola. Angola, you have 14 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. Uh, Angola, 14 in favor. And on the proposal by New Zealand? Uh, 14 abstention. 14 abstention. Armenia, 11 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia. Eleven in favor. For goodness in favor. sake, excuse me, madam. Sorry. Thank you. In favor. Eleven in favor of the proposal by Indonesia and on the proposal by New Zealand, please. Abstention. 11 abstention. Australia, 14 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 14 votes against the Indonesian proposal. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 14 votes in favour. Thank you. Austria, 12 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. 12 votes against. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 12 votes in favor. Bahrain, 11 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia? 11 in favor. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 11 against. Bangladesh, 20 votes. Belarus, 13 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia? 13 votes in favor of Indonesia. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 13 votes against New Zealand. Noted. Belgium, 13 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia? 13 votes against the proposal of Indonesia. And on the proposal by New Zealand? 13 votes in favor of the proposal of New Zealand. Thank you. Benin, vous avez 12 voix pour la proposition de... 10 voix pour la proposition d'Indonésie. Absent. There are no MPs from the delegation of Benin. We move on to Bolivia. 12 votes 
on the proposal by no, Botswana. Botswana? Yes. It, yes, we have Botswana in the room. You have 11 votes. On the proposal, please, by Indonesia. 10 against. You have 11 votes. Is oh. there only one MP? 11. Yes, okay. 11 against. So, I'm sorry, my apologies. As there is only one delegate, you are entitled to 10 votes. 10 votes. No, we are not one. I mean. There are two MPs in the room. Okay, so then you have 11 votes. We repeat. 11 votes, please, on the proposal by Indonesia. 11 against. And on the proposal by New Zealand. 11 in favor. Thank you. Bulgaria. 10 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 10 votes against and 10 votes in favor of the proposal of New Zealand. Thank you. Noted, thank you. Cabo Verde, 10 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 10 votes in the proposal, uh, in abstention of proposal, Indonesian, Indonesian, Indonesia's proposal. 10 votes in favor of New Zealand proposal. Thank you. Cambodia, 11 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Cambodia, 11 votes in favor for Indonesia proposal and uh, abstention for New Zealand proposal. Okay, 11 abstention on the proposal by New Zealand. Cameroon, Chad, Chile. 13 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. 13 votos en contra de Indonesia. And on the proposal by New Zealand. Y 13 votos a favor de Nueva Zelanda. Thank you. China, 23 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. 23 votes in your favor. And on the proposal by New Zealand. 23 votes, abstention. Thank you. Croatia. Croatia, you have 10 votes on the proposal by Indonesia. Against the proposal of Indonesia. 10 against, and on the proposal by New Zealand. Four in Ten favor. In favor, thank you. Now, we've gone through the room. I understand there are a few delegations that have not voted yet. Malawi. Is Malawi now in the room? Yes, Malawi, you have third, one delegate in the room. You are entitled to 10 votes. On the proposal by Indonesia, please. Just a moment, we're bringing a microphone. Thank you, Matt. Uh, on the proposal to, uh, for Indonesia, against? 10 against, and on the proposal by New Zealand? Uh, 10 in favor. Noted, thank you. <laughs> then I understand we have Jordan, which has not voted. Jordan? You have two delegates in the room. You are entitled to 12 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, please. According to Indonesia's suggestion, 12 in favor. We have uh, 12 votes in favor. And on the proposal by According New Zealand? According to New Zealand suggestion, Abs uh, abstential. On the proposal by New Zealand, 12 abstention. And I thank believe, you. thank you. And I believe we have Senegal, one delegate in the room. You are entitled to 10 votes on the proposal by Indonesia, la proposition de l'Indonésie.
So 10 votes in favor of the proposal by Indonesia, 10 votes against the proposal by New Zealand. I understand we have Australia. Yes, there's actually only one delegate in the room at the moment. Okay, so, so just to be clear, 10 against Indonesia and 10 in favour of New Zealand. Thank you very much. So for Australia, we have a correction. There is one delegate in the room, 10 votes against Indonesia and 10 votes in favour of the proposal by New Zealand. Thank you. And for my colleagues and for the record, we are also making a correction to the vote by China. I understand there are two delegates in the room, therefore entitled to 20 votes. So we replace the 23 with 20. 23 in favor and 20 in favor and 10 abstentions. Is there any other delegation which has not yet voted? Okay, that appears, it appears, Mr. President, that all delegations have voted and the voting can therefore be considered as closed. Thank you, Ambassador Philip. So, we now close the vote and we wait a few seconds to obtain the result. Yes, of course, but they, that, then the people will... Uh, uh, I will give the floor to the Secretary General. In this, because we are waiting the votes, a, a few seconds or a few minutes, but it's better to wait. Assuming that one will be approved, uh, I will ask the Secretary General uh, to explain how will be how will be the procedure of, uh, of the draft committee of the resolution? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. President. Uh, as you say, assuming that there will be an emergency item, hopefully, the uh, procedure is as follows. Tomorrow there will be a general debate on the this emergency item in this same room from 9 to 10.30, uh, during which the various delegations will have the opportunity to uh, speak to that emergency item, as is always the case. And then uh, the assembly will strike a drafting committee according to the normal process, that is the geopolitical groups will be entitled to nominate candidates for a drafting committee that will then meet in the afternoon of uh, tomorrow to prepare a draft resolution on the basis of the one that will be have been approved by you as uh, uh, the emergency item 
the uh, finalized draft of the emergency item will then of the resolution will then be uh, tabled before the assembly during a session on Wednesday dedicated to the adoption of the resolution on the emergency item and uh, the uh, normal process for adopting the resolution any resolution in the assembly will apply in this particular case I hope that is uh, clear Mr. President okay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Secretary General. I have the votes already. So, dear colleagues, proposal presented by Indonesia, positive votes 376, neg negative votes 470 votes, 72 against, abstentions 162 so negative more negative than positive the proposal the proposal was rejected propose B from New Zealand positive votes 588 negative votes 177 abstentions 245 total yes or and no please be careful because it's necessary to first total yes and no 765 votes two thirds means 510 positive more than two thirds was approved so, we have one emergency item approved, the proposal of New Zealand. So, dear colleagues, the proposal was approved and uh, the debate will happen tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Three minutes for each intervention. And uh, please be, be here at that time. We need to begin on time. And if this is emergency item, it's important to have the participation of so many of you as possible. So I will close our work for today. See you tomorrow.